William Morrow and Harper Audio present The Wall of Winnipeg and Me, a novel by Mariana Zapata, performed by Emma Wilder and Stephen Dexter. Please note that this edition of The Wall of Winnipeg and Me features new, exclusive, to this edition, not to the audio specifically, content. In Memory of Alan 1. I was going to murder his ass. One day. One day long after I quit, so no one would suspect me. Aiden, I grumbled, even though I knew better. Grumbling only got me the look, that infamous, condescending expression that had gotten Aiden into more than one fight in the past, or so I'd been told. When the edges of his mouth turned down, got tight, and his brown eyes went heavy-lidded, all it made me want to do was stick my finger up his nose. It's what my mom used to do to us when we were little and would pout. The man in question, who was on the verge of either a bloody imaginary death or a carefully crafted one that involved dish soap, his food, and a long period of time, made a noise from behind the bowl of quinoa salad in front of him, which was big enough to feed a family of four. You heard me. Cancel it. He repeated, as if I'd gone deaf the first time he'd said it. Oh, I'd heard him. Loud and clear. That was why I wanted to kill him. Which basically showed how amazing the human mind was. How you could care about someone but want to slit his or her throat at the same time. Like having a sister who you wanted to punch right in the ovaries. You still loved her. You just wanted to sock her right in the baby maker to teach her a lesson. Not that I knew from experience or anything. The fact that I didn't immediately respond probably made him add, with that same facial expression aimed right at me. I don't care what you have to tell them. Get it done. Pushing my glasses up the bridge of my nose with my left index finger, I lowered my right hand so that the cabinet could hide the middle finger I aimed right at Aiden. If his facial expression wasn't bad enough, the tone he was using annoyed me even more. It was the voice he used to warn me it was pointless to argue with him. He wasn't going to change his mind right then or ever, and I needed to deal with it. I always needed to deal with it. When I'd first started working for the three-time National Football Organization's Defensive Player of the Year, there had only been a few things I wasn't a fan of doing. Haggling with people, telling them no, and sticking my hand into the garbage disposal because I was both the cook and the cleaning lady of the house. But if there was something I hated doing, and I mean really, really hated doing, it was canceling on people last minute. It got on my nerves and went against my moral code. I mean, a promise was a promise, wasn't it? Then again, this wasn't me letting his fans down, technically. It was Aiden. Freaking Aiden, who was busy inhaling his second lunch of the day without a care in the world, was oblivious to the frustrations he was going to make me face when I called his agent. After all the trouble we'd gone to schedule it, I was going to have to break the news that Aiden wasn't going to be signing anything at the sporting goods store in San Antonio. Yippee! I sighed, guilt niggling my belly and conscience and reached down to rub my stiff knee with the hand that wasn't busy expressing my frustrations. You already promised them- I don't care, Vanessa. He shot me that look again. My middle finger twitched. Have Rob cancel it. He insisted, as his giant forearm went up so he could shovel what looked like eight ounces of food into his mouth at once. The fork he was holding hovered in the air a moment as he flicked that dark- stubborn gaze to meet mine. Is that a problem? Vanessa this, Vanessa that. Cancel it. Have Rob cancel it. Boo. As if I loved calling his asshole agent to begin with, much less so he could cancel an appearance two days before it was supposed to take place. 
he was going to lose his mind and then direct his frustrations at me, as if I had some kind of pull over Aiden, the wall of Winnipeg graves. The truth was, the closest I'd ever come to helping him make any kind of decision had been when I recommended a camera for him to buy, and that was only because he had... Better things to do than camera research. And because... That's what I pay you for. He had a point, of course. Between what he paid me and what Zach chipped in from time to time, I could manage to put a smile on my face, even if it was a forced one, and do what was asked of me. Every once in a while, I even did a little curtsy, which Aiden pretended not to witness. I didn't think he really appreciated the amount of patience I had exercised when dealing with him for the last two years. Someone else would have already stabbed him in his sleep, for sure. At least when I went through plans for how I'd do it, it was usually in a painless way. Usually. Since he'd ruptured his Achilles tendon barely a month into the season last year, he'd turned into something else. I tried not to blame him. I really did. Missing nearly three months of the entire regular season and being blamed for your team not making it to the postseason was hard to deal with. On top of that, some people had thought he wasn't going to make a full comeback after having to take six months off to recover and rehab. The kind of injury he'd sustained was no joke. But this was Aiden. Some athletes took even longer than that amount of time to get back on their feet, if they ever did. He hadn't. But dealing with him on crutches and driving him to and from rehab and appointments had taken a toll on my patients more than once. There was only so much cranky little bitch you could handle in a day, even if it was called for. Aiden loved what he did, and I had to imagine he was scared he wouldn't be able to play again, or that he would come back and not play up to the same level he'd been used to. Not that he would ever voice any fears out loud. That was all understandable to me. I couldn't imagine how I would feel if something happened to my hands and there was a chance I might not ever be able to draw again. Regardless, his crankiness had hit a level not previously documented in the history of the universe. That was saying something, considering I'd grown up with three older sisters who all had periods at the same time. Because of them, most things, most people, didn't bother me. I knew what it was like to be bullied, and Aiden never crossed the line into being unnecessarily mean. He was just a jackass, sometimes. He was lucky I had a tiny, itty-bitty crush on him. Otherwise, he would have gotten the shank years ago. Then again, just about everyone with eyes who happened to also like men had some kind of a thing for Aiden Graves. When he raised his eyebrows and looked at me from beneath those curly black eyelashes, flashing me rich brown eyes set deep into a face that I'd only seen smile in the presence of dogs, I swallowed and shook my head slowly as I gritted my teeth and took him in. The size of a small building, he should have had these big, uneven features that made him look like a caveman. But, of course, he didn't. Apparently, he liked to defy every stereotype he'd ever been assigned in his life. He was smart, fast, coordinated, and, as far as I knew, had never seen a game of hockey. He had only said A in front of me twice, and he didn't consume animal protein. The man didn't eat bacon. He was the last person I would have ever considered polite, and he never apologized. Ever. Basically, he was an anomaly. A Canadian football-playing, plant-based lifestyle he didn't like calling himself a vegan, anomaly that was strangely proportional all over and so handsome I might have thanked God for giving me eyes on a couple of occasions. Whatever you want, big guy, I said with a fake smile and a flutter of my eyelashes, even as I still flipped him off. They'll get over it, Aiden said casually, ignoring his nickname, rolling back two immensely muscular shoulders. I swear they were wide enough for a small person to drape across comfortably. It isn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal? 
The promoters wouldn't feel that way, much less his agent, but then Aiden was used to getting his way. No one ever told him no. They told me no, and then I'd have to figure things out. Despite what some people thought, the defensive end of the 300s, Dallas's professional football team, wasn't really an asshole or hard to work with. For all his faces and grumbling, he never cussed and hardly ever lost his temper without good reason. He was demanding. He knew exactly what he wanted and how he liked every single thing in his life. It was honestly an admirable quality, I thought, but it was my job to make those requests come true, regardless of whether I agreed with his decisions or not. Only for a little bit longer, though, I reminded myself. I was so close to quitting, I could feel it. The thought made my soul rejoice a bit. Two months ago, my bank account had finally hit a comfortable number through sheer willpower, penny-pinching, and working long hours when I wasn't Aiden's assistant-slash-housekeeper-slash-cook. I'd hit my goal, save up a year's salary. Finally, hallelujah. freaking Louia. I could practically smell freedom in the air. But the key word there was practically. I just hadn't gotten around to telling Aiden I was quitting, yet. Why are you making that face? He asked suddenly. I blinked up at him, caught off guard. I raised my eyebrows, trying to play dumb. What face? It didn't work. With a fork hanging out of his mouth, he narrowed his dark eyes just the slightest bit. That one. He gestured toward me with his chin. I shrugged in an, I don't know what you're talking about, expression. Is there something you want to say? There were a hundred things I wanted to tell him on a regular basis, but I knew him too well. He didn't really care if there was something I wanted to say or not. He didn't care if my opinion was different from his, or if I thought he should do something differently. He was just reminding me who the boss was. A.K.A. not me. Ass wipe. Me? I blinked. Nope. He gave me a lazy glare before his eyes lowered to focus on the hand I had hidden on the other side of the kitchen island. Then quit flipping me off. I'm not changing my mind about the signing. He said in a deceptively casual voice. I pressed my lips together as I dropped my hand. He was a goddamn witch. I swear on my life, he was a freaking witch. A wizard, an oracle, a person with a third eye. Every single time I had ever flipped him off, he'd been aware of it. I didn't think I was that obvious about it either. It wasn't like I gave people the middle finger for fun, but it genuinely bothered me that he was canceling an appearance without a legitimate reason. Backing out because he changed his mind and didn't want to take an afternoon off from training didn't seem like one. But what did I know? All right, I muttered under my breath. Aiden, who I was pretty sure had no idea how old I'd turned this year, much less what month my birthday was, made a face for a split second. Those thick, dark eyebrows knit together, and his full mouth pinched back at the corners. Then he shrugged, like he'd suddenly stopped caring about what I'd been doing. What was funny was if someone had told me five years ago that I'd be doing someone else's dirty work, I would have laughed. I couldn't remember ever not having goals or some sort of a plan for the future. I had always wanted something to look forward to, and being my own boss was one of those things I strived for. I'd known since I was 16 at my first summer job, getting yelled at for not putting enough ice into a medium-sized cup at the movie theater I'd worked at that I would one day want to work for myself. I didn't like getting told what to do. I never had. I was stubborn and hard-headed. At least that's what my foster dad said was my greatest and worst personality trait. I wasn't shooting for the stars or aiming to become a billionaire. I didn't want to be a celebrity or anything close to that. I just wanted my own small business doing graphic design work that could pay my bills keep me fed, and still have a little extra left over for other things. I didn't want to have to rely on someone else's charity or whim. 
I'd had to do that for as long as I could remember, hoping my mom would come home sober, hoping my sisters would make me food when our mom wasn't around, and then hoping the lady with social services could at least keep me and my little brother together. Why was I even thinking about that? For the most part, I'd always known what I wanted to do with my life, so I'd naively thought half the battle was in the bag. Making it work should have been easy. What no one tells you is that the road to accomplishing your goals isn't a straight line. It looks more like a corn maze. You stopped, you went, you backed up, and took a few wrong turns along the way. But the important thing you had to remember was that there was an exit. Somewhere. You just couldn't give up looking for it, even when you really wanted to and especially not when it was easier and less scary to go with the flow than actually strike out on your own and make your path. Scooting the stool he was sitting on back, Aiden got to his feet with his empty glass in hand. His hoke-sized frame seemed to dwarf the not-exactly-small kitchen every time he was in there, which was always, big surprise, he consumed at least 7,000 calories a day. During the regular football season, he bumped it up to 10,000. Of course he was in the kitchen all day. So was I, making his meals. Did you buy pears? He asked, already pushing our conversation and the middle finger incident aside as he filled his glass with water from the refrigerator's filter. I didn't feel guilty at all about getting caught flipping him off. The first time it had happened... I thought I was going to die of embarrassment and then get fired, but now I knew Aiden. He didn't care if I did it, or at least that was the impression I got since I still had a job. I'd seen people come up to him and try goading him, calling him all sorts of names and insults that made me reel back. But what did he do when people did that kind of stuff? He didn't even twitch. He just pretended not to hear them. Honestly, it was a little impressive to have that kind of backbone. I couldn't keep it together when someone honked at me while I was driving. But as impressive as Aiden was, as much as his perfect butt made women double take, and as dumb as most people would think I was for resigning from a job with a man who starred in commercials for an athletic apparel company, I still wanted to quit. The urge got stronger and stronger each day. I'd busted my butt. No one else had done the work for me. This was what I wanted, what I had always wanted. I'd kept my eye on the prize for years for the opportunity to be my own boss. Having to call assholes who made it seem like I was an inconvenience or folding underwear that clung to the most spectacular ass in the country wasn't it. Tell him, tell him, tell him right now you're planning on quitting. My brain egged on almost desperately. But that nagging little voice of indecision and self-doubt that liked to hang out in the space where my non-existent spine should have been reminded me, what's the rush? The first time I met the Wall of Winnipeg, the second thing he said to me was, Can you cook? He hadn't shaken my hand, asked me to sit down, or anything like that. In retrospect, that should have warned me of how things would be between us. Aiden had asked me my name when he first let me in the front door and led me straight into a beautiful open kitchen that looked like something straight out of a home renovation show. Then he'd gone straight for questioning my cooking skills. Before that day, his manager had already interviewed me twice. The position was in the income range I'd been aiming for, and that was all that had mattered to me back then. The employment agency I'd signed up with had already called me into their offices on three separate occasions to make sure I'd be a good fit for a celebrity, as they called him. A bachelor's degree, a wide range of jobs I'd worked at that varied from being a divorce lawyer's secretary for three years while I went to college, to summers spent doing photography for anyone who would hire me a pretty successful side business selling makeup and stuff from a catalog, and excellent references had gotten me a callback. I was pretty sure that wasn't what really got me the job, though. 
it was my ignorance when it came to football. If there was a game on TV, chances were I wasn't paying attention to it. I'd never even seen Aiden Graves before my first day. I didn't exactly walk around telling people the only games I ever watched were the ones I'd been to in person during high school. So when his manager had mentioned the name of my potential employer, I had stared at him blankly. I would more than likely never know for sure if it was my lack of excitement that scored me the position, but I had a feeling it was. Even after Aiden's manager offered me the job, I hadn't bothered looking him up. What was the point? It wasn't like anything the internet said about him could change my mind about becoming his assistant. Really, nothing could have. I wasn't ashamed to say he could have been a serial killer and I would have taken the job if the pay were right. In the end, though, I thought it was a good thing that I hadn't done a search on him, as I would later learn when I was busy sending out promotional pictures to fans. Photographs didn't do him any justice. At six foot four, just a quarter inch shy of six five, sometimes weighing up to 280 pounds in the middle of the off season, and with a presence that made him seem closer to some mythological hero than an average mortal, Aiden was a beast, even fully clothed. He didn't have cosmetic muscles. He was just plain massive. Everywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if x-rays showed his bones were more dense than normal. His muscles had been honed and crafted for the specific purpose of as effectively as possible blocking passes and tackling opposing quarterbacks. An extra, extra large t-shirt that morning of our first meeting didn't hide the massive bulk of his trapezius, pectorals, deltoids, or much less his biceps and triceps. The guy was ripped. His thighs strained the seams of the sweatpants he'd been wearing. I remembered noticing his fists reminded me of bricks, and the wrists that held them to the rest of his body were bigger than I'd ever seen. Then there was the face I would be looking at for the next chunk of my life. Where his features might have been bluntly shaped, like so many big guys were, Aiden was handsome in a way that wasn't aesthetically beautiful. His cheeks were lean, the bones above them high, and his jaw lantern-shaped. The deep set of his eyes highlighted thick black brows. Short, trimmed facial hair that always resembled a five o'clock shadow even after he'd immediately shaved, covered the lower half of his face. A white scar along his hairline, from his temple to below his ear, was the only thing the short bristles couldn't hide. Then there was that mouth that would have seemed pouty on any other man who might have been smaller and who didn't glare half as much as Aiden did. He was brown-haired and olive-skinned. A hint of a thin gold chain had peeked out from the collar of his shirt, but I'd been so distracted by everything else that was Aiden Graves, it wasn't until months later that I learned it was a medallion of St. Luke he never went anywhere without. Just his size alone had been intimidating enough for me initially. His piercing brown-eyed gaze only added to the massive amount of intimidation he seemed to bleed out of his pores. Regardless of that, though, my first thought had been, holy shit. Then I had shoved it away, because I couldn't be thinking things like that about my brand new boss. That day of our first meeting, all I had managed to do was nod at him. I'd gone in convinced I'd do whatever was needed to keep the job. His manager and the agency had made sure during the interview process that I knew cooking was part of the job requirement, which wasn't a big deal. When I was a kid, I'd learned the hard way that if I wanted to eat, I was going to have to do something about it because my older sisters weren't going to trouble themselves and I never knew what kind of mood my mom would be in. During college, I'd mastered the art of cooking on a contraband hot plate in my dorm room. Aiden had simply stared at me in response before laying the bomb on me that no one had prepared me for. I don't eat any animal products. Would that be a problem? Did I know how to make anything without eggs, meat, or cheese in it? Not that I could think of. No one had even mentioned that stipulation beforehand. 
and ignorantly, it wasn't as if he looked like most vegans I'd met in my life. But there was no way in hell I was going back to working three jobs if I absolutely didn't have to. So, I'd bullshitted. No, sir. He'd stood there in the kitchen, looking down at me in my navy khakis, cap-sleeved, white eyelet blouse, and brown heels. I'd been so nervous, I even had my hands clasped in front of me. The agency had suggested business casual attire for the job, and that's what I'd gone with. Are you sure? He'd asked. I had nodded, already planning to search for recipes on my phone. His eyes had narrowed a bit, but he didn't call me out on what was obviously a lie, and that was more than I could have hoped for. I don't enjoy cooking or going out to eat. I usually eat four times a day and have two big smoothies, too. You'll be in charge of meals, and I'll handle anything I eat in between. He said, as he crossed his arms over what seemed like a three-foot-wide chest. The desktop computer upstairs has all of my passwords saved. Read and respond to all my emails. My P.O. box needs to be checked a few times a week, and you're in charge of that, too. The key is in the drawer by the refrigerator. I'll write down the post office it's at and box number later. When I come back, you can go make a copy of my house key. My social sites need to be updated daily. I don't care what you post, as long as you use some common sense. He definitely made sure to meet my eyes when he added that, but I hadn't taken it personally. Laundry, scheduling. He went off to include more tasks that I filed into the mental vault. I have a roommate. We talked about it, and if you're up to the task, he might want you to make him food too sometimes. He'll pay you extra if you decide to do it. Extra money? I never said no to extra money. Unless it required a blowjob. Do you have any questions? My new boss had asked. All I had managed to do was shake my head. Everything he said was common for the position I was taking, and I might have been too busy gaping at him to say much else. I'd never seen a pro football player in person, though I'd been friends with someone in college who played for our school. Back then, I hadn't thought people could be built on such a large scale, and I might have been trying to figure out how much Aiden had to eat to get in the amount of calories he needed in his diet. His brown gaze had swept over my face and shoulders before returning to my eyes. That hard, unrelenting face stared right at me. You don't talk much, do you? I smiled at him, a little one, and lifted a shoulder. I wasn't a big talker, but nobody could say I was shy or quiet, either. Plus, I didn't want to mess this up until I figured out what he wanted and needed from me as an assistant. Looking back on it, I wasn't sure if that was the greatest first impression, but tough shit. It wasn't like I could take it back and do it over again. All Aiden, my new boss at the time, did was tip his chin down in what I'd later find out was his form of a nod. Good. Not much had changed over the last two years. Our work relationship had progressed past me calling Aiden sir and using more than two words at a time when I talked to him. I knew everything I could about Aiden, considering how pulling personal information out of him was like yanking teeth. I could tell you how old he was, how much money he had in his bank account, what spices made him cringe, and what brand of underwear he preferred. I knew his favorite meals what size shoe he wore, colors he refused to wear, and even what kind of porn he watched. I knew the first thing he wanted when he had more time on his hands was a dog, not a family. He wanted a dog. But that was all something a stalker could learn, or someone really observant. He held on to the details of his life with both of his dinner plate-sized hands, I had a feeling the number of things I didn't know about him could keep me busy for the rest of my life if I were to try to pry them out of him. I'd tried being friendly once I realized he wasn't going to go Incredible Hulk on me for asking questions, but it had all been in vain. For the last two years, my smiles were never returned. My every single, how are you, 
went unanswered, and other than that infamous look that made my imaginary hackles rise, there was that tone, that almost smug tone he took sometimes that just asked for an ass whooping from someone much bigger than me. Our boss and employee roles became more and more pronounced each day. I cared about him as much as I could care for someone who I saw a minimum of five days a week, who I basically took care of for a living, but who treated me like the friend of a pesky little sister he would rather not have. For two years, it had been fine doing duties I wasn't a huge fan of, but the cooking, the emails, and all things related to his fans were my favorite things about being his assistant. And that was half the reason why I kept talking myself out of putting in my notice. Because I'd check his Facebook account, or go on his Twitter, and see something one of his fans posted that made me laugh. I'd gotten to know some of them over the years through online interactions, and it was easy to remember that working for him wasn't so bad. It wasn't the worst job in the world, not even close to it. My pay was more than fair, my hours pretty good too, and in the words of almost every woman who had ever found out who I worked for, I had the sexiest boss in the entire world. So, there was that. If I was stuck looking at someone, it might as well be someone with a body and a face that put the models I put on other people's book covers to shame. But there were things in life you couldn't do unless you stepped out of your comfort zone and took a risk, and working for myself was one of them. That was why I hadn't actually gone through with it, and told Aiden, sayonara, big boy, on the 80 different occasions my brain had told me to. I was nervous. Quitting a well-paying job, a steady one, at least while Aiden had a career, was scary. But that excuse was getting older and older. Aiden and I weren't BFFs, much less confidants. Then again, why would we be? This was a man who didn't have more than possibly three people he spent time with when he managed to tear himself away from training and games. Vacations? He didn't take them. I didn't even think he knew what they were. He didn't have pictures of family or friends anywhere in the house. His entire life revolved around football. It was the center of his universe. In the grand scheme of Aiden Graves' life, I was no one really. We just sort of put up with each other. Obviously. He needed an assistant, and I needed a job. He told me what he wanted done, and I did it, whether I agreed with it or not. Every once in a while, I tried futilely to change his mind, but in the back of my head, I never forgot how pointless my opinion was to him. You could only try for so long to be friendly with someone and have them shut you down with their indifference before you gave up. This was a job. Nothing more, nothing less. It was why I had worked so hard to get to the point where I could be my own boss, so that I could deal with people who appreciated my hard work. Yet, here I was, doing the things that drove me nuts and putting my dreams off for another day and another day, and another day. What the hell was I doing? The only person you're screwing over is yourself, Diana had told me the last time we'd talked. She'd asked if I'd finally told Aiden I was quitting, and I'd told her the truth. No. Guilt had pounded my belly at her comment. The only person I was hurting was myself. I knew I needed to tell Aiden. No one was going to do it for me. I was well aware of that. But, okay, there was no but. What if I crashed and burned once I was on my own? I had planned it out and built up my business so that wouldn't be the case, I reminded myself as I sat there watching Aiden eat. I knew what I was doing. I had money squirreled away. I was good at what I did, and I loved doing it. I'd be fine. I'd be fine. What was I waiting for? Every time I'd thought about telling Aiden before, it just hadn't seemed like the perfect moment. He had just gotten cleared to start practicing again after his injury, and it didn't feel right laying that on him then. 
I felt like I'd be abandoning him when he'd barely gotten back on his feet once more. Then we'd immediately left for Colorado for him to train in peace and quiet. On another occasion, it hadn't been a Friday, or he'd had a bad day, or whatever. There was always something. Always. I wasn't staying on because I was in love with him or anything like that. Maybe at some point, right after I'd begun working for him, I might have had a giant crush on him, but his cool attitude had never let my heart get any crazier than that. It wasn't like I'd ever had any expectations of Aiden suddenly looking at me and thinking I was the most amazing person in his life. I didn't have time for that unrealistic crap. If anything, my goal had always been to do what I needed to do for him, and maybe make the man who never smiled, smile. I'd only succeeded at one of those things. Over the years, my attraction to him had dwindled, so that the only thing I really mooned over, correction, appreciated in a healthy, normal way, was his work ethic. And his face. And his body. But there were plenty of guys with amazing bodies and faces in the world. I should know. I looked at models almost every day. And none of those physical traits helped me in any way. Hot guys weren't going to make my dreams come true. I swallowed and clenched my fingers. Do it, my brain said. What was the worst that would happen? I'd have to find another job if my customer base dried up? How horrifying. I wouldn't know what would happen until I tried. Life was a risk. This was what I'd always wanted. So I took a breath, carefully watched the man who had been my boss for two years, and I said it. Aiden, I have something I need to talk to you about. Because really, what was he going to do? Tell me I couldn't quit? Two. You can't. I am, I insisted calmly as I watched the man on my laptop screen. Aiden told me to let you know. Trevor gave me a look that said he didn't even remotely believe me, and I found myself not really giving much of a crap what he thought. While it took a lot for me to dislike someone, Aiden's manager was one of those people I avoided like the plague whenever possible. Something about him just made me want to abort mission each time we had to interact. At one point, I really tried figuring out what it was about him I didn't like, and it always came back to the same reasons. He was snobby, but mainly he just gave off massive amounts of asshole-ish vibes. Leaning forward, Trevor planted his elbows on what I could assume was his desk. He tented his hands and hid his mouth behind them. He exhaled, then he inhaled. Maybe, just maybe, he was thinking about all the times he'd been a jerk to me and was regretting it. Like all the times he'd chewed me out or yelled at me because Aiden wanted something done that frustrated him. That had been pretty much every week since I'd gotten hired. But knowing him, that wasn't the case. To regret something would mean you would have had to care about it at some point to begin with, and Trevor, the only thing he cared about was his paycheck. His body language and the way he'd spoken to me even back when he'd first interviewed me made it abundantly clear I didn't rank very high on his list of priorities. Me quitting was going to make his life slightly more difficult for a little while, and that he wasn't a fan of. Apparently, he was bothered a lot more than Aiden had been the night before when I sucked it up and told him the deep, dark secret I'd been withholding. I want to thank you for everything you've done for me. In hindsight, that had been pretty suck-up of me to say. He hadn't actually done anything besides pay me, but oh well. But I'd like for you to find someone to replace me. While I'd always known and accepted that we weren't friends, I guess a small part of me had been foolish enough to think I meant just a little, tiny, microscopic something to him. I'd done a lot for Aiden over the course of the time we'd worked together. 
I knew I would more than likely miss the familiarity of working for him at least a little bit. Wouldn't he feel the same way? The answer to that had been a big, fat nope. Aiden hadn't even bothered looking at me after my admission. Instead, his attention had been focused on his bowl when he replied easily, Let Trevor know. And that was that. Two years. I'd given him two years of my life. Hours and hours. Months at a time away from my loved ones. I'd cared for him on the rare occasions he got sick. I was the one who had stayed with him at the hospital after his injury. I was the person who had picked him up after his surgery and read up on inflammation and what I could feed him that would help him heal faster. When he lost a game, I always tried to make his favorite breakfast the next morning. I'd bought him a birthday present that I may or may not have left on his bed because I didn't want to make it awkward. You didn't remember someone's birthday and not get him a gift, even if he never thanked you. What had he given me? On my last birthday, I spent it in the rain at a park in Colorado because he'd been filming a commercial and wanted me to tag along. I'd eaten dinner by myself in my hotel room. What did I expect from him now? There had been no begging me to stay, not that I would have anyway, or even an I'm sorry to hear that, which I'd heard when I'd left every other job before this one. Nothing. He'd given me nothing, not even a damn shrug. It had stung more than it should have. A lot more. On the other hand, I recognized that we weren't soulmates, but it became even more apparent after that. It was with that thought, that slight amount of bitterness in my throat at being so dispensable, that I swallowed and focused on my video chat. Vanessa, think about what you're doing, the manager argued through the camera. I have. Look, I'm not even giving you a two-week notice. Just find someone sooner than later. I'll train them, and then I'm out. Trevor tipped his chin up and just stared forward at and through the computer's camera, the hard glint of the hair product he used catching in the sunlight in his office. Is this an April Fool's joke? It's June, I said carefully. Idiot. I don't want to do this anymore. His forehead furrowed at the same time his shoulders tensed, as if what I said was finally really sinking in. One eye peeked at me from over his fingers. Do you want more money? He had the nerve to ask. Of course I wanted more money. Who didn't? I just didn't want it from Aiden. No. Tell me what you need. Nothing. I'm trying to work with you here. There's nothing to work with. There isn't anything you can offer me that will get me to stay. That was how dead set I was on not getting wrangled back into the world of the wall of Winnipeg. Trevor got paid for making things happen, and I knew if I gave him an inch, he would attempt to take a mile. It would probably be easier for him to convince me to stay instead of finding someone else. But I knew his tricks, and I wasn't going to fall for his shit. Picking up the glass of water sitting on the kitchen counter next to my tablet, I took a sip and studied him over the top of it. I could do this, damn it. I would do it. I wasn't going to keep my job just because he was giving me the closest thing to puppy eyes pure evil was capable of. What can I do to get you to stay? Trevor finally asked as he dropped his hands away from his face. Nothing. If a slight bit of loyalty to Aiden and genuine worry had gotten me to stay since I realized I could afford to quit, the night before had cemented my leaving. I didn't want to waste any more time than I already had. Another pained expression took over Trevor's features. When we'd first met two years ago, He'd only had a couple of gray hairs scattered throughout his head. Now there were more than a couple, and it suddenly made so much sense. If I considered myself a fairy godmother, Trevor must have been seen as a god. A god who needed to make miracles happen out of the most dire of places. 
and I wasn't helping by quitting on who I was sure was one of the most difficult of his clients. Did he say something? He asked suddenly. Do something? I shook my head, not fooled at all by his act. He didn't care. Before I'd asked him to call me, and he'd insisted we do a video chat instead, I had asked myself whether to tell him why I was quitting or not. It hadn't even taken a second to decide. Nah, he didn't need to know. There are other things in my life I want to pursue. That's all. You know he's stressed out about coming back after surgery. If he's a little on edge, it's normal. Ignore him, Trevor added. Normal? There were different standards for what normal could be considered when dealing with professional athletes, especially athletes like Aiden, who breathed and lived for his sport. He took everything personally. He wasn't some burnout who played because he didn't have anything else to do and wanted to make money. Maybe I understood that better than Trevor. Plus, if either of us had more firsthand experience with the way Aiden had been since his Achilles tendon rupture, it was me. I'd witnessed it all up close and personal. I also knew how he usually got right before training camp started, and that was right around the corner too, adding on to the things he worried about. Trevor had worked for him longer, but he lived in New York and only visited a few times a year. Aiden only talked to him directly on the phone once a month, if that, since I was his scapegoat. I'm sure there's at least a hundred other people who would love to work for Aiden. I really don't think you will have a problem finding someone to replace me. Everything will be fine, I told him smoothly. Were there at least a thousand other people in the world who would love to work for Aiden Graves? Yes, minimum. Would Trevor have a problem finding a new assistant for Aiden? No. The issue would be finding someone to stay who could deal with the long hours and his prickly personality. This isn't going to be easy, Trevor had said to me after the workforce agency had sent me his way. Athletes are demanding. It's basically part of the job requirement. Will you be able to handle it? Back then, I'd been working three jobs, sharing a tiny house with Diana and Rodrigo, and unable to sleep some nights because all I could dream about was the massive student loan debt I was swimming in. I would have done just about anything to get out of that situation, even if it meant dealing with someone who may or may not be a psycho by the way others portrayed him. While Trevor hadn't been lying, Aiden wasn't that bad once you figured out what made him tick. At least he'd given me a warning of what I'd be facing. A demanding, cranky, perfectionist, workaholic, arrogant, aloof, clean freak of a boss. No biggie. Aiden Graves needed an assistant, and I had been lucky enough to get the job. At that point, I had a plan that worried me to death and student loans that were giving me an ulcer. I'd thought it over a million times and concluded that working for him, while keeping my own business on the side and trying to grow it at the same time, was the best way to move forward in my life, at least for a little while. The rest was history. Saving money and working 70 hours a week had all finally paid off. I saved enough to keep me afloat in case my business slowed down, and I had my goals to guide me. When things were tough, it was my aspirations and the hope they brought me that kept me going. So even on the days when Aiden had me standing behind him, envisioning myself stabbing him in the back because he wanted me to do something ridiculous, like rewash his sheets because I'd left them in the washer for too long, I always did what he needed. All I had to do was remember my student loans and my plans, and I persevered. Until now. You're killing me, Vanessa. You're fucking killing me here. Trevor literally moaned. Moaned. He usually just bitched and complained. It'll be fine. He doesn't care that I'm leaving. He probably won't even notice, I said trying to be as understanding as I could, and at the same time, not really giving much of a crap that he was sweating bullets. The grimace on his face quickly dropped, a total act, and got replaced by a glare, 
making him look more like the manager I'd been forced to get to know than the one who was attempting to backtrack and be nice after so long. He sniped. I highly doubt that. I understood why I was a good fit for Aiden. I was pretty patient, and I didn't hold his callous, picky nature against him. I knew how to handle crazy in all its forms, thanks to my family. But maybe I'd just been expecting so much worse from him, and he'd never gone straight into anger management zone. He was way too controlled for that. Realistically, though, especially after yesterday, I wasn't going to hold my breath. Maybe I'd feel worse about quitting if Aiden was my friend, or if Trevor had actually been nice to me, but neither one of them would remember me two months from now. I knew who cared about me and who meant something to me, and neither one of them were on my list. And sure, that made me feel a little bad. But survival of the fittest and all that crap, right? Both Aiden and Trevor would have dumped me like a hot potato if our roles had been reversed. I'd let my misguided sense of loyalty, paranoia, and self-doubt keep me shackled to my not-so-bad cell. All Aiden needed was someone who could do what he wanted. Cook, clean, wash, fold, answer emails, call Trevor or Rob when he wanted things out of my jurisdiction, and post things on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Then there were the things I had to do when he traveled. It wasn't anything crazy. Anyone with a little bit of patience could do it. But from the look Trevor pierced me with, he didn't feel the same way. Mostly, I thought he was just being lazy. He blew out a breath and started massaging his temples as the chat buffered and his image blurred for a moment. <sighs> Are you positive you want to do this? I can talk to him about reducing your hours. His voice carried over the speaker even as the screen froze. I only just barely managed not to ask him to let me think about it. No, I couldn't. I wasn't going to half-ass this opportunity in my life to go solo. I didn't want to invite failure in the door by being hesitant. Vanessa! He groaned. You're really doing this? This was exactly what I'd been working toward from the moment I finished school with my undergrad in graphic design. Graduating had been an uphill battle that sometimes felt like plain torture, and I'd done terrible, awful things to get my schooling done. It was why I had worked multiple jobs at once, why I now technically only had two, and why I had been sleeping four hours a night for the last four years and lived off the bare minimum. I took almost any and every job that hit my inbox, and jobs that didn't. Book covers, web banners, posters, bookmarks, business cards, postcards, logos, t-shirt designs, commissioned pieces, tattoo designs. Everything. I'm positive. I had to fight the urge to smile at how confident and determined I sounded, even though I definitely didn't feel that way. Back at massaging his temples, Trevor sighed. If that's how you're going to be, I'll start looking for a replacement. I nodded and let a sense of hesitant victory tickle my throat. I wasn't going to let that smart-ass comment at the beginning bother me. This was exactly how I was going to be. He waved a hand in front of the screen. I'll let you know once I find someone. Without another comment, he logged off the chat like a rude jerk. He reminded me of someone else I knew with his lack of manners. If it wasn't for Zach and some of the other 300s he'd introduced me to over the years, I would have figured everyone in their industry was self-absorbed. But no, it was only a few people, specifically the ones I had to surround myself with. Go figure. It wasn't going to be my problem anymore, though, was it? Vanessa. A familiar voice bellowed from somewhere upstairs. Yes, I yelled back, exiting the app on my tablet and wondering if he'd overheard my conversation with Trevor or not. I mean, he was the one who told me to call him in the first place, wasn't he? Did you wash the sheets? Aiden hollered from where I could only assume was his bedroom. I washed his sheets Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I had every week since getting hired. 
For someone who worked out almost every day of his life and sweating had become as natural as breathing, he was religious about having ultra-clean sheets. I learned from the very beginning how important it was that his damn sheets were clean, so I never missed doing them. Ever. Yes. Today? Yes. Why the hell was he asking? I always... Oh. I always left a piece of the chocolate peppermint patties he liked on his pillow, because it made me laugh, and I hadn't put one on there this afternoon. The store had been out of them. I guess I couldn't blame him for being uncertain, but I could blame myself for spoiling him. He'd never acknowledged my little gift or told me to stop leaving them, so I hadn't figured he cared. Now I knew better. Aiden didn't immediately respond, and I could already envision him humming to himself with uncertainty before sniffing the sheets to make sure I was telling the truth. When there wasn't a response, I figured he confirmed I wasn't lying. But then he started yelling again. Did you pick up my clothes from the dry cleaner? Yes, they're in your closet already. I didn't flinch, roll my eyes, or have an annoyed tone. I had the self-control of a samurai, sometimes. A samurai who wanted to go ronin. I'd barely managed to put my tablet back into my purse when he hollered again. Where are my orange runners? That time, I couldn't help but cross my eyes. Dealing with him reminded me of being a little kid and asking my mom to help me find something after I'd looked about a total of five seconds. They were where he'd left them. In your bathroom! I could hear movement upstairs. Zach hadn't made his way back to Dallas yet, so it could only be the big guy looking for his tennis shoes. Or when his Canadianisms kicked in, runners. I rarely ever touched his shoes if I didn't have to. It wasn't as if his feet smelled. Strangely, they didn't. But they did get sweaty. And I mean, really sweaty. He'd been training so hard the last two months, the sweat had reached an all-time high. My fingers tried not to go anywhere near them, if it could be avoided. I was in the middle of looking through a cookbook, trying to decide what to make for dinner, when the thunder that followed a 280-pound man jogging down the stairs started. Seriously, every time he came down the stairs any faster than a slowpoke, the walls trembled. I wasn't sure how the stairs survived. Whatever kind of materials the builder used on them, it had to be good stuff. I didn't need to turn around to know he'd made his way into the kitchen. The refrigerator door opened and closed, followed by the sound of him munching on something. Pick up some more sunblock for me. I'm almost out, he said in a distracted tone. I'd already ordered him some days ago, but I didn't see the point in telling him it was cheaper to order it than to buy it at the store. You got it, big guy. I'm taking two of your shorts to the seamstress later. I noticed when I was washing them that the hems were loose. Considering he got half of his clothes specially made because size behemoth wasn't widely carried, I was a little unimpressed those same shorts already needed to get patched. Juggling the pear he was eating and two apples in his other hand, he tipped his chin up. I'm running some drills tonight. Anything I need to know before I leave? Fiddling with the leg of my glasses, I tried to think about what I had planned on telling him. There's a few envelopes I left on your desk this morning. I'm not sure if you saw them already or not, but they look important. That big, handsome face went thoughtful for a second before he nodded. Did Rob cancel the signing? I almost winced from thinking of the conversation with his agent, another asshole I wasn't fond of. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if his own mom wasn't fond of him either. Rob was that much of a dick. I told him to, but he never called back to tell me if he did or not. I'll find out. He nodded again, crouching that massive six-foot-four frame to pick up his duffel bag. Make sure you do that. He paused. Leslie's birthday is this month. Send a card and a gift card over, would you? Your wish is my command. In the entire time I'd worked for Aiden, Leslie was the only person who got a gift from him. I couldn't even be remotely jealous that I didn't get at least a verbal 
happy birthday on mine. Not even Zach received anything, and I'd know because if he did, I'd be the one buying the present. Oh, I made those granola bars that you like, in case you want to take some with you, I added, pointing at the plastic container I'd left by the fridge. He headed to where I'd indicated, opening the container and pulling out two wax paper wrapped bars before shoving all his snacks into his duffel bag. Come by the gym tomorrow with the camera and my breakfast. I'm going in early and staying until lunch. Sure. I had to make a mental note to set my alarm for half an hour earlier than usual. Most days when he was in Dallas during the off-season, Aiden did cardio at his house, had breakfast, and then left to do his weightlifting and other kinds of workouts with whichever trainer he deemed to honor with his presence. Some days he woke up earlier and went straight to the gym. The facility was located on the opposite side of town, so I'd either have to make him breakfast at my house and go straight there, or wake up even earlier to drop by his house, which was out of the way, and then head over. No thanks. I barely survived on my usual four to five hours of sleep most nights. I wasn't about to lose what little I had left. I stepped back from the counter and grabbed the gallon of water I'd refilled earlier, holding it out for him, locking my gaze on his thick neck before forcing myself to look him in the eye. By the way, I talked to Trevor about me leaving, and he said he'd start looking for someone else. Those dark orbs met mine for a second, only just a split second, cool and distant like always, before he looked away. Okay. He took the jug from me as he threw his bag over his shoulder. Just as he reached the door that connected the garage with the kitchen, I called out, Bye! He didn't say anything as he closed the door behind him, but I thought he might have wiggled a finger or two. I was probably imagining it. Who was I kidding? Of course I was imagining it. I was just being an idiot for even thinking there was a possibility he'd done otherwise. While I wasn't the bubbliest person in the world, Aiden had me beat by a landslide. With a resigned sigh, I shook my head at myself and started making my way around the kitchen when my personal cell phone started ringing. Taking a quick peek at the screen, I hit the answer button. Hello, I said, slipping the phone between my ear and my shoulder. Vanny, I don't have time to talk. I have an appointment in a minute, the bright voice on the other line explained quickly. I just wanted to tell you, Rodrigo saw Susie. Silence hung between Diana and me on the phone. Two moments, three moments, four moments. Heavy and unnatural. Then again, that was what Susie did best. Messed things up. I wanted to ask if she was sure it was Susie that her brother Rodrigo had seen, but I didn't. If Rodrigo thought he saw her, then he had. She didn't have the kind of face that was easy to mistake, even after so many years. I cleared my throat, telling myself I didn't need to count to ten, or even five. Where? My voice came out in a slight croak. In El Paso yesterday. He was visiting his in-laws this weekend with Louis and Josh and said he saw her at the grocery store by the old neighborhood. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope, that wasn't enough. I had to start counting all over again, all the way to ten the second time. A thousand different thoughts went through my head at the mention of Susie's name, and they were all pretty terrible, each and every single one of them. It didn't take a genius to know what she was doing in the old neighborhood. Only one person who we both knew still lived there. I could still remember our old stomping ground so clearly. It was where Diana and I had met. Back when I lived with my mom, Diana's family had lived next door to us, They'd had the pretty house, the freshly painted blue one with white trim and a nice lawn, with the dad who played with his kids outside, and the mom who kissed boo-boos. The Casillas were the family I had always wanted when I'd been a kid, when things had been at their worst. And the only thing I found consolation in was my notebook, not the mess within the walls of my house. 
Diana had been my best friend for as long as I could remember. I couldn't count the number of times I'd eaten over at their house with my little brother until mom had lost custody of us. Diana had always done what my own family hadn't, and that was watch out for me. She was the one who had found me. Stop it. Stop it. It wasn't worth the energy it took to think about things in the past. I was over. It really wasn't. Huh. I had no idea she was back. My voice sounded just as robotic out loud as it sounded in my head. I just talked to my mom a week ago, and she didn't say anything. Diana knew I was referring to my real mom, the person who had actually given birth to me and my four siblings, not my foster mom of four years, who I still kept in touch with. At the mention of my birth mom, Diana made a small noise I almost missed. I knew she didn't understand why I bothered trying to have a relationship with her. Honestly, half the time I regretted it. But that was one of those rare things I never told the person I was closest to in the world. Because I knew what she would say, and I didn't want to hear it. I figured you would want to know in case you were planning on visiting, she finally said in kind of a mutter. I didn't visit El Paso often, but she was right. I definitely wouldn't want to go now that I knew who was there. I really have to go in a sec, Vanny, my best friend quickly added before I could say anything. But did you tell Miranda you're leaving? The Miranda went in one ear and out the other. I'd been calling him that for so long, it sounded so natural it didn't even register. I just told him yesterday. And? She couldn't just let me sulk in my reality. Nothing. There was no point in lying or making something up that would make me seem more important to Aiden than I was. While I didn't tell anyone a whole lot about him because of the non-disclosure agreement I signed when I first started working for him, Diana knew enough to get why his name was saved on my personal phone under Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada. Oh, was her disappointed response. Yeah, I thought so too. He'll miss you once you're gone. Don't worry about it. I highly doubted that. Okay, I gotta go. My client is here. Call me later, Van Van. I get off work at nine. I will. Love you. Love you too. Oh, and think about letting me dye your hair once you're out of there, she added before hanging up on me. Diana's comment made me smile, and kept me smiling as I headed into Aiden's office to tackle his inbox. Talking to Di always put me in a good mood. She never gave me shit for how much I worked, because she worked a lot too. But I told her the same thing my foster dad had told me when I was 17 and I told him I wanted to pursue my artwork. Do what you need to do to be happy, Vane. Nobody else is going to watch out for you but you. It was the same belief I held on to when I first told my foster parents I wanted to go to school a thousand miles away, and what I told myself when I didn't get a scholarship and my financial aid was merely a drop in the bucket to go to said school. I was going to do what I needed to do, even if I had to leave my brother, with his blessing, in the process. I'd told him the same thing when he was offered a scholarship for a college right after I moved back to Texas to be closer to him. Sometimes it was easier to tell other people what they should do than to actually practice what you preached. That had been the real root of my problem. I was scared. Scared that my clients were going to disappear and my work would dry up. Scared that one day I'd wake up and have absolutely no inspiration anymore when I had my photo editing program open. I was worried that what I'd worked so hard for would crash and burn, and everything would go to hell. Because I knew firsthand that life could be taking you in one direction, and the next moment you'd be going in a completely different one. Because that was the way surprises worked they didn't tend to pencil themselves into your schedule and let you know they were visiting ahead of time. Three. This place smells like armpits, 
I thought, as I made my way past the cardio equipment at the facility where Aiden had been training since we'd gotten back from Colorado. Located in the Business Warehouse District on the outskirts of Dallas, the facility had the equipment necessary for all levels of weightlifting, plyometric exercises, calisthenics, strongman, and powerlifting. The building itself was new, nondescript, and easy to miss unless you knew what you were looking for. It had only been open about three years, and the owner had spared no expense on any square inch of the gym. The facility boasted that it trained some of the most elite athletes in the world in a wide range of sports, but I only paid attention to one of them. Aiden's schedule had been as consistent as it could be in the two years I'd been with him, considering everything that had happened in the last ten months. After football season ended, and after he'd been cleared to train this year, Aiden headed to a small town in Colorado where he rented a house from some ex-football star for two months. There, he trained with his high school football coach. I'd never outright asked him why he chose there of all places to spend his time, but from everything I knew about him, I figured he enjoyed the time away from the spotlight. As one of the best players in the NFO, there was always someone around him asking for something, telling him something, and Aiden wasn't exactly the outgoing, friendly type. He was a loner who happened to be so good at his sport, there wasn't a way around the spotlight he'd been thrust into from the moment he'd been drafted. At least, that was what I'd learned from the countless articles I'd read before sharing on his social pages and the hundreds of interviews I'd sat through with him. It was just something he put up with on his road to being the best, because that's what fans, and even people who weren't fans, referred to him as. With a work ethic like his, it wasn't a surprise. After his seclusion in the middle of nowhere, I'd gone with him twice because apparently he couldn't live without a chef and housekeeper, he, we, flew back to Dallas, and his high school coach went back to Winnipeg. Aiden then worked on other aspects of his role with another trainer until the 300s called him in for team camp in July. In a couple of weeks, official practices would begin, and the insanity that surrounded an NFO season with one of the highest caliber players in the organization would start all over again. But this time, I wouldn't be part of it. I wouldn't have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning or have to drive around like a crazy person doing the hundreds of things that seemed to pop up when he was busy. This August, instead of dealing with planning meals around two-a-day practices and preseason games, I'd be in my apartment, waking up whenever the hell I wanted, and not having to cater to anyone else's needs but mine. But that was a party I could throw in the near future, when I wasn't busy looking for Aiden while my hands were full. Past the cardio machines and through two swinging double doors was the main part of the training ground. At a cavernous 10,000 square feet, red and black decor swam in front of my eyes. Half the floor looked like turf, and the other half had lightly cushioned black flooring for a weight training section. Scattered around the building at six o'clock in the morning were only about 10 other people, Half looked like football players, and the other half looked like some other sort of athlete. I just had to look for the largest one of them all, and it only took a second to spot the big head on the turf section by one of the 1,100-pound tires. Yeah, 1,100-pound tires. And I thought I was badass when I managed to carry all of my grocery bags to my apartment in one trip. A few feet away, a familiar-looking man stood by watching the wall of Winnipeg. Finding a spot out of the way, but still close enough to take a decent picture, I sat cross-legged at the edge of the mats, perpendicular to Aiden and his current trainer, and pulled out the DSLR camera I'd suggested he should buy specifically for this purpose a year ago. One of my duties was to update his social media pages and engage his fans, his sponsors and fans enjoyed seeing live shots of him working out. No one paid me any attention as I settled in. They were all too busy to look around. With the equipment out of the bag, I waited for the perfect shot. Through the lens, 
Aiden's features were smaller. His muscles seemed not as detailed as they were when you saw them in person. He'd been cutting his calories for the last two weeks, aiming to drop 10 pounds before the start of the season. The striations on his shoulders popped as he maneuvered around the massive tractor tire, squatting in front of it, making the full muscles of his hamstrings look even more impressive than they usually did. I could even see the cleft that formed along the back of his thigh from how developed his hammies were. Then there were those biceps and triceps that some people seemed to think had gotten the size they were due to steroids when I knew firsthand that Aiden's body was fueled by massive amounts of a plant-based diet. He didn't even like taking over-the-counter medications. The last time he'd gotten sick, this stubborn ass had even refused to take the antibiotics the doctor had prescribed. I hadn't even bothered to fill the painkiller prescription he'd been given after his surgery, which might have been why he'd been so grumpy for so long. I wouldn't even get started on his aversion to sodium lauryl sulfates, preservatives, and parabens. Steroids? Give me a break. I snapped a few pictures, trying to get a really good one. His female fans always went nuts over the shots that showcased the power contained within that great body. And when he had tight compression shorts on while he was bent over, bam, I'm pregnant, one of his fans had written last week when I posted a picture of Aiden doing squats. I'd almost spat water out of my mouth. His email inbox got flooded after those kinds of posts went up. What the fans wanted they got, and Aiden was all for it. Luckily for him, between semesters, I'd taken a photography class at the local community college in hopes of snagging a few gigs during the summer doing wedding photography. The tire started its path to getting flipped. Aiden's face contorted as sweat poured down his temples and over the thick two-inch scar that slashed white vertically along his hairline, before melting into the beard that had grown in overnight. I'd overheard people talk about his scar when they didn't know I was listening. They thought he'd gotten it during a drunken night in college. I knew better. Through the lens, Aiden grimaced and his trainer urged him on from his spot right beside him. I snapped more pictures, suppressing a sleepy yawn. Hey, you a voice whispered a little too closely into my ear from behind. I froze. I didn't need to turn around to know who it was. There was only one person in the group of people that circled Aiden's life who made my creeper radar go off. And this will hopefully be one of the last few times you see him, I told myself when I had the urge to flinch. There was also the fact my gut said that making my dislike of him known would just make this situation worse, and it wasn't as if I would tell Aiden his teammate gave me the heebie-jeebies. If I hadn't told Zach, who was my friend, that Christian made me feel uncomfortable, I sure as hell wouldn't tell the person who wasn't. But it was the truth. I minded my own business when I showed up to anything 300s related, and tried to be nice, or at least polite, to the people who were kind to me. Trevor had drilled it into my head when he'd interviewed me that I wasn't to be seen or heard. The attention always had to be on the big guy, and not some crazy-ass assistant, and I was totally fine with that. Plastering a tight, forced smile on my face, even though I wasn't facing him, I kept the camera where it was, ready for action. Hi, Christian. How are you? I asked in a friendly voice that I really had to dig in there for, easily ignoring the good-looking features that disguised a man who had gotten suspended a few games last season for getting into a fight at a club. I thought that said a lot about him, to begin with, because who did something that stupid, anyway? He made millions a year. Only a total idiot would jeopardize a good thing. Great, now that you're here, Creeper Christian said. I almost groaned. It wasn't like I'd known he was training at the same place Aiden was. I doubted Aiden even knew or cared. Taking pictures of graves? 
he asked, taking a seat on the floor next to me. I brought the viewfinder eyepiece to my eye, hoping he'd realize I was too busy to talk. Yep. Who else would I be taking pictures of? I snapped a couple other shots as Aiden managed to flip the tire again, resuming that wide-legged, squatted position after each time. How you been? How long has it been since I've seen you? Good. Was it bitchy to be so vague? Yes, but I couldn't find it in me to be more than cordial to him after what he'd done. Plus, he knew damn well how long Aiden had been out for the season. He was the team's star player. Someone from the team had been constantly in contact with him since his injury. There was no way Christian wouldn't have kept up with Aiden's progress. It seemed like every time I flipped through the sports network, some anchor or another was making a prediction about Aiden's future. The heat of his side seared into my shoulder. Graves sure got back on his feet real quick. Through the lens, though, I found Aiden glowering over in my direction, his trainer a few feet away, jotting down something on the clipboard he was holding. I was torn between waving and getting up, but Aiden beat me to decision-making by saying loudly, You can leave now. You can... Lowering the camera to my lap, I stared over at him, pressing my glasses a little closer to my face with my index finger. I'd heard wrong, hadn't I? What did you say? I called out the question slowly so he could hear me. He didn't even blink as he repeated himself. You can leave now. You can leave now. I gawked. My heart gave a vicious thump. My inhale was sharp. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Kill them with kindness, Diana's mom would say when I'd tell her about my sisters picking on me. I hadn't necessarily taken her words into account when dealing with my family, but they had made sense to me once I was old enough to have to put up with other people's bullshit. Being the kind of person who smiled at someone who was being a jackass usually pissed off the assholes a lot more than being rude in return did. In some cases, though, people might also think you had brain damage when you did it, but it was a risk I was willing to take. But in this case, in that moment, forcing myself not to obviously flip Aiden off was a lot harder than normal. It was one thing for him to ignore me when I tried to be playful with him, or when I said goodbye or good morning. But for him to act that way with me in front of other people? I mean, he wasn't exactly a teddy bear on the best of days, but he usually wasn't a model for asswipe and fitch. At least not when we were around other people, which was rare. One, two, three, four, five. I had this. I raised my eyebrows and beamed over at him like nothing was wrong, even though I was pretty much seething on the inside and wondering how to give him diarrhea. What the fuck is his deal? Christian muttered under his breath as I settled the camera back into its case and then into my bag. I couldn't decide whether to leave as quickly as possible or stay where I was because he was out of his damn mind if he thought I was going to do his bidding when he talked like that to me. The reminder that I didn't need to take his crap anymore hit me right between the eyebrows and my shoulder blades. I could take him being aloof and cold. I could handle him not giving a single crap about me personally. But embarrassing me in front of other people? There was only so much you could forgive and ignore. One, two, three, four, five, six... Is he always like that? Christian's voice jump-started me out of my thoughts. I shrugged a shoulder, conscious not to put my foot in my mouth in front of someone who was practically a stranger, even though said man wasn't exactly on my list of people I would pull out of a burning building at the minute. He's a good boss. I let the bland, forced compliment out, getting to my feet. I don't take it personally. Usually. I need to get going, anyway. 
See you, I said as I slipped the strap of my bag over my shoulder and picked up the insulated bag with the big guy's food inside. I'm sure I'll see you soon, he noted, his tone just a little too bright, too fake. I nodded before noticing Aiden taking a knee on the turf, staring over with a perfectly impassive expression on his face. Fighting the uneasy feeling I got from him practically telling me to scram, I went to stand on the other side of the tire. He was sweaty. His t-shirt was clinging to the muscles of his pectorals like a second, paler skin. His face was tight, almost bored. So basically, the norm. I tried to steady my words and heart. Confusion, anger, and honestly, a little hurt soured my stomach as I watched him. Is there something wrong? I asked slowly, steadily, as I tapped my fingers along the stitching of the bag with his camera and my things inside. No. He answered sharply, like he would have if I'd asked him if he wanted something with fennel for dinner. I cleared my throat and rubbed the side of my hand against the seam of my pants, warily, counting to three that time. Are you sure? Why would anything be wrong? Because you're being a massive douchebag, I thought. But before I could make up something else, he kept going. I don't pay you to sit around and talk. Oh, no. He leaned his entire upper body forward to rest against the length of his leg in a deep stretch. Did you bring my breakfast? I tried to be patient. I really did. For the most part, I had patience on lockdown. There was no sense of, this is mine, when you had three older sisters who didn't respect anyone's boundaries and one little brother. Needless to say, I didn't get my feelings hurt particularly easily, and I didn't hold 99% of things against my brother or sisters when they said something they wouldn't mean later on. But that was the problem. Aiden wasn't my brother. He wasn't even my friend. I could take a lot, but I wasn't obligated to take anything from him. In that moment, I realized how over this shit I was. I was done. Done. Maybe I was scared as hell of quitting, but I would rather take a gamble on myself than stay there and get insulted by someone who wasn't any better than me. Calmly, 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 despite the angry ringing in my ears, I made myself focus on his question and answered, my voice stony. Yes. I held up the bag he clearly would have seen when I walked up to him. He grunted. As much as I could respect Aiden for being so determined, focused, and logical, sometimes it grated on me just how blind he was to everything else in his life. In all the time I'd worked for him, he still couldn't grace me with more than an occasional thank you or good lunch. Sure, I knew that you shouldn't expect someone's gratitude for doing things just because it was good manners, but still... I could count the number of times he'd smiled at me or asked me how I was doing on one hand. One freaking hand. I was a person who filled a role, but I could have been any person filling this role and it wouldn't have mattered. I did a good job, hardly ever complained, and always did what needed to be accomplished even if I didn't want to do it. I tried to be nice to him, to mess with him, even though he definitely didn't care for it because... What was life if you took it too seriously? But he'd pretty much just told me to shoo in front of other people. Is that all? Aiden's rough voice snapped me out of my thoughts. I have a workout I need to finish. It was an oddly relieving sensation that pierced through my chest right then. I felt like I could breathe. Standing there, I felt right. Yeah, that's all, boss. I swallowed, forced a smile on my face, and walked out of there with my head held high, thinking, I'm done. I'm so done. What was wrong with him? I'd been around Aiden dozens of times when he was having a bad day. 
Bad days with Aiden Graves were nothing new or anything to particularly hold on to. Even practices with the 300s were serious business for him. Every mistake he made was like a strike against his soul that he'd dwelled on. He'd said so in interviews plenty of times in the past. How he'd lie in bed going over plays until he'd fall asleep. He was cranky on days that the sun was out, and he was cranky on cloudy days, too. I could handle grouchy men who preferred their own company. Usually, he just glared and maybe snarled a bit. No big deal. He didn't throw things or yell. But acting like an asshole with me in public? Saying that kind of stuff? That was new even for him. And that was probably why I was handling it so badly. Sometimes the worst things you could ever hear were wrapped in sweet tones and calm voices. I walked out of the facility distracted. I even drove my car, muttering to myself under my breath. Twenty minutes later, I pulled into Aiden's subdivision and parked on the street, like usual. When I opened the front door... I realized something was wrong when the alarm system wasn't beeping. The alarm wasn't beeping. Zach? I yelled, reaching into my purse for my pepper spray at the same time I made my way through the kitchen, toward the door that led into the garage, to see if there was a car in there. I didn't make it that far. Sitting on the onyx countertop, right next to the refrigerator, were dangling long legs stuffed into brown leather cowboy boots. I didn't need to look at the upper body above them. I knew what I would see. A threadbare t-shirt, a narrow, handsome face, and light brown hair hidden beneath that black Stetson he'd owned for years. Zachary James Travis was draped across the counter with a bag of chips in his lap. At six foot three, Zach was the second string quarterback of the Dallas 300s. Plagued by one injury after another, Austin, Texas's once upon a time star had stumbled through the last six years of his career, or so the sports analysts said. But that wasn't how I knew Zach. With a twang in his accent, clothes that told everyone the only thing he worried about was them being clean and comfortable and a smile that made most women swoon, he was my buddy, my confidant, where his roommate was not. And I hadn't seen him in almost three months since he'd left to go back home for part of the off-season. In that instant, though, I didn't miss him that much. You almost got sprayed in the face! I thought you were coming next week! I panted with my hand on my chest, the other hand clutching my pepper spray. Dropping his boot-clad feet to the floor, I finally let my eyes go up to find that he was standing there with his arms open, smiling wide. He was fresh-faced, tanner than usual, and, eyeing his middle section, maybe a little thicker. I missed you too, darling. Temporarily pushing aside the veil Aiden's crappy mood had put over my head, I couldn't help but smile. What are you doing here? I figured it wasn't going to kill me to come back a little early. He explained as he rounded the kitchen island and came to stand in front of me, pretty much towering over my five foot seven frame. Before either of us could say another word, his arms were around me. I hugged him back. The only person that might be getting killed soon is you know who. I've almost poisoned him a few times these last couple of months. I took a sniff of him and almost laughed at the scent of Old Spice he insisted on wearing. Is he still alive? He drawled the question lazily, but seriously. Thinking about his comment at the facility had me scowling into his shirt. Barely. Pulling back, the smile Zach had on his face withered, his eyes narrowing as he studied my features. You look like hell, sugar. You not sleeping? He asked as he kept eyeballing what I was sure were the circles under my eyes. I shrugged beneath his palms. What was the point in lying? Not enough. He knew better than to give me shit. Instead, he simply shook his head. For a second, I thought about how Aiden would react to the four to five hours I usually squeezed in. 
he was even more religious about getting anywhere from eight to ten hours of snooze time daily. That was also part of the reason why he didn't have any friends. Thinking about Aiden reminded me of the conversations I'd had recently, and how I hadn't talked to Zach in two weeks. I finally told Aiden, I blurted out. His thin mouth fell open, those milky blue eyes going wide. You did? Zach had known what my plans were. Soon after we started getting to know each other, he'd seen me working on my tablet while I was having lunch one afternoon and asked me what I was doing. So I'd told him. He'd simply grinned at me and replied, No shit, Van. You got a website or something? Since then, I'd redone the logo for his personal website after I'd insisted how much of a good idea it was for branding himself and done various banners for his media pages. As a result, he'd gotten me more work through a couple of the other players on the team. I threw my hands up and put a smile on my face at the same time I wiggled my fingers. I did it. I told him. I practically sang. What'd he say? The most unapologetically nosy man I'd ever known asked. I fought and lost the urge to grimace at the memory of how much Aiden hadn't said. Nothing. He just told me to let Trevor know. One of Zach's light brown eyebrows twitched. Huh. I ignored it. It didn't matter if Zach thought the same thing I did. What a dick thing to do. Yay, I muttered, still giving him spirit fingers because even memories of Aiden weren't going to raid on my parade of quitting soon. He eyed me speculatively for a moment before the emotion was wiped off and he slapped me on the shoulder hard enough to make me go oof. It's about damn time. I rubbed my arm. I know, I'm relieved I finally sucked it up. But between you and me, I still want to hurl when I think about it. He watched my hand for a second before making his way back around the island. With his back to me, he said, Oh, you'll be fine. I'm going to miss the hell out of your meatloaf when you're gone, but not all of us get to do what we love for a living. I'm glad you finally get to join the club, darling. Some days, I didn't completely understand why I wasn't madly in love with Zach. He was a little full of himself, but he was a pro football player so it wasn't exactly a surprising trait. Plus, he was tall, and I loved tall guys. In the end, though, all I felt and had ever felt toward Zach was friendship. The fact that I'd gone out to buy him hemorrhoid cream a couple of times probably helped solidify the lines in our friend zone. I'll make you meatloaf any time you want, I told him. You said it. Zach grabbed a banana from the metal tree next to the fridge. I'm so damn happy to hear you did it. I shrugged, happy, but still a tiny bit nervous about the situation, despite knowing it was mostly unreasonable. Me too. For a second, I thought about telling him how Aiden had been acting an hour ago, but what was the point? They had polar opposite personalities as it was, and I knew they got fed up with each other at times. Really, when I thought about it, I wondered how or why they still lived together. They didn't spend much time together or go out and do stuff that friends did. But with one guy who felt so uncertain with his position on the team that he didn't want to buy a house, and another who wasn't even an American resident, I guess they both found themselves in weird situations. How much longer are you... Zach started to ask, just as his phone rang. With a wink, he pulled it out of his pocket and said, uh, Give me a sec, it's... damn, it's Trevor. Ugh. He and Aiden had the same manager. It was how they ended up living together. He knows? He asked, pointing down at the illuminated screen of his phone. I scrunched up my nose. He hung up on me. That earned me a laugh. Let me see what he wants, then you can tell me what he said. I nodded again and watched as he answered the call and headed toward the living room. Setting my bag on the counter, I started cleaning up the kitchen, remembering at the last minute that it was trash day. 
Pulling the bag out, I put another one in there and then headed into the garage to grab the city-issued can. I slapped the button to open the garage door. I held my breath before opening the bin lid, throwing the bag in, and then dragging the can down the driveway toward the curb. Just as I was setting it in place, a woman ran by across the street at a steady pace, heading in the direction of where one of the subdivision's walking trails started. Something, which was as close to jealousy as I thought I could get, panged through my stomach. I eyed my knee and flexed it a little, knowing I could jog if I wanted to, but most of the time I was too tired. Years of physical therapy had done a lot, and I knew my knee would ache less if I actually exercised regularly, but I just didn't have the time. And when I did have the time, I spent it doing other things. What a bunch of excuses. I wanted all these things out of my life. I had finally put in my notice to quit, and everything seemed to be going okay. Or at least things could have been a lot worse than they were. Maybe it was time to start working on other things I wanted to do. I'd been so focused on building up my business the last few years that I'd put off doing a hundred other things I could remember wanting to do when I was a kid. Screw it. I only had this one life to live, and I didn't really want to sit back and not accomplish the things I wanted. It was time, damn it. Four. The thing with having a terrible day is that a lot of times, you don't know it's going to be a bad one until it's too late. It isn't until your clothes are on, you've eaten breakfast, and you're out of the house, so it's too late to go back to request a sick day, and bam, the signs stare you right in the eye, and you know your day has instantly gone into the shitter. I woke up that morning at five o'clock slightly earlier than usual because it was going to be a busy day of running around, to the smell of my coffee machine going and my alarm clock blaring the most obnoxious tone in its programming. I showered, slipped a thick headband on to keep the hair out of my face, and threw on a pair of slim red cropped pants, a short-sleeved blouse, flats, and my glasses. My two cell phones, tablet, and laptop were all sitting together on the counter in the kitchen, I grabbed my things, poured a travel mug with coffee, and hauled ass out of my apartment when the sky was still sleepier than it was awake. I managed to make it all the way to the parking lot when things started to go wrong. I had a freaking flat. My apartment complex was too cheap for working outside lights, so it took me three times as long to change the tire than it would have usually taken me, and I stained my pants in the process. I was running late, so I didn't go back to change. Luckily, the rest of the drive went by fine. There wasn't a single light on at any of the other houses surrounding my bosses, so my usual spot in front of the 4,000-square-foot home was empty. I went inside through the front door, disarmed the security panel, and headed straight to the kitchen just as the pipes began humming with use upstairs. I put on the apron hanging from a hook in the corner of the kitchen because one stain was enough for only having been up two hours. I pulled fruit out of the freezer, the kale and carrots I'd washed and prepped the day before out of the fridge, measured a cup of pumpkin seeds out of a glass container on the counter, and dumped it all into the $500 blender on the countertop. On the mornings when he didn't leave the house to go to training first thing, he had a big smoothie, worked out a little at home, and afterward had a normal breakfast. As if a 64-ounce beverage could be considered a snack. When I was done blending the ingredients, I poured the mixture into four big glasses and placed Aiden's portion in front of his favorite spot on the kitchen island. Two apples out of the fridge later, I set it all right next to the glasses of smoothie. Like clockwork, the sound of thunder on the steps warned me the wall of Winnipeg was on his way down. We had this routine set up that didn't require words to get through it. The second sign I'd been given that today wasn't going to be my day was the scowl Aiden had on his face, but my attention had been too focused on washing the blender to notice it. 
Good morning, I said without glancing up. Nothing. I still hadn't been able to give up greeting him, even though I knew he wouldn't respond. My manners wouldn't let me. So I went on like always, washing dirty dishes as the man sitting on the stool in front of me drank his breakfast. Then, once he was ready, he finally cracked the silence with a low, sleep-stained, and hoarse-voiced, What's the plan for today? You have a radio interview at nine. He grunted his acknowledgement. Today is the day the Channel 2 news people are coming by. Another grunt, but that one was especially unenthusiastic. I didn't blame him. At the same time, I didn't understand why his manager had even gotten him that kind of publicity with the local news. It was one thing for him to get through an interview in a hotel room, in the press room after a game, or in the locker room, but one at his house? I'd spent the day before dusting the hell out of the living room and kitchen in preparation for it. Then you have that luncheon you were invited to at the senior center you donated money to. Last month, you had me confirm with them. I kind of eyed him after I said it, half expecting him to say he'd changed his mind and wasn't going. He didn't. He nodded that tiny baby nod that could have been easy to miss. Did you want me to go with you? I asked, just to be sure. Most of the time, I accompanied him anywhere he went in Dallas, but if I could get out of it, I would. Yes. He grumbled his sleepy reply. Damn. All right, we should get going by eight, just to be on the safe side. He lifted a couple of fingers in acknowledgement or agreement, whatever. Five chugs of smoothie later, he got up and handed over the empty glasses. I'll be in the gym. Get me 15 minutes before we need to leave so I can shower. You got it, boss. Vanessa! I peeked my head into the green room Aiden was waiting in until his radio interview and hit send on the message to my little brother before slipping my personal phone into the back pocket of my jeans. Yes, sir, I called out. I want more water, he replied. He sat on the edge of the couch, busy doing whatever it was he did on his phone. It wasn't like he responded to any fan mail unless I insisted, and he didn't pay his own bills or do his own posts on his social media websites. That was my job. What exactly he did was beyond me. I didn't care enough to snoop. Okay, I'll be back, I replied, trying to remember where I'd seen the break room. It took me a lot longer than I expected to find the vending machines because, of course, no radio station employee happened to be roaming the hallways in my time of need. But I bought two bottles with the cash I had on hand and found my way back to the green room. Did you go all the way to Fiji to get the water? Aiden asked abruptly when I entered. Um, what? I frowned and then blinked. I focused in on my boss and the fact there were two women sitting on the couch perpendicular to him now, catching a glimpse of boobs in a low-cut blouse and too much makeup. I wasn't worried about them. The only thing I was paying attention to was my boss. My temporary boss. My temporary boss, I reminded myself. Is something wrong? I made myself ask carefully as I stood there, staring him right in the eye, even as the two women seemed to squirm in their seats, like when you're a kid and your friend's parents scold them right in front of you. It was that awkward. He watched me right back, his answer more of a pop than a statement. No. No. Why did I bother asking stupid questions? Really? For a moment, I thought about keeping my mouth closed, but this moody crap was getting old real quick. His usual grumpiness was one thing, but this was a total other. The fact he was being an asshole again in public hummed a quiet song that was too easy to ignore and push away before mulling over, because I didn't know the women in the room and I would never see them again. What he'd said in front of Christian had been a different story. 
picking at the material covering my headband. I glared at that whiskered face and that whiskered face alone. I know it's not my position to say anything, but if there's something you want to talk about, my voice was rough, anger tinting each syllable. His sole focus was on me. The big guy straightened his spine and set his phone on top of one of his thighs. He wore his usual baggy shorts and t-shirt. You're right. I don't pay you for your opinion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I balled up the sensation burning my esophagus and willed myself to keep it together. I knew what it was like to be picked on. I knew what it was like to be treated like crap by the people you were supposed to care about. I wasn't going to cry over Aiden. I didn't cry over people who didn't deserve my tears, and Aiden, especially not fucking Aiden, wouldn't be the person to break me. Not now, not ever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He was right. I was his PA, and that was what he paid me for no matter how hard I gritted my teeth. I was leaving soon. He wouldn't be my business any longer. Biting the inside of my cheek, I made myself let the moment go, even though I would later look back on it and realize it was the hardest thing I'd ever done. In a calm, even voice, I set the bottles of water on the table, maybe slightly breathing like a dragon. Do you need anything else right now? No. The rude bastard muttered. I smiled at him, even though I was positive my nostrils were flaring, and kept right on ignoring the women who had gotten to their feet. I didn't need to ask to know that they had invited themselves in and were now regretting that decision. Good. I'll be out here then. I got out of there and leaned my back against the wall right next to the door, my fists clenching at my sides. A second later, the two strangers who had magically appeared were out of the room, two dark heads pressed together as they walked down the hall and out of sight. It wasn't the first time women had tried to approach Aiden and gotten shut down immediately. Either way, it wasn't like I even cared. I was too pissed off to give a crap about anything other than the asswipe in the green room. What the hell was his deal? I hadn't told him about the multiple emails he'd gotten from angry fans in San Antonio over the canceled signing. He wouldn't have given a crap about them either way. Trevor and Rob hadn't been blowing up my phone or his about anything lately. He didn't seem to be having any issues with his tendon, either. What was it? Then, he had everything and anything he wanted. What the hell could possibly be wrong in his nearly perfect little world? This was the last year of his contract, and he'd been putting off talking about what he wanted to do after it was over. But he had options. Probably too many options, if that was possible. Getting bent out of shape over that didn't make sense, at least this early. Aiden focused on the now. I could see him worrying about the future once the season was at least halfway over. So what else could it be? Hi, miss. A voice called out from down the hallway with a wave. We're ready for Mr. Graves, the radio station employee said. I forced a smile on my face and nodded. Okay. I dropped the smile before peeking into the room and giving Miranda a flat, expressionless look, as everything in me raged at the sight of his face. They're ready for you. After the interview, the ride back to Aiden's place had been quiet and tense. As soon as we arrived, he disappeared into his gym without a single word. I raged to myself as I swept and mopped the living room and kitchen floor again, angrily, in anticipation of the camera crew coming. I knew what Aiden had done hadn't been the floor's fault, but it was the only thing I had around that I could take my frustrations out on. 
I had just started working on the hallway that led from the front of the house to the half bathroom in the gym when I overheard Aiden. I'm about sick and tired of hearing what you think is best for me. I know what's best for me. Aiden's familiar voice spat. Uh, what? No, you listen to me. Maybe I'll re-sign with them, maybe I won't. But don't make promises I have no intention of keeping. Aiden kept going with venom in every vowel. Was he contemplating leaving Dallas? Don't glorify what you've done. I have what I have because of my hard work, no one else's. Aiden added after a brief pause. Who was he talking to? Trevor? Rob? I don't care. Aiden growled a moment later. The silence after that was heavy, almost ominous, and extremely alarming. All I'm asking is for you to do what's best for me. That's what you're supposed to do. You work for me, not the team. Well, someone wasn't just being bitchy to me today. That should have made me feel better, but it didn't. I don't need to remember anything, Aiden said carefully, his tone controlled and cool. Don't open your mouth. It's that easy. Don't promise them anything. Don't even talk to them. I'm telling you to listen to what I want. That's what I pay you to do, isn't it? Then, just like that, it was over. I must have stood completely still for at least five minutes, listening. But there was nothing else said. I stayed rooted in place, breathing as quietly as possible until I figured enough time had passed to not make a suspicious sound. Slacking on the job? Zack asked, his head hanging over from the top stair rail. I froze. What if Aiden thought I might have overheard his conversation? Damn it. I coughed and smiled innocently up. You're barely waking up? I tried to play it cool. It's my day off, he explained as he jogged down the steps. Hasn't every day been your day off? I teased, not waiting for him to answer. Ask me what time I woke up this morning, I said, putting my chin on the top of the swiffer handle. I don't want to know, darling. He patted my shoulder as he walked by me into the kitchen. I don't want to know. I snorted and pushed the dusting device around the hardwood floor as the sounds of Zack messing around in the kitchen kept me company while I thought about Aiden's conversation. He had never said anything about leaving the team, and I guess I hadn't assumed he would. Judging from the digits in his bank account, at least the account I had access to, his contract extension a few years ago had been more than lucrative. Plus, he'd only improved. He was the face of the 300s. They would give him anything he asked for. But who the hell actually knew what that was? I sure didn't. Aiden should be singing praises for the 300s all day every day for what they'd given him in exchange for his skills. <laughs> the house is looking good, Cinderella. Zack snorted as he held a bowl to his chest and snuck by me before I could whack him with the handle. He dashed through the doorway that led into the living room. The television was turned on a moment later. Before I knew it, Aiden was in his bedroom, getting dressed in something other than workout clothes for the first time in months, and a Channel 2 news truck was parking on the curb across the street. With a quick glance around, I made sure the house looked even more spot-free than usual. By the time the doorbell started ringing, Zack was zooming up the stairs with a panicked expression on his face. I don't live here, he muttered on his journey just as I reached the door and opened it. A man in a suit and two cameramen stood on the other side. Hi, come in, I said, waving them forward. Aiden will be down in a second. Would you like something to drink? All three of them glanced around carefully as I showed them into the living room where a producer and Trevor had already agreed would be the best place to film. I caught the camera guy looking at the walls when Aiden jogged down the steps. I'd never lived through an earthquake, but I was sure him on the steps might register on the Richter scale. He filled the entrance to the living room, 
his shoulders and arms looking spectacular in the white polo shirt he'd somehow squeezed into and the khaki pants he had to get specially made for his oversized thighs. I edged my way out of the corner of the living room, not necessarily wanting to, but knowing I needed to. Just because I was pissed off at him didn't mean I stopped doing my job. Need anything before you start? His eyes were everywhere, except on me. Get them some water. Oh, ye of little expectations. I blew out a breath, ground down on my molars, and nodded. I was already going to do that. I was just waiting for you to come downstairs. When the doorbell rang, I frowned and walked around Aiden, wondering if one of the crew had been outside taking a smoke break. Peeking through the hole, I saw a face I'd seen enough of recently through video chat. Trevor. Of all the people in the world. Undoing the lock, I slowly let it swing open, but put my body between him and the crack in the door. Vanessa? The forty-ish man greeted me. My eyelids lowered. Trevor. Dressed in a steel gray suit, with his hair combed back, he looked every bit the high-powered sports manager he was. And a douche. Can I come in? He didn't make it sound like a question. Could he? Yes. Did I want him to? No. But considering his two clients lived here, I didn't really have a say. I didn't know you were in town, I commented as he stepped past me inside. Only for the day, he said, casually strolling in and heading into the living room. Had he been in town talking to the team about Aiden? Was that who Aiden had been on the phone with? To give Aiden and Trevor credit, they both acted like they hadn't just been arguing recently. What a bunch of fake asses. I held back my eye roll and headed into the kitchen to grab enough bottles of water for the entire crew, Aiden, and the white devil. I set the bottles on the coffee table and headed toward the half bath to take a quick pee. Man, Zack whisper hissed when I was in the hallway. I tipped my head back to find him peeking over the railing and couldn't help but grin. What are you doing? I whispered, eyeing the living room to make sure no one was paying attention. I'm begging you. I'll love you forever, darling. He started. That had me groaning. I knew I was going to say yes to whatever he was about to ask of me just because he was being so cute. I don't want to go down there, but I'm starving. I have two sandwiches in the fridge. Can you toss them up to me? I blinked. Did he not know who he was talking to? Me tossing stuff? Give me a second. He pumped his hands in front of his chest before retreating behind the banister. What a goofball. As I passed by the doorway of the living room to go into the kitchen... I could see the crew arranging white umbrellas and bright lights by the couches as the man in the suit talked to Aiden and Trevor. I snagged the two foot-long sandwiches, still in their wax paper wrapper from the fridge, and hustled up the stairs with them and a bag of sweet potato chips. I knew him. He'd get hungry in half an hour on just a sandwich. Sure enough, Zach was waiting at the top of the stairs, his back against the guest bedroom's closed door, just far enough away from the staircase so that anyone standing at the bottom couldn't see him. He beamed when he spotted my offering. It didn't escape me that he still hadn't gotten dressed for the day. I couldn't wait until I didn't have to either. Oh, I love you, Vanny. Do you know I love you? I handed him his things. So you've said. I do. Anything you ever need, I'm your loyal servant. He said busy peering down the stairs as he whispered. How about a million bucks? Zach glanced at me over his shoulder. Well, anything but that. I don't even have a million bucks for me. I'm the poor guy in the house. Considering he probably made eight times what I did, at least, I wouldn't call him poor. But comparing him to money bags of Winnipeg in the living room, I could see his point. 
Have you seen Vanessa? Aiden's voice carried up the stairs from below. Just as I opened my mouth to let him know where I was, Trevor answered. Since when do I keep track of your dinner roll? He replied in a voice that definitely wasn't a whisper. Did that asshole just call me fat? Zach's eyes met mine as if he was thinking the same thing. I frowned and put my index finger up to my mouth so I could focus on listening. Apparently, I was a masochist who liked to do things that caused myself pain and anger. She was here a second ago. I know this isn't the time, but I will find you somebody else. That was the asshole talking. She did tell you she was quitting, didn't she? Aiden's... Uh-huh. Made it up the stairs. Good. I'll find you a replacement soon. Don't worry. I'm not. The traitor replied, which only slightly insulted me. I was worried you weren't going to handle it well. Trevor admitted, but I was so focused on what was being said, I didn't pick up on the hints he was leaving with his word choice. She can do whatever she wants. The wall of Winnipeg replied in that cool voice that held zero emotion, a confirmation of its own that he meant what he said. What a damn dick. Did anyone appreciate me? I never liked her much anyway. The devil's advocate continued. I hadn't liked Trevor much either, but sheesh. Weren't there more important things in the world to talk about than me behind my back? Aiden, on the other hand, grunted, and the insults just kept on coming. Maybe I can find you someone a little easier on the eyes. What do you think? Trevor's tone lightened at his joke. I waited. Then I waited a little longer for Aiden to tell him to shut up and do his job. But I waited in vain. He didn't say a word. After everything I had done for Aiden. Everything. He was going to let Trevor talk shit about me? I mean, I just figured a decent person wouldn't do that. I would never let anyone talk badly about Aiden, unless it was Zach and me doing the shit talking, but I figured we both had get out of jail passes with it, since he was his roommate and I was his lackey. But the entire conversation, this moment, felt like a betrayal at the highest level. It was one thing to be his employee, but for him not to care even a little bit that I was leaving? On top of that, for him to let this asshole talk about me? About my freaking looks, of all things? I'd never shown up to work a sloppy mess. My straight auburn hair was usually fine because I didn't do much with it other than let it loose around my shoulders. I put makeup on and put some effort into my clothes. I wasn't gorgeous, but I wasn't ugly. At least, I didn't think so. And sure, I wasn't a size zero or a three or a five, but was Trevor fucking getting me? Me? A goddamn dinner roll? I was hit on every once in a while. If I wanted a boyfriend, I could have a boyfriend, and he wouldn't look like Shrek either. Damn it. Fucking asshole. Who did he think he was? He wasn't exactly Keanu Reeves to begin with. I managed to count to two before thinking, fuck it, and letting myself get mad. What was I doing here? It had been weeks since I told them I was quitting. Aiden had been bossier and moodier than usual. Colder. I couldn't completely blame it on his injury at this point, either. And here I'd been stressing out about keeping his house clean, putting chocolates on his pillow, and delaying my dreams because I felt bad leaving him, and he couldn't even tell Trevor not to talk about me. I swallowed and blinked once. Only once. I met Zach's eyes and found his jaw clenched. Biting the inside of my cheek, I thought about what I told myself out on the curb with the trash can. I'd begun going for walks that day. I'd even done a little jogging. I'd gotten paid last week. This was my life, and I was the one to choose how to spend it, wasn't I? Hadn't I done enough? Put up with enough? 
sucked it up enough? If I didn't put up with people who should have mattered, why the hell was I putting up with people who didn't? Life was what you made out of it. At least that was what those chicken soup books my foster father thrust on me when I was a teenager imprinted on me. When life gives you lemons, you get to choose what you make out of them. It doesn't always have to be lemonade. With a mental slap to my own butt, I nodded at the only loyal person in this house. I'm out of here. Van. He started to say, shaking his head. His long face was tight. Don't worry about it. They're not worth it. Zack scrubbed at the side of his jaw before tilting his head in the direction of the stairs. Get out of here before I try to go kick both their asses. That had me sucking in a watery snort. Try to kick both of their asses. Give me a call or a text every once in a while, all right? Nothing would stop me from doing it, he assured me, putting his fist out. Thinking of my psychopath older sisters, I filled my veins with every inch of hard-earned resolve I had within me and fist-bumped him. We looked at each other for a moment before hugging. Just a second. Not a goodbye, but an I'll see you later. Down the stairs, I ignored the bare walls I'd be looking at for the last time. The sound of voices in the living room almost had me glancing over, but I didn't care enough to waste the energy. I was over this. In the kitchen, I pulled my work phone out of my bag, fished my keys out of my purse, and pulled Aiden's house, mailbox, and P.O. box key off the ring. Setting those four items on the kitchen island, I rubbed at my eyebrow with the back of my hand, adjusted my purple-framed glasses, and tried to make sure I hadn't left anything lying around. Then again, if I left something, Zach could grab it for me. I rubbed my pants with the palms of my hands and slung my purse over my shoulder, nervous anticipation flooding my stomach. I was doing this. I was fucking doing it. Could you go out and grab me something to eat? Trevor asked, suddenly standing in the kitchen when I turned around to leave. Well, I knew I was supposed to kill even this dipshit with kindness, I couldn't dig deep enough inside of me to be an adult. This was the last time I'd have to put up with his crap. I'd never have to see him again, deal with him again. Amen and thank you, Jesus. No, I replied with a little smirk on my face. Dinner roll is leaving now. Please make sure to tell Aiden later on when no one else is around that I said he can eat shit. Trevor's mouth gaped. What? Going out in a mini blaze of glory, I wiggled my fingers at him over my shoulder as I walked out of the kitchen. Just as I reached for the door, I turned to peek in the living room to find Aiden on one couch, talking to the reporter. For a brief split second, those brown eyes met mine across the room, and I'd swear on my life a crease formed between his eyebrows. Just as I opened the door, and before I could talk myself out of it, I mouthed, I deserve better, asshole, making sure he read my lips as I did it. Then I raised my middle finger up at him and waved goodbye with it. I hoped they both got syphilis. Five. One week turned into two, then three, and finally four. In the days that followed me walking out of Aiden's house and subsequently quitting my job, I thought about Aiden a lot more than I would have ever expected when I wasn't busy working. Most of those times didn't even revolve around me wanting to kill him, either. After I walked out of his house, my foot couldn't hit the gas pedal fast enough to get me home. The first thing I did was start on a new project, more determined than ever to succeed at what I loved doing. I was ready and willing to bust my ass to make things work, no matter the cost. The ties had been cut, as far as I was concerned. Aiden had been a fucking jackass when I had never accused him of being anything other than practical and determined. I could relate to that, but I couldn't connect with him being such a traitor. I was no Trevor or Rob. 
I didn't make extra money off the choices he made, and if anything, things were better for me when he was happier. Hadn't I tried to do what was best for him? Hadn't I tried to do things that made him happy? Yet he'd let that asswipe talk about me when I'd spent last Christmas in Dallas instead of going to see my little brother because he still hadn't been able to move around much at that point. Unfortunately, I thought about Aiden first thing in the morning for days after I walked out. My body wasn't used to sleeping in until eight. Even on my days off, I was usually up and about by six. I thought about him as I made my breakfast and chomped on breakfast sausage. Then I thought about him again at lunchtime and dinner, so used to making his meals and eating part of them. Each day, for those first two weeks of freedom, I thought about him often. You couldn't work with someone five, six, or even sometimes seven days a week for two years without getting into a routine. I knew I couldn't just erase him from my life like he'd been drawn in with a pencil. Much less erase that moment when I realized I'd been holding onto a job with a man who wouldn't come to my funeral, even if it fell on a day he was supposed to rest. The fact I had family members who wouldn't go to my funeral didn't really help ease the sting of it enough. After a few days, my anger abated, but that feeling of betrayal that had seared my lungs didn't exactly go away completely. Something had been going on with him. That much had been obvious. Maybe under normal circumstances, he wouldn't have acted like such a massive prick. But he had crossed the thin little line I'd drawn in the imaginary sand. And I did what felt right. So it was done. I kept living my life as my own boss, which was exactly what I'd planned on doing anyway. And I didn't look back at what I'd done. I was speed walking toward my apartment one night after a visit to the gym, finalizing the last brainstorming touches I wanted to add to a paperback design I was aiming to finish before I went to bed, when I spotted a figure sitting at the bottom of the stairs, patting the pepper spray I always kept within reach, especially when I was in my complex. I narrowed my eyes and wondered who the hell would be sitting there right then. It was nine o'clock at night. Only drug dealers hung around outside our complex after dark. Everyone else knew better. Plus, who liked sitting outside with the summer heat and mosquitoes? With that in mind, I walked a little faster, conscious that my knee ached only a little after my two-mile run. Two miles... It had only taken me half a month of jogging four times a week to work up to a steady one-mile distance, and then I'd added another mile, going just a bit faster. It was something, and I was proud of myself. The plan was to up another mile this week. My hand was still on my pepper spray as I kept a wary eye on the... Man, it was definitely a man sitting at the foot of the steps. I squinted. My keys were in my free hand, ready to get put to good use, either to open my door or to stab somebody in the eye if it came down to it. I had just started pulling my spray out when a male voice spoke up. Vanessa? For one split second, I froze at the sound of the rumbling, raspy tone, more than slightly caught off guard at the fact that this stranger sitting on the stairs knew my name. Then it hit me. Recognition. I stopped in place, just as the not-a-stranger stood up, and I blinked. Hey. My ex-boss straightened to his impressive full height, confirming it was him. Aiden. It was Aiden. Here. Crouched down, he could have been any guy who worked out, especially when he had his arms tucked into his sides hiding the girth of muscles that made him famous. The possibility that this was the first time he'd ever used the H word with me was the first thought that ran through my head before I blurted out, what are you doing here? I was definitely frowning. My forehead was creasing and scrunching up as I took him in, in his t-shirt and shorts, for the first time in a month. 
His face was that same immovable mask as always. Those brown eyes I'd seen hundreds of times in the past bore down on me. His eyes going over the bright ruby red I'd let Diana color my hair two weeks ago. He didn't comment on it. You live here? His question cut the air between us abruptly. His gaze dropped to the hand I had on my pepper spray, and the set of keys clutched between my fingers. I thought about my neighbors, the crappy building, the number of cars parked in the lot that were always in some sort of disrepair, and the cracked sidewalk with a dying lawn straddling it. I rarely had people over, so it wasn't like I had any reason to care about where I lived. All I'd needed was a roof over my head. Plus, it could be worse. Things could always be worse. I tried to never forget that. Then, I thought of the beautiful, gated community Aiden lived in, and the awesome kitchen I'd cooked in so many times before. And finally, I envisioned the stained carpet in my apartment and the peeling vinyl countertops with only a slight cringe. I wasn't going to be ashamed that I didn't live in an upscale condo. It was the first place I'd ever had all to myself, and it had done what I needed it to do. Give me a place to sleep and work in peace. So I nodded slowly, surprised. Okay, I was shocked as hell to see him. I'd talked to Zach a few times since I quit and had gone to eat with him twice, but except for once, he hadn't brought up Aiden in any of the conversations we'd had. The extent of what he'd told me about my ex-boss was that they'd been working out together. That had been more than enough. Aiden's gaze didn't waver for a moment. His remote, clean facial expression didn't change at all, either. I want to talk to you. He demanded, more than said. I wanted to know how he found out where I lived, but the question was trapped in my throat. The one-syllable word I knew I needed to tell him had taken a stroll down the block. And then I remembered. Dinner roll. That fucker Trevor had called me a dinner roll, of all things, and this man had said nothing. I couldn't help but squeeze the loose side of my shorts. I'd lost almost ten pounds over the last five weeks, and it had taken its toll on most of my clothes. But thinking about Trevor's comment only made me angry and more resolved. No. There, I said it. Easy. It was so easy to say it. I don't have time. I have a lot of work to do. Guilt nipped at my head for being so rude, but I squashed it. I didn't owe him a single thing, not a moment of time or a single extra thought. That stubborn, strong chin tipped up, that full, masculine mouth flattening, and he blinked. You don't have a few minutes for me? I swallowed hard and fought the urge to fidget under his gaze. No, I have a lot of work to do, I repeated, looking at that familiar face evenly. The lines that came over his forehead settled the emotion he'd been fighting with a second ago. Shock. He was shocked for what was more than likely the first time in his life, and that gave me a boost of strength and confidence not to waver under his glare. We need to talk, he said, brushing off my comment in typical Aiden fashion. What the hell did we need to talk about? Everything that needed to be said between us had been said. He'd been an asshole, and I was done. What more was there? Look, I really am busy. I was just about to make up some other excuse when one of the doors in the building in front of mine closed with a loud snap. I didn't want to find out what could possibly happen if anyone in my complex found out who was standing in the stairwell to my building. I'd been home enough Sunday evenings to know there were football fans everywhere. With a sigh and a promise to myself that he wasn't going to get whatever he came here for, I waved him toward the door. I don't think there's anything for us to talk about, was the only thing I managed to respond with. Did I want to stand outside my apartment? No. 
Did I want to go inside? No, but I definitely didn't want my neighbors finding out a semi-famous millionaire was standing right outside my door. But you can come inside for a little bit before anyone sees you, I said in more of a mumble than anything, turning back to unlock the door. My guess, I added, just because the sight of him made me pretty bitchy. You should have told him to beat it, Van, my brain said. And it was the truth. I held the door open for him, watching out of my peripheral vision as he squeezed inside. Once the door was locked, I flipped on the lights as the big defensive end took a few hesitant steps inside. I could see his head turning one way and then the other, looking at the pieces of stretched canvas art I had on the wall. Not that he knew they were my work unless he looked closely at the initials in the corners. He didn't make a comment, and neither did I. He'd never asked what I did when I wasn't at his house or with him, and I'd never mentioned it, either. Which was funny when I thought about it, because there were players on his team who knew exactly what I did. Players who had sought me out to redo their website banners, two of the guys I'd actually done tattoo designs for. And here was this guy. This guy who I had twice said to... I was thinking your promo shots could be a little simpler. The font they used for your name doesn't look very clear, and the placement looks weird. Do you want me to change it for you? And what had he done in return each time? He'd said, Don't bother. He'd brushed me off. It had taken me weeks to get the nerve to make that suggestion to him, and I would have done it for free. But it was fine. It was his career and his branding not mine. He planted himself on the love seat in my living room, and I spun my desk chair around to face him, looking at him as evenly and unattached as I possibly could. The room was pretty small. The entire apartment was sized for one person. The only furniture that fit, cramped, was the two-seater couch, my desk, a chair, and a bookshelf that doubled as a TV stand. Nerves didn't pound through me as I watched him practically consume the space. I was over this thing with him, and I just didn't have the faintest urge to try and be friendly. I didn't feel like joking with him or making it seem like there weren't any hard feelings. If anything, I was annoyed he was at my apartment. I had nothing left to lose, and he wasn't in charge of my paychecks anymore. I hadn't even stressed when I realized I wouldn't get paid for the last few days I was with him, because there was no way I was contacting Aiden or Trevor. Walking out the way I had and flipping him off in the process had been worth every penny lost. Why are you here, Aiden? I finally broke the silence when a minute or two had passed after we'd sat down. Aiden had his hands on his lap. His face was as remote as it was before a game. Even his shoulders were as tight as ever, his spine eternally straight. I didn't think, even when he was at home, that I'd ever really seen him at ease. His hair was freshly buzzed, and he looked fine and healthy, like he always had, as if a month hadn't passed since the last time we'd been in each other's presence. He leveled his dark gaze on me and said, I want you to come back. I was dreaming. That probably wasn't the best word to use. Nightmaring? Delusional, maybe? Excuse me? I breathed as I took in the whites around his eyes to make sure they weren't bloodshot. Then I took a brief sniff to make sure he didn't smell like a skunk. He didn't, but apparently anything was possible. Are you... Are you on drugs right now? Aiden gave me one hard, slow blink. His short but incredibly thick lashes went to rest for a brief second. Excuse me? His tone was subdued, guarded. Are you on drugs? I repeated myself because there was no way he'd be here asking me this sober. Right? He stared at me with his unflinching eyes and hard, no-nonsense mouth. I'm not on drugs, he said, clearly insulted. 
I eyed him like I didn't believe him, because I didn't. What the hell would give him the idea that I'd go back to work for him? Drugs. Drugs would make him think that wasting his time by coming here was a good idea. Hadn't the parting comment I'd asked Trevor to deliver for me been enough? What I was thinking must have been apparent on my face, because he shook his head and repeated himself. I'm not on drugs, Vanessa. I'd grown up with an addict, and I was well aware they denied they had a problem, even if the signs they were out of control were right smack in front of their face. I narrowed my eyes and searched his features again, trying to find a sign he was on something. Stop looking at me like that. I'm not on anything. He insisted. Faint lines crossed his tan forehead, the children of the time he spent in the sun, and a marker that he was 30 years old and not 22. I glanced at his arms to make sure there weren't any weird bruises on them and came up with nothing. Then I glanced at his hands, trying to peer at the delicate flesh between his fingers to see if there were any track marks there. Still, nothing. I'm not on anything. He paused. Since when have you ever known me to want to take a painkiller? It was my turn to pause, to meet his eyes in the safety of my apartment, and slowly say, Never. I swallowed. But then I also didn't know you to be an asshole, either, I replied before I could stop myself. For one second, he reared back. The motion was minute, tinier than tiny, but I'd seen it. It had been there. His nostrils flared wide, the gesture so exaggerated I couldn't help but take it in. Vanessa? I don't need you to apologize. My hands fiddled at my lap as that small hint of betrayal scourged its way right between my breasts, reminding me that maybe I hadn't completely gotten over what had happened. Maybe. But I made myself tell him, I don't need anything from you. He opened his mouth, and I would swear on my life the muscles high up on his cheeks twitched. He made a small sound, the beginning of a stutter, like he wanted to say something substantial to me for the first time since we'd known each other, but didn't know how to go about it. The thing was, I wasn't in the mood for it. Whatever he might have contemplated saying was a month too late, a year too late, two years too late. I had lied to my loved ones about why I'd suddenly quit, adding up another lie to add to the list of things I'd refrained from telling them over the years because I didn't want them to worry or be angry over something so dumb and insignificant. It didn't matter, though. I didn't work for him anymore, and I'd honestly expected never to see him again. What was the point in getting all bent out of shape? I tried to tell myself that leaving the way I had had been the best way to go about it. Otherwise, who knew how much longer I would have hung around waiting for my replacement? Maybe they would have tried to get rid of me quickly, but I would never know. We were as even as we possibly could be. I didn't feel anything except the barest hum of recognition for someone I'd seen hundreds of times. This guy who I had admired, who I had once respected, who had slightly broken my heart and disillusioned me. I have moved on with my life, though, I thought, forcing my hands still. I just want to know why you're here. I really do have things to do, I said in a calm voice. The man who had earned his nickname in high school, because even back then he'd been a big son of a gun, cocked his head to the side, his tongue sweeping over his upper teeth. The big knot of his Adam's apple bobbed before he finally aimed his gaze back at me accusingly. I kept expecting you to come back after a few days, but you never did. Had I been that much of a pushover? You honestly thought I would do that? I gave him my best, are you serious, look. His eyes slid to the side briefly, but he didn't admit or deny anything. I want you to come back. No matter what, he wasn't going to guilt trip me.
I didn't even have to think about my response. No. He decided to ignore me. Shocking. I tried to get Trevor to find you, but no one even knew you had another cell phone or had your right address. Of course no one did, because neither one of them had ever made an effort to know anything about me, but I kept that to myself. The address they had was from the place where I'd lived with Diana and her brother in Fort Worth, a sister city to Dallas. Rodrigo had moved out a year and a half afterward when his girlfriend had gotten pregnant, and when I got my job with Aiden, I got my own place, needing to be in Dallas instead of traveling back and forth almost an hour every day. Since then, Diana had moved into her own place. It also didn't escape me that Aiden didn't drop Zach's name. He was the only one in our small circle who knew my personal number, and I was sure he wouldn't share it. Come back. I pushed the bridge of my glasses up and used one of the strongest, most resilient words in the English language. No. I'll pay you more. Tempting, but... No. Why not? Why not? Men. It was only freaking men who would be so... so dumb. He hadn't apologized to me for what he'd said. He wasn't even trying to be nice and win me over to come back. Not that I would. It was the same old shit it always was. Come back. Why not? Blah, blah, blah. Why not? Why the hell would I? I almost said I was sorry for not doing what he wanted, but I wasn't. Not even a little bit. As I took in Aiden, his overwhelming size swallowing my couch, demanding that I come back and not understanding why I wouldn't want to, I realized that being nice wasn't going to accomplish anything. I had to tell him the truth, or at least the closest thing to the truth as possible. A small, immature part of me wanted to be mean. I wanted to hurt him the way he'd hurt me, but as I took him in, I took in the man who had provided me with a job that had allowed me to fund and fulfill my dreams. This was the same person who I'd seen at his worst, when he'd faced the possibility he would never play the only thing in the world he loved again. This was Aiden. I knew some of his secrets. I didn't want to care about him, but I guess I couldn't help it, even if it was a subconscious, mutilated version of what it had once been. And I didn't want to be like Trevor, or Susie, or any other person I'd ever met who was mean for the sake of being mean. So I kept it as simple as I could. I stuck my fingers under my thighs and said, I told you, I deserve better. Six. Oh, shit. I spotted the black Range Rover in the parking lot the instant the taxi pulled up in front of the complex by the guest entrance. There was no way I could miss it. I'd taken it to get an oil change and a wash a few times in the past. It wasn't necessarily the nicest car in the lot. A few of my neighbors had Escalades and Mercedes that I wasn't sure how they afforded, but I recognized Aiden's license plate number. Yet it still caught me off guard to see it there. He hadn't exactly left my apartment with a smile on his face a few days ago. After I clearly told him I didn't want to go back to work for him, he looked at me like I was speaking a different language and asked, Is this a joke? There went arrogance for you. I'd answered the only way I would. No. He had gotten to his feet, turned his attention toward the ceiling for a moment, and left. And that was that. The last thing I expected was for him to come back. Then again, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised. I'd learned that this was a person who, once he put his mind to something, nothing deterred him from his goal. This was the person who only heard what he wanted to hear. That didn't exactly leave me with a warm, fuzzy feeling. I guess a big part of me just wanted and expected to make a clean cut with him, especially after he'd made his lack of loyalty so apparent. 
The fact that he'd somehow gotten my address and gone out of his way to come to my apartment when he hadn't even been able to put in a single effort to ask me how I was doing frustrated me more than it probably should have. It was too little, too late. All I would have wanted from him in the past was at least a little bit of loyalty, if not friendship, and he hadn't even been able to give me that. Everything all right, ma'am? Everything is fine, thanks. I lied, gripping the handle. I thought I lost my keys, but <laughs> I found them. How much do I owe you? Paying my fare, I slipped out of the car and hurried through the gate. I made my way toward my apartment, with one hand wrapped around my pepper spray and the other with my keys and wristlet, all too aware that I'd had too much wine to drink to deal with this crap right now. My visitor was in the same spot on the stairs I'd found him days ago. Aiden's gaze almost immediately landed on me, hovering on the hem of the dress I'd worn to dinner as he climbed to his size 13 feet. Dressed in workout shorts that reached his knees and a t-shirt, I was pretty sure he'd left practice and come straight over. If my dates were right, the team was halfway through preseason training camp, focused more on the rookies than on veterans like Aiden. We need to talk, he stated immediately his eyes scraping their way to my chest and catching on the low dip of the cotton sundress right between my breasts. Huh. I gave him a side look as I approached my door, ignoring the curious expression he was giving me. It wasn't like I hadn't worn dresses around him before, but none of them had been above my knees, and they had all covered the girls. The one I had on now? Not so much. But it had been my... I'm meeting up with a man for the first time in almost two years on a blind date, someone who I'd met on the matchmaking website I'd signed up for a few weeks back, dress. While we'd gotten along pretty well in the messages we'd exchanged, we hadn't hit it off in person. Paranoid about meeting a stranger that could write down my license plate, I'd taken a cab to the Italian restaurant we were having dinner at. Give me a few minutes, he said in a slightly less confident and aggressive tone his eyes still dipping to my dress. The temptation to say, oh, you finally want to talk after two years, was on the tip of my tongue, but I held it back and raised my eyebrows at him before sliding the key into the lock. A muscle in his cheek twitched, and he ground out, please. Hell was about to freeze over. He said, please? Before I could think about it much more, voices suddenly came from one of the apartments above mine. Damn it. Aiden's big frame was a little too eye-catching, especially when he happened to be a celebrity in Dallas. Just a few days ago, I'd seen a handful of 300s jerseys around the complex with graves stitched on the back. The last thing I needed was for someone to see him when I had made sure for years not to let anyone find out he was my boss. Come in, I muttered, waving him in quickly before someone spotted him. He didn't need to be told twice. Aiden squeezed his way inside with just enough time for me to close and lock the door just as three men came down the stairs. I walked around him and headed into the kitchen overseeing my living room, frustrated with myself for inviting him in. You look different. His comment had my steps faltering for a moment. I've worn dresses in front of you before, I snapped a little more bitterly than I would have liked. Not one like that. Came the quick, nearly brash retort that came out aggressively enough for me to frown. I wasn't talking about your shirt. My shirt? You look different. I sniffed and circled around the kitchen counter. My hair is a different color and I lost weight. That's all. Aiden took a seat at my small table. Then his gaze brushed over the part of my body he could see. My face, neck, chest, and bare arms. Good lord, he made me self-conscious. As those dark orbs took another sweep over me, his thick eyebrows climbed up his forehead, and he made an indiscriminate noise, like a... Hmm. Like most things with Aiden, another thought immediately forgotten... The next comment out of his mouth confirmed it. I want you to come work for me again. 
I couldn't hold back my groan as I turned to the refrigerator. I mean it. He kept going, as if I doubted him. I took my time opening the fridge and ducked inside to pull out the water jug in there. I was stubborn. I accepted my flaw honestly. But Aiden? Good grief. He had me beat by a landslide. He took stubborn and hard-headed to a whole new level. He was supposed to have just forgotten my existence after a couple of days. Keeping my attention down as I closed the fridge door, I took a calming breath in and let it out. I knew him, and the way he was acting really shouldn't be a surprise. It was like spoiling a kid his entire life and then trying to put your foot down once it was too late. I'd let him get away with too much over the course of the time we'd known each other, and I had to deal with it now. I meant what I said, too. I don't want to, and I'm not going to. Silence ticked by, second on top of second, buoyant and endless with the things I thought we both could have said to each other but didn't. The chair Aiden was sitting on creaked with his weight. I didn't want to look at him. You don't get on my nerves. He noted, almost as if I'd cured cancer. I couldn't look at him. I couldn't even look at him. You don't get on my nerves. I had to set the jug on the counter and grip the sharp edge of the countertop with my free hand. How did he expect me to respond? Did he want me to thank him for such a heartfelt compliment? I counted. One, two, three, four, so that I wouldn't just blurt something out in frustration. Picking and choosing my words carefully, I lifted my head and pulled a glass out of the cabinet. Tell your next employee that talking isn't required, I said as I poured water into my cup. I never told you that. His rough, low voice responded. You didn't have to. Actions spoke louder than words, after all. He let out an exasperated noise and followed it up by saying something that stopped me in the middle of putting the water jug back in the fridge. You're a good employee. One, two, three, four, five. Of all the things he could have said, I could have smacked him in the face right then. I really could have. There are plenty of good employees in the world. You pay well enough for someone to not half-ass their duties. I set the water into the fridge and closed the door. I don't know why you're here. Why you're insisting that you want me to come back when I don't want to be your assistant anymore, Aiden? I can't make myself any clearer. There, I'd said it, and it was painful and relieving at the same time. Do you remember when I first started working for you? Do you remember how I'd tell you good morning every day and ask how you were doing? He didn't reply. Perfect. And do you remember how many times I've asked you if there was something wrong or tried to joke around with you only for you to ignore me? I licked my lips and paused where I was, one shoulder against the refrigerator, able to see him at the kitchen table. I don't think anyone could get on your nerves unless you let them. And anyway, I told you that none of this matters anymore anyway. I don't want to work for you. The big guy sat forward in his seat his nostrils flaring. It matters because I want you to come back. You didn't even care that I was there to begin with. Sudden irritation at what he was trying to do set the nerves of my spine on fire. You will not bang your head against the fridge. You will not bang your head against the fridge. You don't even know me. I know you. Exasperation like I didn't know gripped my chest. You don't know me. You've never tried to know me, so don't give me that, I snapped, and immediately felt guilty for some stupid reason. I told you I was quitting, and you didn't give a shit. I don't know why you care now, but it doesn't matter. This work relationship between you and me is done, and that was all we had to begin with. Find someone else, because I'm not going back to work for you. That's the end of the story. Aiden didn't blink didn't inhale or exhale. He didn't even twitch. 
His gaze was locked on me like his pupils were all-knowing lasers capable of emotional manipulation. For the longest moment in time, there wasn't a single sound in my tiny apartment. Then, abruptly, in a tone that was completely Aiden, as if he hadn't just heard a single word that came out of my mouth, he said, I don't want someone new. I want you. I suddenly wished I could have recorded his comeback so I could sell it on the internet to the hundreds of girls who filled his inbox every week with offers of dates, blowjobs, companionship, and sex. But I was too busy getting more and more aggravated by the second to do so. Where the hell was he getting the nerve to say that to me? Maybe, and I just want you to think about it for the future, you should consider what other factors are important in employee retention. You know, like making people feel appreciated, giving them a reason to stay loyal to you. It isn't just about a paycheck, I replied as gently as I could, even though I knew damn well he didn't exactly deserve to get handled with kid gloves. You'll find someone. It's just not going to be me. His brown eyes sharpened and left an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. I'll pay you more. Listen to me. This isn't about money, for freaking sake. About a thousand different thoughts seemed to go through his head in that instant, as one of his cheeks pulled back into what seemed like half a grimace. I had no idea what he was thinking, and I sighed. How did we get to this point? Six weeks ago, I couldn't get him to tell me hello. Now he was at my apartment, sitting at my hand-me-down dining room table, asking me to work for him again after I'd walked out. It was like an episode of The Twilight Zone. His chin tipped back in a determined gesture I was too familiar with. My visa expires next year. He ground out, and I shut my mouth. A few months ago, I remembered opening his mail and seeing something about his visa in an official-looking letter. A letter that I thought he might have gotten again right before I quit, when I'd told him he needed to check the things I'd left on his desk. I didn't get how a visa could be used as an excuse for being a jerk. Okay, did you already send the paperwork to renew it? The words had no sooner come out of my mouth than I was asking myself what the hell I was doing. This wasn't my business. He'd made it not my business. But I still wasn't expecting it when he said, No. I didn't understand. Why not? Damn it, what the hell was I doing asking questions? I scolded myself. It's a work visa. His words were slow, like I was mentally impaired or something. I still didn't get what the problem was. It's subject to me playing for the three hundreds. I blinked at him, thinking maybe he'd taken one too many hits to the skull in his career. I don't get what the problem is. Before I could ask him why he was worried about his visa when any team he signed with would help him get a new one, he cleared his throat. <sighs> I don't want to go back to Canada. I like it here. This was the same Winnipeg native who had only once gone back to his motherland in all the time we'd worked together. I'd grown up in El Paso, but I didn't go home much either because nothing really felt like home anymore. I hadn't had a place that made me feel safe or loved or warm, or any of the feelings I figured could be associated with what home should feel like. I glanced at the wall to the side of his head, waiting for the next revelation to help make sense of what he was saying. I'm still not understanding what the issue here is. With a deep sigh, he propped his chin on his hand, and he finally explained. If I'm not on a team, I can't stay here. Why wouldn't he be playing? Was his foot bothering him? I wanted to ask him, but didn't. Okay. Isn't there some other kind of visa you can apply for? I don't want to get another visa. I blew out a breath and shut the refrigerator door, my fingers instantly going up to my glasses. 
Okay, go talk to an immigration lawyer. I'm sure one of them can help you get your permanent residency. I chewed on my cheek for a second before adding, you have money to get it worked on, and that's a lot better than most people have it. Then an idea entered my head, and before I thought twice about suggesting it, or talked myself out of not saying anything because I wasn't feeling particularly friendly, I blurted it out. Or just find an American citizen to marry you. His gaze had drifted to the ceiling at some point, but in that moment he shifted it to scrutinize me. Those broad features were even and smooth, and not even remotely close to a scowl. Find someone you like, date them for a little bit or something, and then ask them to marry you. You can always get divorced afterward. I paused and thought about a distant cousin of Diana's. There's also people out there who would do it if you paid them enough, but that's kind of tricky because I'm pretty sure it's a felony to try to get your papers fixed by marrying someone for that reason. It's something to think about. I blinked, noticing his expression had gone from scrutinizing to contemplating. Thoughtful. Too thoughtful. This weird sensation crept over my neck. Weird, 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 telling me something was off, telling me I should probably get out of his line of view. I took a step back and eyed him. What is it? Nothing in this world could have prepared me for what came out of his mouth next. Marry me. What? It came out of my mouth as surprised and rude as I imagined it did. I was positive of it. He was on drugs. He was seriously on fucking drugs. Marry me. He repeated himself, like I hadn't heard him the first time. I leaned back against the kitchen counter, torn between being weak from shock and dumbfounded from how ridiculous his statement was, and settled for just staring blankly in the general direction of his granite-like face. You're on dope, aren't you? No. The usually taut corners of Aiden's mouth relaxed a fraction of an inch, the tension in his body diminishing just a tiny amount, but it was enough for me to notice. You can help me get my residency. What in the hell was going on with him? Maybe it was brain damage, after all. I'd seen some of the guys he went up against. How could he have gotten off scot-free after so many years? Why would I do that? I gaped. Why would I even want to do that? That strong jaw seemed to clench. I don't want to work for you, much less marry you to help you get your papers fixed. An idea rang through my brain, and I almost threw my hands up in joy at the brilliance behind it. Marry someone who can do all your assistant stuff, too. It makes Perfect sense. He'd started nodding when I brought up the assistant idea, but the emotion in his eyes was a little disturbing. He looked way too determined, too at peace with whatever crazy crap was going on in his big head. It's perfect, he agreed. You can do it. I choked. As badly as I wanted to say something, to argue with him or just tell him he'd lost his mind, Nothing managed to come out of my mouth. I was flabbergasted. Fucking flabbergasted. Aiden was on crack. Are you insane? Did you drop a barbell on your neck, bench pressing? You said it. It's a perfect plan. What had I done? It's not perfect. It's nowhere near perfect, I blabbered. I don't work for you anymore, and even if I did, I wouldn't do it. Seriously? He was thinking I would? I didn't know him to be anything but practical, and this was just outrageous. But he wasn't listening. I could tell. He had his thinking face on. Vanessa, you have to do it. Did he not understand that we weren't friends? That he'd treated me in the opposite way you would treat someone you cared about? No, I don't. And I'm not. If I met the right person, I wasn't opposed to getting married someday in the future. I didn't think about marriage often, but when I did, I kind of liked the idea of it. 
Diana's parents had been a perfect example of a great relationship. Of course, I'd want something like that in the future, if it was possible. Realistically, I knew I would be fine on my own, too. And I wasn't going to scratch kids off my list of things I'd like if I also had the right person in my life. I faintly knew what I wanted in a partner, but more than anything, I knew what I didn't want. And Aiden, even on his best days, wasn't that person, or anywhere near it. Sure, he was good-looking. Anyone with eyes could see that. His body alone had women of all ages turning in their seats to get a good look, because Aiden breathed virility. And what woman didn't like a man who looked like he drank testosterone in gallons? He was a big drink of cool water, or so I'd been told. Okay, and he had money, but that wasn't a hard requisite for a future boyfriend or husband. I could make my own money. That was it, though. Except for the first three months of my employment, I had never once thought to myself that I had feelings for the wall of Winnipeg. I was physically attracted to him, sure. But for me, and because of everything I'd seen my mom go through, jumping from one relationship to another my entire life, that wasn't enough. My last boyfriend hadn't been the best-looking guy on the planet, but he'd been funny and nice, and we liked the same things. We got along. The only reason we'd split up was because he'd been offered a job in Seattle, and I hadn't been convinced I was head over heels in love with him enough to move across the country, even further away from the few people in my life who mattered to me. I'd done it once already, going to school in Tennessee. Aiden didn't fit any of the same qualifications my ex had. He wasn't funny or nice, we didn't like the same things, and based on the last two weeks of our work relationship, we didn't get along. And why the hell was I even thinking about reasons why this was a bad idea? It was a terrible one, point blank. One I wasn't going to go through with. No way, no how. Aiden, on the other hand, wasn't paying attention. He didn't have to say a word for me to know he was ignoring everything coming out of my mouth. Aiden, listen to me. For the second time in your life, I added in my head. I'm sure Trevor can find you someone. Just ask. That comment had him snapping to attention. His thick, dark eyebrows straightened. I'm not telling Trevor. I pushed at my glasses, even though they were in place. Would you? He questioned. Yeah, that had me wincing. I wouldn't trust Trevor to put something in the mail for me. What about Rob? No response. Huh, touche. Zach? Aiden simply shook his head in denial. Your friends? I would have told them already if I wanted them to know. He explained in a careful tone that made too much sense. Of course, he'd been serious about coming back from his injury. But on top of that, his extra terrible mood at the fear of being deported if he was let go by the organization added to that. Even more so, dealing with his manager and agent, who didn't seem to be totally on board with whatever it was Aiden wanted once his contract came to the end, only made matters worse. But there was one thing that didn't really add up once I thought about it. And it wasn't the reason why he didn't want to go back to Canada or why he didn't want to stay in Dallas. Why are you telling me this? I asked hesitantly. Those brown irises settled on me, lines scorching his broad forehead. Before I could talk myself out of it, I frowned in return. You've never really told me anything before. I blinked. Ever. But now I quit, and you're suddenly over at my apartment asking me to come back to work for you when you hadn't given a single crap that I was quitting, and you want me to marry you to get your papers fixed. You're telling me things you don't want to tell anyone else about, and it's weird, man. I don't know what the hell you expect me to tell you. I'm telling you because... He opened his mouth and closed it just as quickly. Opened it once more before closing it again, the muscles in his cheeks moving, as if he didn't really know why he was doing so. Hell, I didn't get it. 
Finally, Aiden shrugged those massive, rounded shoulders and made sure our gazes met. I like you as much as I like anyone. Damn it. God damn it. Diana had told me once that I had no backbone. Actually, I'm pretty sure her exact words had been, you're a sucker, Van. I like you as much as I like anyone shouldn't have been a compliment. It really shouldn't have. I wasn't that dumb. But a rough laugh tore its way out of me unexpectedly. And then I was snickering, raising my eyes to the popcorn ceiling. Coming from someone like Aiden, I guess it was the biggest compliment I could ever get. I like you as much as I like anyone. My word. Why is that funny? Aiden asked, a frown curving his mouth. I slapped a hand over my eyes and leaned forward over the kitchen countertop, giggling a little as I rubbed at my brow bone in resignation. There's a huge difference between me not irritating the hell out of you and us being friends, Aiden. You've made that perfectly clear, don't you think? His blink was innocent, so earnest, I had no idea what to do with it. I don't mind you. I don't mind you. I started cracking up really cracking up, and I was pretty sure it sounded like I was crying when I was really laughing. <sighs> You're the most even-tempered woman I've ever met. Even-tempered? He was killing me. This was what my life had come to, taking half-assed compliments from a man who only cared about one thing, himself, a man who I'd tried to make my friend over and over again to no avail. To give him credit, he waited a bit before saying carefully, way too calmly, and almost gently, This isn't funny. I had to squat down behind the kitchen cabinets because my stomach was clenching so badly. <laughs> you're asking me, oh hell my stomach hurts, to perform a felony, and your reasoning for having me do so is because you like me as much as you like anyone, because you don't mind me, and because I'm even-tempered. I held my hands up to do air quotes over the top of the cabinets. Holy crap! I didn't think you had a sense of humor, but you do. The best defensive player in the NFO didn't hesitate with the opening I gave him. You'll do it then? I couldn't even find it in me to be annoyed by his persistence after that. I was still laughing too much over my greatest attributes as a possible fake wife. No, but this has been the highlight in my time knowing you. Really, I wish you'd been like this with me from the beginning. Working for you would have been a lot more fun, and I might have even thought about coming back for a little bit longer. It still wasn't enough, though. Working for him permanently wasn't part of the plan, especially not after everything that happened and everything he was asking of me now marry him. He was out of his damn mind. The plan after becoming entirely self-employed on my graphic design work was to pay off the terrifying amount of student loans I still had, buy my own house, buy a new car, and the rest, it could all fall into place in its own time. Travel, find someone I liked enough to be in a relationship with, maybe have a kid if I wanted one, and continue my financial independence. And to make money, I needed to work, so I forced myself to my feet and shrugged at my old boss. Look, you'll find someone if you just try a little. You're attractive, you have money, and you're a decent guy most of the time. I made sure to pin him with a look that emphasized the most of the time. If you found someone who you liked, even a little bit, I'm sure you could make it work. I'd give you one of my friend's phone numbers, but they'd drive you nuts after 10 minutes, and I'm not mad enough at you to give you any of my sisters. I bit the inside of my cheek, not knowing what else to say, fully aware that I would more than likely never understand what had led him to this time and moment with me. And what did he do? His eyes roamed my face as his forehead wrinkled, and he shook his head. I need your help. 
No, you don't. Shrugging again, I offered him a reluctant smile. A gentle one, because I was well aware he wasn't used to having someone tell him no. You'll figure everything out on your own. You don't need me. Seven. Flipping my grilled cheese sandwich over, I snickered into the phone. I'm not going. I don't think he liked me much anyway either. I didn't like Jeremy until our third date, and look at us now. Diana's argument was probably the worst one she could have chosen. The five times I'd met him over the last six months was five times too many. I knew for a fact her brother felt the same way about him. We'd hung out with him for Diana's birthday, and within minutes we'd shared a, he's a jackass, glare. Neither of us tried to hide our dislike, and in this instant, nothing actually came out of my mouth, which said more than enough, I figured. Not surprisingly, she knew what the silence was for and sighed. He's really nice to me. I highly doubted that. The times we'd gone out, he'd tried to pick a fight with someone, for no reason. He seemed high-strung, moody, and way too cocky. Plus, I didn't like the vibe he gave off, and I'd learned to listen to my gut when it came to people. I'd told her enough times how I felt, but she'd continuously brushed it off. Hey, I don't have anything nice to say, so I'm not going to say anything, I told her. The big sigh that came out of her let me know she didn't want to talk about Jeremy anymore. Well aware it was a lost cause. Nothing would get me to change my mind about him unless he saved my life or something. I still think you should go on another date. At least you can get a few drinks out of it. Why had I even told her my date last night had invited me out again? I knew better. I really did. I drank about as much wine as my liver could handle last night just to get through two hours. I'm good. She made a meh noise. There's no such thing as too much wine. We both burst out laughing at the same time. When are you free? I asked. I hadn't seen her since she dyed my hair. Oh, uh, let me get back to you. I have plans with Jeremy. Yeah, I might have rolled my eyes a little. Well, let me know when you don't. I let the Jeremy thing in one ear and out the other. I will. I wanted to try a different color on you. Are your roots showing yet? I was in the middle of mulling over how she hadn't asked if she could dye my hair again when three sharp knocks rattled my door. Hold on one second. Turning off the stovetop range, I made my way toward the door. It wasn't either of my neighbors. Neither of them knocked hard enough so that the door rattled on the rare occasion they dropped by. With that thought, I knew exactly who it was before I even made it to the peephole. Fart breath, let me call you back later. I, uh, someone's knocking on my door, I explained abruptly. I still hadn't told her or anyone about Aiden coming by to ask me to come work for him again much less tell them that a week ago he'd asked me to marry him so he could become a permanent resident. I had thought about calling Zach, but decided against it. Okay, bye. I didn't get a chance to say bye before the dial tone filled the receiver. Who is it? I asked, even though I would have bet 20 bucks I already knew. Aiden. The voice on the other side of the door answered just as I went up on my tippy toes to peer into the peephole. Sure enough, a tan complexion with chocolate-colored eyes and a familiar, tightly pressed mouth greeted me through the glass. It wasn't until I opened the door that I realized he had a hoodie on over his dark hair. I raised my eyebrows at him as he stood there, resembling his nickname as his shoulders took up the doorframe. He really did look like a damn human wall. You're back, I blinked. Again. While I grudgingly accepted that sometimes I didn't have a backbone, I was also well aware that once you gave me a reason to stop liking you, it was nearly impossible to win yourself back into my good graces. You could ask Susie. While I could get over Aiden being a grumpy little bee, the Trevor thing had gotten him into irreconcilable territory. 
Basically, he'd made it to the land of the forgotten. When it came down to it, he'd hurt me. He gave me a look I wasn't sure how to interpret before slipping inside my apartment without an invitation, his chest brushing against my arm in the process. He was radiating a massive amount of heat, and I didn't need to look at the clock to know he'd just gotten out of a training session. He also smelled like he'd skipped a shower in the locker room. I had just closed the door when Aiden stopped in the hallway, hands on his hips, giving me a hard glare that I didn't understand. You live with drug dealers. Oh. I shrugged a shoulder at him. They leave me alone. Sure, I'd had to tell them no thanks about a dozen times, but I didn't clarify that point. You know that they're drug dealers? I shrugged again, deciding right then that this judgmental ass wasn't going to find out some of the people in the buildings on either side of mine were in a notorious gang that hung blue bandanas out their pockets. So I went with changing the subject, thinking about my sandwich sitting in the pan waiting for me. Do you need something? The words were out of my mouth before I could stop myself. Damn it. Sure enough, Aiden nodded still standing there in the hallway between the door and the rest of my place. You. Me. In another world, with another person, I'd like to think that I would love to hear someone say they needed me. But this was Aiden. Aiden who thought he needed me to marry him. Aiden who had only shown up to my apartment because he needed something from me. No. Yes. Good grief. No. Yes. He insisted. My stomach growled, reminding me I hadn't eaten anything since having breakfast hours ago. Grumpiness started climbing up my shoulders, edging me on to getting an attitude with this delusional human being. Shoving my glasses up so that they rested on the top of my head, I rubbed at my eyes with a sigh, peeking at him with a blurry eye. I'm honored, really. If I was being honest with myself, not really. But I'm the last person you should be asking. His nostrils flared, and he tipped his chin up high, his jawline accentuating. This massive man who faced other big men for a living was glowering at me. At me. Do you have a boyfriend? No. Then there isn't a problem. I rubbed at my eyes with the meaty part of my palms some more and tried to rein in my frustration. Blowing out a breath, I set my glasses back on my nose and stared at the behemoth in my hallway. Obviously, we were going to have to go there. Where would you like me to start? When all he did was give me that look that made me want to stick my finger in his nose, I figured that expression was going to be the best answer I would get out of him. If he wanted to be a pain in the ass, I could be a pain in the ass too. What did I have to lose? We weren't friends, and he hadn't cared about my feelings before, so I shouldn't feel guilty for being honest with him. So I started. Okay. I rolled my shoulders for battle, eyeing the canvas piece with one of my favorite hardback covers for moral support. It was a heart made out of multicolored stilettos for a book called Healing Love. I'd been pretty proud of myself for that one. One, we don't know each other. We know each other. Delusional argued. I wanted to move on to my next claim, but apparently we weren't going to be able to until he understood each of the more than apparent reasons why me helping him fix his immigration status was a terrible idea. I know you pretty well, but you don't know a single thing about me besides my first name. Do you even know my last name? Mazur. I knew him. I freaking knew him, so I folded my arms over my chest and narrowed my eyes. You looked up my name, didn't you? He was giving me the same face that drove me nuts. It was so damn smug. There was this one popular shot of him during a press conference after a game with a similar glare aimed at a reporter who had asked him a stupid question. Panties all over the U.S. were dropped that day. Yet the only thing that pointed chin, flat mouth, and cool eyes did to me was frustrate the shit out of me. 
I don't see what the problem is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't know whether you're just pretending to be ignorant or if you really are just that hard-headed, I gritted. I worked for you for two years and you didn't know my last name. You couldn't even tell me hi. Aiden, this isn't you asking me to let you borrow 20 bucks or give you a ride to the airport. You don't know me and you don't even like me. And that's okay. I'm not worried about it. But we can't get married, I busted out the air quotes, to fix your papers when you don't like me. You can't ignore me for years, not give a shit that I'm leaving, treat me like crap, and then expect me to jump to help you when you ask. I told you, I like you as much. Oh, my word. I was dealing with a brick wall. My eye almost twitched as I fought the urge to not make a pun about his nickname. As you like anyone. Is that why you let Trevor talk about me? Because you like me? His hand went up to rub at the side of his neck, a color that was nearly pink, staining his cheeks. I do. He started to argue. The pink managed to make its way down to his throat. Damn it. I had to count to six, my spine going rigid as I did it. My vocal cords went tight. This was so pointless. Fine, fine, Aiden. I don't even know what the hell that means, but okay, you've sure shown me in the last two years. Now you don't have an assistant, and you want to become a resident, and you're here. That seems real genuine, don't you think? But okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you can tolerate me for some strange reason, and you didn't want me to get all conceited, so you didn't make it noticeable. That sounded like total bullshit to my ears. How about... What you're asking me to do is a felony. I could go to jail and you could get deported. What about that? It's only illegal if you get caught. My mouth dropped open. I was at a total loss for words. Was this a dream? Was this even real life? I have a plan. He concluded in that low, low voice that reminded me of an 18-wheeler revving its engine. Too late... I had a feeling this was a lost cause. The government takes this stuff seriously, you know. I would be the one going to jail, not you. Okay, I didn't know if I would really get jail time or not, but maybe. I've done my research. I have a plan. Here he went with his freaking plan again. I have a plan, too, and part of my plan isn't to marry someone to help them get their immigration paperwork together. I'm sorry, Aiden, I'm really sorry, but you're in about the best place you can be to find someone to marry you, if that's what you want. You shouldn't have to, though. Maybe you can pay somebody a lot of money to fast-track your paperwork. Getting married is the best way to go about it. He paused, his big hands visibly clenched at his sides, and I swore he looked even bigger in that moment. I don't want another visa. My heart reacted a little because it was weak and pathetic, and because I felt like a jerk for telling him no. I hated not helping people who needed it. But this was ridiculous. Here was a man who had never been particularly kind to me or tried to be my friend until I'd quit on him. Now it seemed like he was asking the world of me, and I didn't feel entitled to give it to him. I don't know what to tell you. I shook my head. You're out of your mind. I'm not doing it, and I don't know where you're getting the balls to ask me to. His gaze locked on mine, irrepressible and unflinching, like I hadn't just told him no again. His chin tipped up as his lips disappeared for a moment curling behind his teeth, teeth that I knew were white and perfect. You're that mad at me? Even if I would have left on good terms, I still wouldn't go back to work for you, much less help you get your visa or your residency or whatever it is you want to do. His eyes roamed my face slowly, making me extremely aware of the fact that I wasn't wearing makeup or a stinking bra. Luckily, I'd only seen Aiden look at something other than my face once, and that had been that night when he'd shown up and I had been in a short dress. 
Then again, I'd also never seen him glance at a woman's chest or ass, either. He'd told the media a dozen times in the past how he didn't have time for relationships. And he was right. He didn't. I can see it in your face, Vanessa. He stated, making me temporarily ignore the situation I was in. The word stupid ricocheted around in my head. I haven't been mad at you since I walked out of your house. You're lying. You're making that face you do when you're trying not to show you're angry. He explained, even as his gaze stretched over me, making me feel pretty self-conscious. I'm not, I practically grunted out. His impassive face said what words didn't. Liar. I lost it. I was hungry, grumpy, and irritated. That was the absolute truth. From the way a vein in my forehead pulsed, I was still holding a not-so-insignificant amount of residual anger toward him, too. Okay, fine. Yes, I'm still a little pissed at you. You let Trevor, of all people, talk about me behind my back. I blinked. Trevor. By that point, my blood didn't know whether to rush to my face or away from it. Trevor would sell his own kid for a price. Maybe we're not friends, but you have to have known I cared about you a lot more than fucking Trevor does. Just saying his name out loud made me angry, and I had to tell myself to reel it in. One, two, three, four, five. I bit the inside of my cheek and blinked at him. You've never said a single freaking sorry to me, ever. Do you understand how rude that is? You never apologize for anything, anything. After everything I did for you, everything I've ever done for you, things that went above being just your employee, and you just... <sighs> I would never, ever let anyone talk shit about you, I said, making sure his gaze met mine when I said it so he could understand, or at least see that I wasn't just being an asshole to be an asshole. On top of that, you were acting like a major prick before I quit. I accused him, feeling that familiar burn of disappointment scorch my chest. Why would I want to do anything for you? There's no loyalty between us. We aren't friends. I shrugged. You might not know anything about me, but I know almost everything there is to know about you, and that means nothing now. I'm done. I respected you. I admired you, and you just didn't care. I don't know how you can expect me to brush all that off as nothing. Honestly, I was surprised I'd lost it, and I might have been even more shocked that I wasn't panting at the end of my spiel. The vein in my head was pulsing, my hands fisted, and I felt angrier than ever in the past. Yet, when I really focused in on the hoodie-wearing man standing five feet away in the hallway of my apartment, I couldn't help but pause. The cords in his neck pulled taut. The hard slashes of his cheekbones seemed more prominent than ever. But it was the emotion in the shape of his mouth that I had never seen before. You're right. It wasn't that I didn't expect him to sort of apologize. A small part of me did. But what? I shouldn't have let him say that. No shit. He ignored my comment. I should have treated you better. Was I supposed to disagree? As if sensing how much his words were failing, Aiden's shoulders pulled back in resolution. I'm sorry. My hands opened and closed at my sides. I wasn't sure what to say, even as I tried to steady the angry beat of my heart. You were a great assistant. Aiden added. I still kept on eyeing him. Of course I had been a good one, but I was also the only assistant he'd ever had, so... With a hand to his neck, his Adam's apple bobbed. I'd swear those impressive shoulders slumped forward. You've always been loyal to me, and I didn't appreciate it until you were gone. Neither one of us said a word for a few extended moments. Maybe he was waiting for me to rail at him again, and maybe I was waiting for him to ask me to do something that I didn't want to do. Who knew? 
but it must have been long enough for Aiden to finally clear his throat. <sighs> Vanessa, I'm sorry for everything. I could believe he was slightly sorry, but a bigger part of my conscience believed he wouldn't be apologizing if he didn't want something from me. I couldn't help but feel skeptical, and I was positive that emotion was written all over my face. But Aiden wasn't an idiot or anywhere close to it, and he kept going. I've been angry over other things that have nothing to do with you. I haven't tried to be nice, that's true. But I've never gone out of my way or wanted to be mean to you, either. I snorted. The scenes at the gym and at the radio station at the front of my brain. He must have known exactly what I was thinking about because he shook his head. Frustrated or resigned, I didn't know or care. I'm sorry I took that out on you. Apologizing doesn't change anything, but I mean it. I'm sorry. Did I want to ask what other things he was angry with? Of course. Of course I did. But I knew if I asked him to elaborate, it would seem like a sign he was on the road to maybe, possibly winning me over. He wasn't. So I kept my mouth shut. There were a lot of things I would be willing to forgive. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized he'd let me down when I didn't have high hopes for him to begin with. Aiden became just another person who didn't live up to the expectations I had. What kind of crap was that? Plus, the stresses surrounding him being an asshole for a short period of time didn't explain the rest of the months and years he'd never given me the time of day. Aiden kept watching me with those coffee-colored eyes. Watching, watching, watching. I've been incredibly stressed lately. He said his words like bait. All this stuff I already knew. He licked his top lip and tilted his head down before letting out a long, low exhale. Can I use your bathroom? I pointed in the direction of my bedroom and nodded. It's in there. He disappeared through the door between my living room and kitchen a second later, and I took that moment to let out my own shaky breath. My head had started hurting just a little bit at some point, and I knew it was the result of hunger and tension. In the kitchen, I grabbed my now cold sandwich and leaned over the sink while I took a few bites out of the grilled cheese. I wasn't even halfway done eating when Aiden appeared, leaning against the doorway that led from the kitchen into my bedroom, crossing his arms over his chest. If I wasn't in such a shitty mood, I would have appreciated the breadth of his shoulders, or how his arms were perfectly proportionate to the rest of his massive size. I didn't need to look at his thighs to know those things had the width of a redwood tree. I'll pay you, he said while I was not checking him out. Ready to tell him one more time that I was fine, money-wise, Aiden kept going before I could. He laid the bomb. I'll pay off your student loans and buy you a house. I dropped my sandwich in the sink. Eight. To say that I had an Achilles heel would be an understatement. Growing up in a family with five kids and a single mom, money had always been tight. So, so tight. Scarce, really. My crayons in elementary school were those off-brand ones that didn't color so well. I'd worn mostly hand-me-downs exclusively until I was old enough to pay for new things myself, and that hadn't been until I was with my foster parents. But if there was one thing that having so little for so long had taught me, it was the value of money and appreciation of belongings. No one respected money more than I did. So, it had been to my utmost horror when I applied to college and received zero scholarships. None. Nada. Not even $500. I was smart, but I wasn't an extraordinary student. I was shy in school. I didn't raise my hand much in class or join every extracurricular activity available. I didn't play sports because there wasn't disposable income lying around to buy uniforms 
and there hadn't been any for us kids to join league teams either. My favorite thing had always been hanging out by myself, drawing and painting if I had paints. I didn't excel at anything that could have gotten me a scholarship. My high school hadn't had a fine arts program worth anything. The closest class I'd been able to take was woodshop, and I'd excelled at it. But where did that lead me? There was a very clear memory of my high school guidance counselor telling me how average I was. Really, she'd said that to me. Maybe you should have tried harder. I'd been too shocked to have to count to ten after that. All A's and a couple of B's hadn't been good enough. Yet I'd still been horrified and disappointed when I got accepted to every decent school I applied to, but received no financial help other than a federal grant I qualified for because of my financial need, but that only covered 10% of my total yearly tuition. And of course, the school I wanted to go to was out of state and incredibly expensive. I loved it more than I loved any other one I'd gone to check out with my friends the fall of my senior year. So, I did the unthinkable. I took out loans. Massive student loans. Then I did the next most unthinkable thing in the world. I didn't tell anyone. Not my foster parents, not my little brother, or even Diana. No one knew except me. There was no other person in the world who carried the burden of nearly $200,000 on their conscience but me. In the four years since graduating with my bachelor's, I'd been paying off as much as I could from my loans while also attempting to put money aside in savings to eventually be able to dedicate myself full-time to my dream. A debt as large as the one I had was a bottomless pit that you had to accept like it was hepatitis. It wasn't going anywhere. But it only served to make me work harder, which was why I didn't mind going to work for Aiden and then doing my design work well into the middle of the night afterward. But there was only so much you could take, and I'd saved and paid off a significant enough of a chunk to get to the point where I felt like I could breathe for the first time in years. As long as I didn't let myself look too closely at the loan statements I got in the mail every month. But, what do you think? The big man asked, leveling his stare right at me as if he hadn't just busted out the greatest secret in my life. What I thought was he was out of his damn mind. What I thought was my heart shouldn't have been beating so quickly. What I also thought was no one else should have known about how much money I owed. Mostly, though, a small part of me was thinking there was a price for everything. Vanessa. I blinked at him before looking down at my poor, contaminated sandwich sitting in the sink. Then I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and opened them once more. How do you know about my loans? I've always known. What? How? I felt... I felt a little violated, honestly. Trevor did a background check on you. That sounded vaguely familiar, now that he mentioned it, even though it was disturbing to hear they knew something I'd tried so hard to keep to myself. There's no way you've managed to pay them off. Aiden stated. He was right. Vomit, vomit, vomit. Whatever you owe, I'll pay it. Just like that. I'll pay it. Like $150,000 was no big deal. I liked to watch that show on television where bosses went undercover at their businesses, and then at the end, they surprised their employees with some crazy amount of money to go on vacation, or to pay off whatever it was they owed money on. More often than not, I got teary-eyed watching it. The employees would usually always cry and say how they never expected something like that to happen to them, or they would talk about how much of a blessing the money was going to be for their families, or how much the gift they were being bestowed was going to change their lives. Yet, here I was. My hands shook. The ability to breathe was stolen from my lungs. My loans were my Achilles' heel. 
I was only slightly ashamed of myself for not immediately thinking his offer was preposterous. Why wasn't I kicking him out or telling him to go eat shit? Why wasn't I laughing at his idea or telling him to get the hell out because he couldn't buy me? He hadn't treated me well. He didn't deserve for me to do him a favor and put my life on the line for him. Clenching my hands at my sides, I let the sensation of being overwhelmed wash over me. He was offering to pay off this thing that weighed on my soul like a cement block in a pool. Who did that? Better yet, who said no to an offer like that? I like to think I made wise decisions, that I did what was the best for me, or would be the best for me in the long run. But $150,000? Holy shit. I'm willing to compromise. Aiden offered, his eyes even, his voice steady, which didn't help any. I sputtered. Shut up, Van, I told myself. Shut up, shut up, shut up, and just say yes, you idiot. Don't talk him out of this. Don't be that dumb. You can get over anything for that much money. This is the opportunity of a lifetime, even if he hurt your feelings even though it's stupid and illegal and doesn't make any sense because there are a million other women in the world who would do it for less. But I couldn't shut up. I just couldn't. It was that nagging little part of my personality that I'd had to hone over the years. The one that didn't know how to keep quiet sometimes. I lifted my eyes and looked at the bearded man standing in my apartment, offering me a lifeline, an opportunity, a felony. I made myself remember. He was asking me to do something that was essentially illegal. This man who had never given two single shits about me until now that he needed something and he had no one else to ask. Aiden, the most muscular man I'd ever known, took a step forward and dropped his hands to his sides, pinning me in place with his gaze alone. It has to be you. I've thought about it. No one understands my schedule the way you do. You don't get on my nerves, and you're... He shook his head and crucified me on the spot. I'll do whatever it takes. Tell me what you want, and you'll have it. Anything. The headache that had been hanging around my temples from hunger suddenly intensified. Tell him no, this smart part of my brain said. I could pay off my loans eventually. I still had time. But the other part of my brain, the logical one, told me it would be dumb to waste this opportunity. All I had to do was marry the guy, right? Sign a piece of paper? Save a fortune worth of interest? Oh, hell. I couldn't seriously be changing my tune from one minute to the next. I'd just been telling him how we weren't friends and how much he'd hurt my feelings and how dumb he was being for even bringing it up. And now I was thinking about his offer, all in a matter of a few minutes. Then again, over a hundred thousand dollars was riding on this offer. This wasn't nothing. His gaze was totally fixed on me standing there, in my tiny kitchen in baggy Dr. Pepper pajama pants and a spaghetti strap tank with no bra. This incredibly handsome and intimidating man wanted... There was something wrong with me. There was something seriously wrong with me. Tell him to screw off. Tell him to screw off. I didn't. Let me think about it, I said, my voice breaking, unsure. He didn't cry victory at me not immediately telling him to go to hell, which was surprising. Instead, Aiden said very calmly, That's fine. He hesitated for a second, rocking from one foot to the other. I am sorry I messed up. A knot formed in my throat at the expression on his features. I'm used to being on my own, Vanessa. Nothing that I did or said had anything to do with you. I want you to understand that. Without another word, the man known as the Wall of Winnipeg let himself out. The only sound signaling his departure was the door slamming shut behind him. I was going to think about it.
going to think about marrying a guy for money when I'd walked out on him a month ago for not defending me to his manager, for not upholding the tiny bit of a bond I thought we shared. What the hell was I doing? Being smart, that logical part of my brain whispered. I didn't get any sleep the next two nights, and that wasn't exactly surprising. How the hell was I supposed to sleep when all I thought about was if I was really considering committing fraud, marriage fraud, it was called, to make a lot of money? Was this what thieves went through? I felt guilty, and I hadn't even done anything. I felt slightly cheap, too, for not saying hell no right off the bat, but I didn't feel that cheap. Getting my loans paid off and the possibility of having a house bought for me enticed me a lot more than my morals would have ever expected. Then again, morals didn't exactly mean much when you were shelling out what was a mortgage worth on loans each month. I lived in an apartment that would horrify my foster parents if they knew what it was like. My car was 12 years old. I kept my expenses to the absolute minimum, just to spend my money the way I needed to. And then I started thinking to myself, if I did this, I would have to get divorced one day. I would have to tell my future husband, if there was one, that I'd been married once and I would never, ever be able to tell him the truth as to why I'd done it. It wasn't like I could lie and pretend it had never happened, even if it would be fake and in word only. Was that cool? Was that fair? Maybe it was, because my mom never married while I was young, but I'd always envisioned it as being this ultra-serious, special thing that not everyone got to do. A union of two people who decided they were going to tackle the world together. So you should be picky with whom you chose as your partner. Till death do you part, and all that stuff. Otherwise, you would just be wasting your life, right? When I wasn't contemplating all that stuff, I asked myself what in the world I would tell the people in my life. They would know I was up to my neck in shit if I suddenly said I was marrying Aiden. I would have to bring up the loans if I told them the complete truth. And I would rather stick my hand in a boiling pot of water than do that. It was all too much. Way too much. And so, I finally picked up the phone and called the only person who I wouldn't be able to fool with my lies. I couldn't live with it any longer. I was tired, grumpier than ever, and I wasn't focusing because I was too distracted. I needed to make a decision. Diana, would you marry someone for money? I asked her out of the blue one afternoon when I called her during her lunch break. Without missing a beat, she made a contemplative noise. It depends. How much money? It was right then that I knew I'd called the wrong person. I should have dialed Oscar, my slightly younger brother, instead. He was the level-headed one in my life, the basketball player studying mechanical engineering. He'd always been wise beyond his years. Diana? Not so much. I only told her the partial truth. What if someone bought you a house? She hummed and then hmmed a little more. A nice house? It wouldn't be a mansion, you greedy bitch, but I'm not talking about a dump or anything either. I figured, at least. All I had to do was marry someone and they would buy me a nice house? Later on, I could laugh over the entire situation leading up to this conversation and how easily Di was considering it. Yes. Would I have to do anything else? What else would there be? The marriage would just be to get his residency. It wouldn't be a forever thing. I don't think so. Oh, her tone perked up. Sure, why not? Sure, why not? Good grief. I snorted. Wait a second, why are you asking? Who's doing it? She finally chimed in, extremely interested. When I was done explaining to her just about everything, minus what had been my tipping point to quit, I waited for her sage, usually not so sage, advice. What I got was, do it. That's it? I scoffed. 
I was asking her for her opinion on a life-changing decision, and that was how she was going to respond? Sure, why not? He has money, you know the worst things about him, and he's willing to pay you. What do you have to think about? She said in a matter-of-fact tone. She was definitely the wrong person to call for advice. It's illegal. In that case, make sure you don't get caught. Okay, Aiden Jr., I thought before she continued on. People do it all the time. Remember Philippa? That was her cousin. How could I forget? That Salvadoran guy she married paid her $5,000. You might get a house, Fanny. You could be a little more grateful. Definitely the wrong person. We're not each other's biggest fans. That had her exasperated. You like almost everyone. He can't exactly hate you if he's asking you and not someone else. I'm sure he'd have bitches lining the block if he even remotely put in some effort. Her comment had me groaning. You really think I should do it then? There's no reason why you shouldn't. You don't have a boyfriend. You have nothing to lose. She was making this too easy, making me feel dumb for not immediately jumping at the chance. But something had been lingering in my gut, and it wasn't until she said the thing about bitches lining the block that I realized what it was. My pride. I cracked my knuckles. I don't know how I'd feel about being married and having my husband. I almost choked on the word. Being with other people during. Even if it was fake, someone would find out that we'd gotten married and I don't want to look like the poor idiot wife whose husband cheats on her and everyone knows. Diana hummed again. Did he date around while you worked for him? He didn't. Ever. He didn't even have any females saved in his contacts on his phone. I would know. I was the one who had gone to the store to get him a new phone and have his contacts transferred, and I might have looked through them. There had definitely never, ever been any sleepovers at his house, or any women hanging around. There couldn't be any after away games, because according to Zach, Aiden always went straight back to his hotel room afterward. So, yeah, I felt a little dumb. No. So then there's nothing to worry about, is there? I swallowed my saliva. I can't date anyone either. That had her cracking up, and I suddenly found myself insulted at how hard she was laughing. <laughs> You're funny. It's not funny. So I hadn't had a boyfriend in a couple of years. What the hell was the big deal? Her hysterical laughing reached a peak. I can't date anyone either, she mocked me in a voice that I knew was supposed to be mine. Now you're just making shit up. It was a well-known fact that I didn't date much. Diana sounded like she was covering her mouth with her hands to smother her laughs. Oh, <laughs> V, do it and stop thinking about it so much. She wasn't being any help, and I found myself still torn in half. I'm going to keep thinking about it. What's there to think about? Everything. But I thought about it. Then I kept thinking about it some more. I looked online at how much I still owed on my loan, and I almost threw up. Looking at the balance was like looking at an eclipse. I wasn't supposed to do it. The six digits before the period that glared back at me from the screen made me feel like I was going blind. This thing with Aiden was a lottery, and I happened to be the only one with a ticket to it. It also happened to be the winning ticket. This small nugget of uneasiness jiggled around in my chest, but I ignored it as much as I could until I couldn't handle it anymore. I would be helping someone whose sincerity I couldn't judge completely. I would be signing away years of my life. I'd be doing something illegal. And I would be doing this all as technically a business transaction. It wasn't that complicated, because I understood what Aiden was doing and why he was doing it, for the most part. I just didn't completely understand why he insisted on trying to reel me back into his life. Regardless of everything else, though, a part of me was resentful that Aiden, I get everything I want, Graves, had his mind set on me to be the one to help him out. 
I guess I didn't feel like he deserved my help or my loyalty when he'd never exactly done anything to deserve it. But my student loan debt wasn't just a paycheck. It wasn't payable in five years, like a car loan. Plus, if a house would also be a form of payment, we were talking a lot of money, a lot of heartache, and a lot of interest. 30 years on a mortgage. It would be a massive relief. Wouldn't it? Could I just forgive Aiden and do this? I knew people made mistakes, and I understood that you didn't always know what you had until you didn't have it. I had learned that myself the hard way, about small things I'd taken for granted. But I also knew how resentful I could be, how I held on to grudges sometimes. I found myself driving to Aiden's house, heart in my throat, risking my life and freedom for a freaking student loan that I couldn't just forget about or disregard. The security guard at the gate grinned at me when I pulled into the community Aiden lived in. I haven't seen you in forever, Miss Vanessa. He greeted me. I quit, I explained after greeting him. He shouldn't be surprised I'm here. He gave me a look that said he was a little more than impressed. He's not. He's been reminding me every week to let you in if you came by. He was either a little too confident or... Well, there was no or. He was a little too confident. I suddenly had the urge to turn my car around to teach him a lesson, but I wasn't egotistical or dumb enough to do it. With a goodbye wave at the guard, I drove past the gate and toward the home I'd been to too many times to count. I knew he'd be home, so I didn't worry about the absence of cars in the driveway as I parked on the street, like I had every time in the past, and marched up to the front door, feeling incredibly awkward as I rang the doorbell. I wanted to turn around, walk away, and tell myself I didn't need his money. I really wanted to, but I didn't go anywhere. It took a couple of minutes for the sound of the lock getting tumbled to let me know he was there, but in no time the door was swung open, and Aiden stood there in his usual attire, his towering body blocking the light from inside the house. His expression was open and serious as he let me in and led me over to where everything had begun, the big kitchen. It didn't matter that his couch was incredibly comfortable. He always seemed to prefer to sit in the kitchen, at the island, or in one of the chairs of the nook to eat, read, or do a puzzle. He took a seat on his favorite stool, and I took the one farthest away from him. It was weirder than it should have been, considering what was at stake. I was a person, and he wasn't any more or any less special than I was, and regardless of what happened, I had to remember that point. So I sucked in a breath through my nose and just went for it. Honesty was the best policy and all that, wasn't it? Look, I'm scared, I admitted in one breath taking in his familiar features, the slants of his cheekbones, the thick, short beard that covered the lower half of his face, and that ragged white scar along his hairline. For two years, I'd seen his face at least five times a week, and not once had we ever had a moment remotely close to this. I couldn't forget that, because it mattered to me. It would be one thing to have a stranger ask me to marry him because he wanted to become a U.S. resident, but it was a totally different thing to have someone who I knew, who had never cared for me, ask. Honestly, it was worse. Aiden's long lashes lowered for a moment, and the man who was as greedy with his attention and affections as I was with the red and pink starbursts lifted a rounded hunk of a shoulder. What are you worried about? He commanded the words. I don't want to go to jail. I really didn't want to go to jail. I'd looked up marriage fraud on the internet, and it was a felony. A felony with up to a five-year prison sentence and a fine that made my student loans seem like chump change. Apparently, the male version of my best friend said, You have to get caught to go to jail. I'm a terrible liar, 
I admitted, because he had no idea how bad of one I was. You knew you were planning on quitting for months before you did. I think you might be okay with it. He threw out suddenly in a slightly accusing tone. That might have made me wince if I felt guilty about what I'd done, but I didn't. It also didn't occur to me right then that he somehow knew I'd been planning on quitting for a long time. It just sort of went in one ear and right out the other. I didn't lie to you. I only stayed because you had just gotten better and I felt bad leaving you so soon afterward. I couldn't talk myself into doing it and I was only trying to be a nice person. There's a difference. His thick eyebrows went up a millimeter, but no other muscle in his face reacted to my comment. You told Zach? He pointed out like an accusation. An accusation I wasn't going to grab onto. Yeah, I told Zach because he's my friend. I damn sure wasn't going to apologize for it. Please tell me when I was supposed to casually tell you and expect a high five. Or were you going to give me a hug and congratulate me? I might have nailed him with a look that said, Are you fucking with me? When I did finally tell you, you didn't care, Aiden. That's what half of this comes down to. I'm still, I'm so mad at you. And I accept that I shouldn't be. I just can't help it. You're not my friend. You've never tried to be my friend. You haven't once given a shit about me until you needed something. And now, for some strange reason, you're making it seem like you can't live without me. And we both know that's bullshit. He stayed quiet for a moment, taking a sharp sniff his eyes seemingly trying to pierce a hole straight through my head. I've apologized to you. I meant it. You know I meant it. He insisted, and I could grudgingly admit to myself that the logical part of my brain recognized that statement as a truth. Aiden didn't apologize, and for all the things he was, he wasn't a liar. That just wasn't in his genes. For him to actually say the A word... It wasn't insignificant. I don't have time for friends, and if I did, I wouldn't go out of my way to make them anyway. I've always been this way, and I really don't have time for a relationship. You understand that. I'm not worried about getting caught. So he was changing the subject. Because you won't be the one going to jail, I reminded him under my breath, frustrated at his tactics. He raised one of his eyebrows another millimeter, but it was his flaring nostrils that gave away his irritation. I've done a lot of research, and I consulted an immigration lawyer. We can pull it off. All you would have to do at first is file a petition for me. Aiden didn't say, I think we can pull it off. He said we could do it, and I didn't miss that nuance. You know, Aiden, you make saying yes so damn difficult. I would have done just about anything for you if you'd asked me when I worked for you, but now, especially when you act, you still act like one single sorry makes up for disrespecting me in front of other people and letting someone talk about me. It pisses me off. How can you ask me to do this huge favor for you when I feel zero obligation to? We wouldn't even be having this conversation if I didn't want my loans paid off. I bit the inside of my cheek. I want to tell you to leave me alone, that I'll pay off my debt on my own like I had always planned on doing. I don't need your money. Meeting his eyes, I had to fight the urge to tear up. I wished you had respected me enough to appreciate me back when it would have meant something. I liked you. I admired you, and in the course of a few days, you killed all that. The words came out of my mouth before I could stop them. We stared at each other, and stared at each other, then stared at each other a little more. When I was a kid, I learned the hard way how expensive the truth was. Sometimes it cost you people in your life. Sometimes it cost you things in your life. And in this life, most people were too cheap to pay the price for something as valuable as honesty. In this case, I could tell the price tag had hit Aiden unexpectedly. Slowly, after a few breaths, he ducked his head and rubbed at the back of his neck with that great big hand. His breathing got harder, 
raspier, and he sighed an Alaska-sized breath. <sighs> Forgive me. His tone was rougher than ever, seemingly dragged through sand and then covered in shards of glass. Yet somehow, it sounded like the most real, heartfelt thing to ever come out of his mouth, at least in front of me. But it still didn't feel like enough. I can forgive you. I'm sure you regretted it later on when I wasn't around, but I shoved my glasses to the top of my head and rubbed my forehead with the back of my hand before lowering them again. Look, this isn't a good start to a fake relationship, don't you think? No. He moved his head slightly, just enough so that I could see those dark coffee irises with that bright amber ring surrounding the pupil peering up at me beneath the fanned cover of his long eyelashes. I always learn from my mistakes. We made a good team once, we'll make a good team again. Lifting his head completely, a dimple in his cheek popped out of nowhere, and he raised his hands to cup the sides of his head. I'm no good at this kind of stuff. I would rather give you money than have to beg, but I will if that's what you want. He admitted, sounding about as vulnerable as ever. You're the only person I would want to do this with me. Why wasn't this so black and white? I'm not asking you to beg me. Come on. All I've ever wanted from you was... I don't even know. Maybe I want to think that you care about me at least a little bit after so long, and that's pointless. You want this to be a business deal, and I understand. It just makes me feel cheap, because I know if Zach was asking me, I would have probably said yes from the beginning, because he's my friend. You couldn't even find it in your heart to tell me good morning. He sighed, his index finger and thumb pulling at his ear. Dropping his gaze to the kitchen countertop, he offered, I can be your friend. Two years too late. Only because you want something. To give him credit, he didn't try to argue with me otherwise. I can be your friend. I can try. He said in a low, earnest voice. Friends take a lot of time and effort, but... Aiden looked up at me again with a sigh. I can do it, if that's what you want. I get so angry thinking about everything. I don't know if that's even what I really want anymore. It's probably not what I ever wanted. I don't know. I just wanted you to see me as a person, instead of just that person you don't ever have to say thank you to. So for you to tell me you can try to be my friend, it's so forced. I'm sorry. I know. I'm a loner. I've always been a loner. I can't remember the last time I had a friend who didn't play football, and even then, it usually never lasted. You know how much it means to me. You know how seriously I take it. Maybe better than most of my teammates do. He explained, like it was taking everything in him to make that admission. I just kind of side-eyed him. He continued. I know you know. I can also accept responsibility for not being very nice to you either, all right? I said I'm not good at this friendship thing. I never have been, and it's easier not to bother trying. If that wasn't the most slacker comment to ever come out of his mouth, I didn't know what was. But I didn't say it out loud. If you got on my nerves, I would have fired you the first time you flipped me off. I found myself not exactly feeling honored. You're a good employee. I told you that. I needed an assistant, Vanessa. I didn't want a friend. But you're a good person. You work hard. You're committed. That's more than I can say about anyone else I've met in a long time. That big Adam's apple bobbed as he stared right at me. I need a friend. I need you. Was he trying to bribe me with his amazing once-in-a-lifetime friendship? Or was I just being a cynical asshole? As I stared at his facial features, trying to decide, I realized I was being dumb. This was Aiden. Maybe he'd done something shitty by not defending me, 
but if I really thought about it, he probably wouldn't have defended Zack either. He'd said time and time again in interviews that he solely wanted to focus on his career while he had it. From every interview that had ever been made with one of his coaches, they all said the same thing. He was the most single-minded, hard-working player they had ever come across. He started playing football his junior year of high school. Junior year. Most NFO caliber players had been on the field since they were old enough to walk. Yet Aiden had a calling, Leslie, his high school coach, had said. He became a phenomenon in no time at all and attended a university on a football scholarship. Not just any run-of-the-mill school either, but a top one. One that he'd won a few championships with and even graduated with a degree from. Damn it. God damn it. He wouldn't be asking me to do this if he didn't think he had to. And I was well aware that people didn't change unless they wanted to. And this was a man who did whatever he put his mind to. This pitiful, resigned sigh pulled its way out of my lungs. An answer to what he was asking of me sat at the front of my brain, at the tip of my tongue, curled in the pit of my belly. Was there any other possible response that wouldn't lead me to being the biggest idiot on the planet? Let's say we can. How long, how long would we have to stay mar- I couldn't say it on the first try. S stay married for, I rushed out in a small voice. He made sure to look me right in the eye when he answered. Five years would make it seem less suspicious. I would only be given a conditional green card at first. After two years, I could get a permanent one. Five years? Aiden was 30 now. He'd be 35. I was 26 for the remainder of the year. I'd be 31 when we'd technically get divorced. 31 wasn't old, not even close to it. The number didn't seem as atrocious as it should have. If I was really considering agreeing. But still, five years. A lot could happen in that period of time. What I knew most, though, was that there was no way in hell I could manage to pay off my loans in ten years, much less five, even if I sold my car, rode the bus everywhere, disconnected my cell phone, and ate ramen noodles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Five years, I repeated, blowing out a breath. Okay. Makes sense. I eyed him, reminding myself that I wasn't saying yes to him yet. We were just talking. Yes, it makes sense. If I were saying yes, which I'm not doing right now, so calm your horses. I'd give myself a pat on the back later for being so ballsy and firm. He stared at me evenly, unfazed. What else are you worried about? I huffed. Everything? Aiden blinked at me. About what? I'll pay off what you owe and buy you a house. Think, Van, think. It couldn't go this easily. I had some honor, and I hadn't completely forgiven him for being a jackass, despite his possibly manipulative and forced apologies earlier. My pride had a price, too. And it was that idea that had me swallowing hard and meeting the gaze that for so long had forced me to look elsewhere. What if your career ends tomorrow? I asked despite how much of a gold digger it made me sound. This was a business deal, and I was going to treat it like one. One of his eyebrows went a little funny. You know how much money is in my bank account. He had a point. If I didn't work the rest of my life, I would be fine. You know I don't handle my money irresponsibly either. He stated in an almost insulted tone. By that... He meant he could still go through with what he was offering me and be okay in the end. I'm not going to be your assistant again, either. I made sure to keep my eyes on him, even though I really, really didn't want to. I've worked really hard to do my design work full time, and I'm not going to give it up. That wide, square jaw hardened, and I could tell his teeth were grinding, which gave me an oddly victorious sensation in my chest. Vanessa... I'm being serious. 
I'm not doing it. We tried it, and it didn't end well, and I won't put myself through that again. You know I don't even really want to do this, but you're offering me something that's hard to say no to, I explained. I'm not trying to take advantage of you, but I didn't ask for this. You asked me. You've gone out of your way to get me to agree. I told you there are a million women in the world who would do this for you and not want anything in return. Except to maybe sleep with him, but I kept that to myself. You don't need me. You have the world at your fingertips, big guy. I don't know if you know that or not. After saying that, I realized I might be the dumbest person in the entire universe. The dumbest. I half expected him to tell me to screw off then, but this was a deal breaker, and I needed him to understand that. If he told me I was out of my damn mind, then 20 years from now, I could more than likely live with myself for turning down his offer. I'd planned to quit working for him to further my dream. I wasn't going to tie myself down for another five years with the same amount of work I'd been juggling. I just wasn't. There was a lot I'd be willing to sacrifice, but not that. Folding my hands on my lap, I squeezed one set of fingers tight, focusing and keeping my breathing even. He was frustrated, aggravated, but he wasn't saying yes or no. I had nothing left to lose, and I needed him to understand that yes, maybe I was being a little bit of a bitch, but it wasn't for no reason. He did what he did for his dream, and I was going to do what I needed to do for mine. If anyone could understand that, it should have been him. I reached up and played with one of the legs of my glasses, forcing myself not to look away. I licked my lips nervously and raised my eyebrows. I'd done it, said what I needed to say, and I could live the rest of my life with the consequences, damn it. What seemed like a month later, the wall of Winnipeg sighed. I set my elbow on the counter and mirrored his position in resignation. Are you fine with me not being your assistant or not? Aiden nodded gravely. I wasn't sure whether to be disappointed or relieved, so I went with neither. Business mode. I needed to get into business mode. I'm not going to go to jail for you, so we need to figure everything out. What are we going to tell Zach? Speaking of Zach, where was he, I wondered. Even if I told him to find his own place, he would know something was going on. We have to tell him. We would need people to confirm we're in a real relationship together. Was that the truth? I nodded, thinking of Diana and how I had told her everything already. Yeah, I have to tell my friend. She would know something was going on. I can get away with not telling anyone else. I'd thought about it, and I was fairly certain I could embellish Aiden trying to win me over to come back as some sort of love story. At least, that's what I hoped. Not being super close to anyone, including my little brother, who had his own busy life, obviously helped in this situation. Aiden nodded, practical and understanding. But I raised both of my shoulders. What about everyone else? Everyone else, literally, everyone in the world. Just thinking about it made me want to puke. Any idea or hope of possibly being able to hide a possible marriage had gotten flushed down the toilet when I remembered an article on Aiden years ago, when he'd been spotted eating dinner with a woman, a woman who turned out to be a rep for a company that was trying to endorse him. Who cared, I'd originally thought. Then it had hit me. Some people did. And too many people cared about all things involving Aiden Graves. He couldn't cut his hair without someone posting about it. Someone in the world would find out we'd gotten married at some point. There would be no hiding it. And that made me feel uneasy. I hadn't even liked the attention I'd gotten from people when they found out I worked for him. Getting hitched to him would be an entirely different ballpark. I had to swallow the saliva in my mouth to keep from gagging. We could keep it quiet for a while the big guy started to say. I gave him a look that he just returned with a blink. 
But someone will find out eventually. We can get married without making a big deal over it, and divorce the same way. What happens on the field is for my fans. Everything else isn't their business. The way he stated that didn't give me room to doubt him. I would be living the rest of my life as Aiden Graves' ex-wife. The thought almost made me cross my eyes at how absurd it was. Then, immediately afterward, I wanted to put my head between my knees and pant. Instead of doing any of those things, I made myself process his words and then nod. His idea made sense. Obviously, someone in the world would eventually find out, but Aiden was intensely private with the people he knew, and so much more with folks he didn't. It wouldn't look strange if we kept it a secret as long as possible. The thought had just entered my head when I asked myself, what the hell had I gotten myself into? We wouldn't be able to sign an agreement that says you get a house and your loan paid off, but I hope you trust me enough to know I wouldn't back out on you. Those dark eyes seemed to laser a message on my forehead. I would trust you enough not to sign a prenup. No prenup? Uh... I won't begin a relationship while the marriage is intact. He continued out of the blue. You can't either. That had me raising my gaze. My relationship status wasn't going to be changing anytime soon. It hadn't in years, and I didn't foresee it doing so anytime soon. But my conversation with Diana seemed to haunt me. Even as a fake wife with a paper marriage, I wouldn't want to look like an idiot. Are you sure you can promise that? Because you might meet- No, I won't. I've only loved three people in my entire life. I don't plan on loving anyone else in the next five. He cut me off. I have other things to worry about. That's why I'm asking you to do this and not finding somebody else. What he wasn't saying in that moment was that he was in the prime of his career, but I'd heard him say those exact words countless times in the past. I wanted to cry horse shit, but I kept it to myself. I also wanted to ask who the only three people he'd ever loved were, but I figured this wasn't the time. Leslie had to be one of them, I imagined. If you say so. From the way his throat bobbed, he wanted to make a comment, but instead he kept going. I'll help you pay off your loan over the next three years. And negotiations suddenly came to a screeching halt. For a moment. Then I made myself think about it. Taking a few years to pay off the loan would look an awful lot less sneaky than if it was done in one or two big payments. If I made a few payments here and there, that would look a lot better too, wouldn't it? Like if we waited a few months until after we signed the papers and everything? I had to think so. Okay, I nodded. That works for me. My lease on this house is ending in March. We can rent another house afterward or sign another lease here. When my residency comes through, I'll buy one that you can keep afterward. Afterward was the second thing I paid attention to. The main thing I didn't miss was the beginning of his statement and the we in the following sentence. I'd have to move in with you? I asked slow, slow, slowly. That big, handsome face went a bit squinty. I'm not moving in with you. I couldn't even find it in me to be offended. I was too busy processing whether he'd made a joke or not. You're the one worried about making it believable. Someone is going to check our licenses. He had a point. Of course he had a point, but... But, breathe. Loans and a house. Loans and house. Okay, all right, that makes sense. My stuff, what was I going to do with it? My apartment with all my things that I'd collected over the years. I was going to have a panic attack at some point. I'd known I wasn't always going to live there. At least I'd better not. But that didn't change anything. This house wasn't mine, and it didn't feel like mine. It felt like Aiden's place, like the house I'd worked in for years. But I could move in if I needed to, 
especially if it was the difference between making this hoax of a marriage seem legitimate and not. I had to. Had to. When do you want to do this? I pretty much croaked. He didn't ask me. He just said, Soon. I was going to have a panic attack. Okay. All right. Soon could be a month from now. Two months from now. Fine. Aiden raised his eyebrows in what seemed like a challenge. I nodded dumbly, finding myself becoming more and more in tune with the idea that we were really doing this. I was going to marry him to get his papers fixed. For money. For a lot of money. For financial security. Aiden stared at me for a while, the bobbing of his throat the only sign that he was thinking. You'll do this then? I would be an idiot if I didn't, wouldn't I? That was a dumb question in itself. Of course I would be an idiot. A massive, gigantic idiot who owed a lot of money. Yes, I gulped. I will. For the first time in two years, the wall of Winnipeg's face took on an expression that was as close to joyous as I had ever seen. He looked relieved, more than relieved. I'd swear on my life, his eyes lit up. For that one split second, he resembled a completely different person. Then, the man who wore a jockstrap on a regular basis did the unthinkable. He reached forward and put a hand on top of mine, touching me for the first time. His fingers were long and warm, strong, his palm broad and the skin rough, thick. He squeezed. You won't regret this. Nine. I didn't call Aiden, and he didn't call me. I couldn't blame the lack of communication on him not having my cell phone number. I'd given it to him before I left his house the day I'd agreed to do what we were doing. A week passed, and when he hadn't bothered getting into contact with me, I didn't think much of it. The 300s were in the middle of preseason games, according to the news. I knew how busy this time of the year was for him. Plus, there was the small chance that maybe he had changed his mind. Maybe. Well, I didn't know why else he wouldn't call, but I made myself not think about it more than I needed to, which I figured wasn't much, and I sure as hell wasn't going to stress about it. The reality that there was a chance he had found some other way of getting his residency petition filed wasn't as crippling as I would have imagined, considering there was over a hundred thousand dollars riding on our deal. I wouldn't even say I was disappointed, but... Okay, maybe by the fifth day into the week, I might have accepted that I was a little, tiny bit disappointed. Having my loans paid off would have been... Well, the more I thought about having that amount of money resting on my shoulders, the more I realized just how repressing it was. It would be one thing if I owed that much money on a house, but in freaking school loans? If 26-year-old Vanessa could talk to 18-year-old Vanessa, I wasn't sure I would have still gone to such an expensive school. I probably would have gone to community college for my basics, then transferred to a state college. My little brother had never made me feel guilty for leaving. He'd been the one to tell me to go. Every once in a while, though, I regretted the decision I'd made. But I was a stubborn jackass idiot who wanted what she wanted come hell or high water, and I'd done what I wanted to do at an incredibly high expense. By the seventh day into our no-communication spree, I was more than halfway through coming to terms with the fact that I would be in debt the next 20 years of my life, and that I'd already assumed that would be the case the instant I'd gotten that first statement in the mail after graduation. So why cry over it? I had told him the truth. I didn't need him or his money. But I would have taken it because I was an idiot. But I wasn't that much of an idiot. 
I was in the middle of uploading a Facebook cover file to Dropbox for a client when my phone rang. Peeking over at it, sitting on the coffee table behind my work desk, I couldn't help but be a little surprised at the name appearing on the screen. Miranda P. They should probably change the contact information since he technically wasn't my version of Miranda anymore. Hello? Are you home? The deep voice asked. Yes. I'd barely finished pronouncing the S when a now familiar heavy-handed knock banged on my door. I didn't have to check my phone to know he'd hung up. A moment later, the peephole confirmed who I thought it would be. And yep, it was Aiden. He barreled inside the instant the deadbolt was turned and slammed the door shut behind him, locking it without a second glance. Those dark eyes pierced me with a look that made me frown and freeze at the same time. What is it? What the hell were you thinking moving here? He pretty much growled in a disgusted tone that immediately put me on the defensive. Sure, I knew my complex was slightly scary, but he didn't need to make it seem like I lived in a slum. It's cheap. You're kidding. He muttered. Where the hell did this smart mouth come from? Some of my neighbors are nice, I claimed. The expression on his face was dubious as he said, Someone was getting jumped right next to the gate when I pulled in. Oh, I waved him inside to change the subject. He didn't need to know that happened on a weekly basis. I'd called the cops a couple of times, but once I realized they never actually showed up, I stopped bothering. Do you need something? Walking ahead of me toward the living room, he answered over his shoulder. I've been waiting for you to let me know when you're moving in. That had been one of the first things I'd stopped wondering back when I began considering that he might have changed his mind. So hearing it again was like having ice thrown on me. Almost. I didn't bother telling him I thought we weren't going through with it anymore. Were you... Did you... I coughed. Was I supposed to do it soon? Turning around to face me, he tipped his chin down before crossing his giant biceps over his chest. The season is about to start. We need to do it before then. I didn't remember hearing about that being part of the plan. I mean, I figured sooner than later, but... He was paying off my student loans if I did this. I should have moved in the day after we came to a decision if that was what he wanted. When do you think I should? I asked. Of course, he had a date in mind. Friday or Saturday? I almost hacked out a lung. This Friday or Saturday? That was only five days away. That big head tipped to the side. We are on a time crunch. Oh, I swallowed. My lease is up in two months. Sometimes I forgot Aiden didn't believe in obstacles. Pay it off. I'll give you the cash. This was happening. This was really happening. I was moving in. With him. I eyed him. The wide muscles of his shoulders, the dark hair dusting his jaw, those freaking eyes that seemed to glare at everything and everyone. I was going to be living with this guy. My loans, my loans, my loans, my loans. Which day is better for you, Friday or Saturday? I made myself ask. Friday. Friday it was. I peered at my belongings for the first time and felt a pang of sadness. Just as I was thinking about my things, Aiden seemed to be doing the same thing glancing around the small living room. I thought he might have lifted a foot to tow my couch. Do you need help packing or something? He asked in an unsure voice, like this was his first time asking someone if they needed help. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, right after I'd gotten home from his house, I'd decided what I would keep and what I would donate or give away. In conclusion... I assumed it would have to be most of my stuff. I figured I'd be taking the guest room, since it was the only room not being used on a full-time basis. 
The other three rooms besides the master were Zach's, the home office, and the huge in-home gym. The only things I want to keep are my bookcase, my television, and my desk. I didn't miss the judgmental eye he slid toward the small $60 black desk behind me. The rest I'm going to give to my neighbors. There's no point in keeping any of it in storage for... I almost gagged on the words. Five years. He nodded, even as he took in my television. Everything can fit in a couple of trips. I nodded, sadness nipping my throat at the idea of leaving my apartment behind. Sure, it wasn't luxurious or anything, but I'd made it my own. On the other hand, an apartment I hadn't been planning on staying at forever anyway wasn't going to be the difference between living in debt and not. I could cry at Aiden's later if I needed to. And that thought almost made me crack up out loud. What had my life come to? And why the hell was I complaining so much? I'd be moving into a nicer place, getting my loans off my back, and getting a house. All in return for marrying a man. So I couldn't date anyone if I wanted to. whoop de doo The last date I'd gone on two weeks ago hadn't exactly left me excited for a repeat. It was a fair exchange. More than a fair exchange if I didn't calculate the risk of what would happen if someone found out that our marriage was a fraud. Then again, you didn't get anywhere in life unless you took a risk. Okay, I muttered out of the blue, more to myself than Aiden. Then we just stared at each other, letting that same awkward silence that had been between us as boss and employee come out. I cleared my throat. Then he cleared his throat. <sighs> I talked to Zach. You did? Yes. And? Aiden shrugged his shoulders carelessly. He said he understood. In that case, I needed to call him. I didn't want to be a total coward and just move in without talking to him about it. Aiden dipped his chin once before turning his body to face the door. I need to go. I'll see you Friday, he said as he moved toward it. And then he was gone. He didn't tell me to call him if I needed help with anything, and he didn't say bye. He simply left. This was what I'd signed up for. This was the next five years of my life. It could be worse, couldn't it? It was 7.30 in the morning, and I was at my dining room table for the last time ever when that now familiar three-rap knock made my door rattle. I'd just gotten out of bed 20 minutes ago, and I was sitting around waiting for the waffle iron to heat up. Hell, I still had my pajamas on hadn't washed my face or even brushed my teeth yet. My hair was up in something that looked like a baby pineapple. Aiden, I called out as I dragged my feet toward the door. Sure enough, his dark facial hair greeted me through the peephole before I let him in with a yawn and a small frown. The man who was apparently going to be my new roommate, amongst other things, strolled in, not muttering a good morning or anything. Instead, he waited until I locked the door before giving me a lazy look. You aren't dressed yet? I had to stifle another yawn, covering my mouth with my hand. It's 7.30. What are you doing here? Helping you move, he said, like I was asking a dumb question. Oh, he was? He'd said something about it only taking a few trips to move my things, but... I'd assumed it would take me a few trips. Huh. Okay, I was just about to make waffles. Do you want some? Aiden eyed me for a moment before turning around and continuing on to the kitchen. His head turned from left to right in what I assumed was him either making sure that I had actually gotten some packing done or taking inventory of what I had left to go. I'd bubble-wrapped all my artwork two days ago, my clothes were all in boxes the people at the grocery store were nice enough to let me have. My books and knickknacks were packed. 
My television and desktop computer were the only items that hadn't been prepped, but I had almost every blanket and comforter I owned in the living room waiting to get put to good use. Which recipe? He had the nerve to inquire. The cinnamon one. Before he could ask, I added, I'm not using eggs. He nodded and took a seat at the table, still not exactly subtle in his perusal. All my dishes, utensils, and pots were already out and stacked on the countertops, waiting for their new owners to come and take them. I'd been lugging them around since college, and I figured they'd gone above and beyond the call of duty. I made more batter and then poured it into the hot waffle iron, keeping an eye on Aiden as he kept taking in my belongings. What are you doing with the rest of your furniture? My neighbor upstairs is taking the mattress, dining room table, and the dishes. She was a single mom with five kids. I'd seen her mattress during the few occasions I'd babysat, and my things were definitely an improvement. The dining room table was also a nice addition to the empty space she had where one would have normally sat, even though there weren't enough chairs for her and all the kids. My next-door neighbor is taking the couch, the bed frame, dresser, and coffee table for his daughter. They're coming to get it today? Yep, but my neighbor upstairs is a single mom, and I want to help her. Did you pay the rest of your lease off already? I glanced at him from the other side of the kitchen. Not yet. I was going to go to the business office before I leave. How much do you owe? I might have muttered the amount. There was a pregnant pause before Aiden asked, For a month? I coughed. No, that's two months. Was he breathing louder than normal? Did I really pay you that little? Again, with a comment about my place. No, I fought the urge to scowl. I had other things to spend my money on. I didn't need to explain myself to him. Did he roll his eyes? I brought enough cash. Was I supposed to say, no, don't worry about it, I have it? Or was it okay for me to accept it? Ideally, he was already doing more than enough for me for the next five years when I really didn't have to do much more than sign some paperwork and make sure I didn't fall in love with someone. Okay, that was guilt sweeping along the lining of my stomach, and I knew what it meant. Don't worry about it. I can pay for it. I didn't want to take advantage of his kindness, or whatever it could be called. Aiden just shrugged. A few minutes later, the waffles were ready, and we ate in silence at the table, both of us eating efficiently and quickly. I washed off our dishes and dried them, leaving them on the stack with the others. Let's get the things your neighbors are taking out of here first, then pack up the cars. Aiden suggested his fingers dipping into the front of his shirt to pluck at the medallion hanging around his neck. He moved it so that it lay against the back of his neck, the chain it was on tight around the front of his throat. I'd always wondered where he'd got it from, especially since, as far as I knew, he wasn't a religious person, but it was another one of those things he'd never bothered sharing. Sounds like a plan, I said, eyeing the hint of gold one more time. Oh well. Once on the floor above mine, the single mother opened the door on the second knock, accepting the box of glasses I'd carried up the stairs. You're leaving now? She asked me in Spanish. Yes. Do you want to send some of the kids down with me to help carry some things? Mrs. Suerta nodded and called her three oldest children to help. The eleven, nine, and eight-year-old hugged my hips and then ran down the stairs ahead of me, already fully aware of what they were keeping. The three of them barged in and headed straight toward the kitchen, slowing down when they spotted the big man transferring boxes from my bedroom into the hallway. One by one, they each grabbed cups, pots, pans, or utensils and headed back out. I grabbed two chairs from the dining room table and made my way toward the stairs, shooting Aiden a tight smile when our eyes met on the way out. I had just deposited them in my neighbor's living room when a shadow appeared at the doorway, carrying the other two chairs under his arms effortlessly. Dios santo, es tu novio? The slightly older woman asked from her spot on the couch. Boyfriend? 
I felt my eyes bulge, but nodded, maybe a bit robotically. See, what else was I going to call him? I was probably lucky enough that she didn't have time to watch football and had no idea who he was. She glanced in Aiden's direction once more, balancing her three-year-old on her lap, and gradually nodded, impressed. He's handsome, she said in Spanish. And those muscles. Mrs. Huerta added a grin to the end of her comment that had me giving her a timid smile. Ya sé, I said in a mutter before darting back out of the apartment and heading downstairs. I knew. Well, it was the truth. I did know he had some guns. And a chest. And that ass. I could have done worse. Maybe he had little desire for social skills, and maybe he didn't really care about anyone but himself. But he could be worse. He could be a psychopath who did bad things to animals, I guess. I found Aiden in my apartment, with the table flipped on its back, unscrewing the top of it from the legs with a pocket multi-tool I wasn't sure where he'd gotten. He glanced up when he sensed me standing there. What else are they taking? The mattress. He hummed and nodded. Forty minutes later, I had sweat pouring down my face, but Aiden and I had managed to carry the mattress up the stairs. Weight-wise, he could have carried it up by himself without a huff or a puff, but apparently it was too big to carry alone, and my puny muscles had struggled. We set the older mattress where my neighbor's blow-up bed had been the last time I'd come over. I'd offered the bed frame to her, but understood why she hadn't wanted it. Two mattresses would barely fit in the tiny one bedroom that was built for maybe two occupants, but not six. Luckily, by the time we were done, my next door neighbor's sons were waiting outside my door to help move the rest of the furniture into his place. Aiden and I sat across from each other in the bedroom, taking the bed apart so it could be easier to move. I caught him looking at the multiple nightlights I hadn't gotten a chance to pack away. He didn't ask about them, and I was pretty grateful. I noticed both of the neighbor's sons eyeing Aiden more than a little bit when they peeked into my bedroom, and then I heard one whispering to the other, but none of them said a word to us before carrying out the first of the things in the living room. I had just taken a pee break when I opened the door and overheard talking coming from the hallway. Sure. That was Aiden. I grabbed two of the boxes left in my bedroom and made my way out to leave them in the living room. Standing in the hallway was Aiden, one forearm against the wall while his left hand was up, scribbling away on something with one of the sharpies I'd left around the apartment so I could write on boxes. Next to him were my neighbor's sons, their eyes glued on Aiden. Yeah. It didn't take my not-so-genius brain to figure out they knew who he was and what Aiden was busy doing. I appreciate it. One of them thanked him when he handed over the piece of paper he'd signed. The big guy nodded, his attention turning toward me. No problem. We should really finish packing up. We need to get going. The guys kind of hesitated. We could help. Aiden shook his head dismissively. We got it. Thanks, though, I threw out when the rude ass didn't. They nodded, and one of them said, Man, Vanessa, I had no idea you were together. Dad's gonna lose it. He's a huge fan. I already knew that, and it only made me feel guilty. My neighbor had a 300s mat outside his door. During the holidays, he hung up a wreath with team ornaments on it. Yeah... I just kind of trailed off. I mean, what else was I supposed to say? Luckily, they quickly thanked Aiden again and took off, closing the door behind him. All right, I took a breath. Let's get the rest of this done. Between the two of us, we carried my television over to Aiden's Range Rover as my arms trembled with exhaustion. My desktop computer followed. The fact that he could have carried it on his own didn't escape me at all, but I wasn't going to complain, so I kept my mouth shut. In the back of my Explorer, we put my bookcase, desk, and chair. 
the rest of the boxes were split up into both of our vehicles. Aiden was in his SUV when I closed my apartment door one last time, nostalgia hitting me dead center in the chest. I always thought about moving on with my life and taking the next step toward whatever upcoming goal I had. Like when I left Aiden, a part of me missed him, or some weird variation when you're so used to doing things a certain way for a long time and suddenly you don't. But I'd known I was going to move on. I was doing something better for myself. And doing this for him, no matter what my conscience said, was a smart step. A weird one, but a smart one. It was a giant leap for my future, and I was going to hold on to that reminder with both hands. I dropped off a check for the last two months of my lease, signed a few papers with the office manager, and I was out of there. It took an hour just to get to Aiden's house from my apartment, thanks to a 10-car pileup on the highway. Between being a little overwhelmed with moving, especially since I wasn't feeling exactly stoked to have to move in with another person, that person being my ex-boss, of all people, and trying my best to convince myself that I wasn't going to go to jail if or when officials found out the truth, I was trying not to become paranoid. I smiled at the security guard when we got to the gated community and ignored the curious expression on his face when he saw my car loaded up. Aiden backed into the garage, and I parked in the driveway for the first time ever. When I got out and spotted him toting boxes inside, I grabbed the most I could carry on my own from my explorer. I followed after him, nervous, anxious, and a little bit scared. Everything looked familiar, but it felt foreign at the same time. I made myself march on up those stairs I'd climbed a thousand other times and kept on going when all I wanted to do was turn around and head back to my apartment. I was moving in with Aiden and Zach, signing some papers that would unite us in paper matrimony, and this would be my reality for the next five years. When I thought about it in bits and pieces... Yeah, it didn't help. It still seemed like a huge white elephant I couldn't ignore. The door to the empty guest room was open as I approached it, and I could hear Aiden inside setting things down. I'd been in there many, many other times in the past to dust or wash the sheets. I was pretty familiar with the layout. But it wasn't the same as it had been the last time I'd seen it. Aiden didn't have a bunch of crap all over the house. Every room except the gym was pretty sparse and utilitarian. He didn't have artwork or knickknacks. He hadn't even bothered painting any of the rooms. There wasn't a single trophy or jersey hanging around anywhere. The boxes of that kind of stuff were hidden in his closet, something I couldn't completely understand. If I had the kind of trophies he did, they would be up so everyone could see them. In his bedroom, he had a bed and two dressers. He didn't even have a mirror in there, much less a single picture of anything or anyone. The guest bedroom had been even more barren, with only a bed and a nightstand in a relatively large-sized room. It was twice the size of the room at my apartment. But when I walked into the room that would now be mine, I didn't just find a bed. There was a large matching dresser with a big vanity mirror mounted to it, and a new smallish bookshelf that also seemed to match the rest of the dark brown contemporary furniture. It didn't hit me until much later that it was all the exact same furniture I'd had in my bedroom at my apartment. Just nicer and matching. Your bookshelf from home would look better in the office, Aiden casually suggested when I just stopped and stood at the doorway too busy taking in the new furniture. I tried to keep my surprise to a minimum, but I wasn't sure if I succeeded or not, so all I managed to scrape together as a response was a nod. He was right, though. My bookshelf would match better in there. Your desk can go there. He vaguely pointed at the empty section of the wall right between the two bedroom windows. I bought the mattress right before you started working for me. It's only been slept in, what do you think, three times? But if you want a new one, order one. 
you know which card to use. I snapped my mouth closed and batted away the surprise that had stolen my words, blinking over at Aiden at the same time I hesitated. He'd done all this? For me? When I'd left working for him, he hadn't even known where to order his soap. He didn't even run his own dishwasher. Now there was new furniture? Who was this man? I shook my head, my forehead scrunching. No, this is all great. Thank you. I didn't even have to put any effort into remembering how comfortable it had been when I'd had to climb on top of it to strip the sheets or dust the headboard. Not too soft, not too firm. It's perfect. I almost said, don't worry about it. But then again, I was sure he wasn't worried. He was just trying to be accommodating. And considering I didn't expect much, it was more than I would have planned on. This is better than what I'm used to. I took another breath and slowly lowered the things I was holding to the floor. Thanks for helping me move, by the way. I'm really doing this. I'm moving in. Holy shit. I appreciate it. I wobbled out. I was really doing this. I'm really doing this. He tipped his head down just slightly, then brushed past me on the way out, back downstairs from the sound of the creaking staircase. There was no way I was going to slack off and make him do the majority of the hauling, even if he was in way better shape than me and had four times the muscles. Okay, I wasn't going to be a lazy shit. Downstairs, I kept up with the rest of the moving. It took a little more than half an hour for both of us to get the boxes from the vehicles into the bedroom. Then we carried my television up while my arms convulsed from how tired they were, and my fingers turned slippery with sweat. The freaking thing seemed to have gained 20 pounds on the trip from my complex to his house. It was really heavy, and I had a feeling I was going to pull my lower back. I did manage to smash my fingers into the door jam, hissing, motherfucker, under my breath. We were heading to grab the next piece of furniture when Aiden said over his shoulder, You should think about doing some upper body training. I made a face behind him. I might have even stuck my tongue out as I held my poor, mangled fingers with my good hand. Luckily, moving the bookcase into Aiden's office was a lot easier, and we didn't have any problems. My new roommate carried the desk upstairs all on his own, and I hauled the chair. Apparently, either we both needed a break, or Aiden recognized the signs of exhaustion that I was sure were all over my face, so we took a break to have lunch. Then the awkwardness began all over again. Was I supposed to make lunch, or was he? Or were we each going to make ourselves food? I hadn't gone grocery shopping yet, obviously, but Aiden had never been stingy with his groceries or complained when I had some, but... I have two pizzas in the freezer. Pizzas? Were we in the right house? This was Mr. Whole Food Plant-Based Diet. The most processed he got was quinoa pasta, tofu, and tempeh every so often. He muttered something under his breath that sounded like... With soy cheese and spinach. I bit my cheek and nodded, watching and wondering what the hell had happened to him over the last month and a half. Okay. With that, I turned on the oven like I had a thousand other times in the past. Unlike every other time, the wall of Winnipeg went to the freezer and pulled out food on his own, getting the pizza stones out from a cabinet in a way that surprised me a little. At least when I was around, he never messed around with any of the kitchen items besides plates and utensils. I went into the garage to throw the cardboard in with the rest of the recyclables and paused. Container after container of frozen, microwavable vegan meals filled the bin. The tiniest bit of guilt nipped at my stomach as I went back into the kitchen just as Aiden set the pizzas into the oven. I took the same seat I'd taken almost two weeks ago when I'd come by to talk to him about his offer. That strange silence seemed to grow as he took his favorite seat. Where's Zach? I asked, 
watching the huge muscles in his forearms ripple as he rotated his wrist in a stretch. A tendon in his thick neck seemed to pop, and I knew it was in annoyance. He didn't come home last night. Before I could say anything, he added in a voice I recognized as a disapproving one. He said he'd be here. But he wasn't. Zach going out wasn't unheard of. He actually went out pretty often. Not coming back home wasn't exactly a rare occurrence either. I'd talked to him a couple days ago, briefly, just to make sure he was going to be fine lying to authorities if he was questioned, and that he was okay with me moving in. He'd seemed to be more than okay with both. It's fine, I said, knowing full well from the way that tendon was straining, it genuinely bothered Aiden. So, what's the next step with your green card thing? Aiden had his attention on his arm. We should go ahead and get the paperwork over with first. Paperwork. He was going with paperwork to describe what we were doing. Was I nauseous or did I suddenly get heartburn? Soon. How soon? My voice sounded more cryptic than what was really necessary, considering I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. Those thick eyebrows kind of quirked, his jaw slightly twitched. Before the season, I don't want to wait until bye week. He said, referring to the week off the team got during the season. He still wasn't answering my question. Okay. I have an early preseason game next week. Let's do it then. I choked and he ignored me, barreling straight through into his explanation. We can't file the petition until the paperwork is done. You should change the address on your license as soon as you can, but you need to have mail coming here. What could I say? Let's wait? What he was saying made sense. He really didn't have more than a day off after each preseason game, and from what I remembered, most of them were always in the evening. That probably would be the best chance we had of getting it done. But it still made the part of my personality that liked to plan things in advance and mentally prepare cringe. Next week, we were doing it in a week. It was that easy. We needed to live in a house together, sign some papers, maybe take some pictures. Was that even necessary? And then, live the next five years of our lives. I almost expected him to give me spirit fingers and say, ta-da! That simple. It was that simple, apparently. I took in the man who was sitting across from me. The biggest man I had ever seen. The most restrained who was, for all intents and purposes, technically my fiancé, and let nausea and nerves roll around in my belly like puppies. My lawyer said it'll be several months between you filing a petition for me and having my status adjusted until I get a conditional green card. We're going to need a lot of paperwork. They're going to ask for your bank statements. You'll have to go with me once everything is approved to have someone at the immigration office interview us. Will that work? He asked, eyeing me warily, like he wasn't positive how I was going to take his plan. I swallowed my heart. I'd already read all of that stuff online, in the days between when he'd showed up at my place and when I came to his and agreed, so I was mentally prepared. Mostly. Yeah. But the smile on my face was pretty damn faint. What in the hell had I just agreed to? 10. The weekend came way too quickly and way too slowly at the same time. I'd woken up each night sweating profusely. I was going to commit a felony. I was getting married. And of all the people in the world, it was Aiden I was doing this with and for. It didn't matter how many times I reminded myself that what we were doing wasn't real. My body couldn't be fooled. All these changes, the moving, the living in a different room, the sleeping in a different bed, they were all battling my brain for attention at all hours of the day, giving me a case of insomnia. 
The only thing that eventually managed to lull me to sleep was the knowledge that I knew exactly what I was doing, what I was getting out of the hoax of a lifetime. Debt freedom and a house. I reminded myself of that repeatedly. And we were going to Vegas to get it over with. It will make more sense if we do it there. We've gone twice together already. He'd explained to me after I'd agreed with him that speeding into it was fine. If we did it here, we'd have to go to the courthouse to apply for a marriage license and get a justice of the peace to perform a ceremony. He was right. We'd gone to Vegas twice. Once for a signing, and the other time for a commercial he shot. Plus, I completely understood where he was going with doing it in Dallas. Someone would recognize him the instant he got out of the car at the courthouse. I could already picture a crowd if we tried to get our mare... The word gave me indigestion. License. There'd be a crowd if we went to get our license. Actually, I think it was the word hour that gave my insides gas. Everyone goes to Las Vegas to elope. The big guy had added, as if I didn't know. Obviously, I did. There's no waiting to apply for a marriage license. He had ended with as he'd polished off a sandwich. Another truth. How can you argue practicality? There wasn't a point in having any of my few loved ones there, and honestly, I really wouldn't have wanted them to be in attendance. This wasn't some everlasting marriage built on love. I'm pretty sure I had told Diana more than once that I was going to have a beach destination wedding if the time ever came. If the time came, that had been my plan. Maybe someday in the distant future, it'd be a possibility. For now, for this, Las Vegas would work. With his credit card in hand, the morning after I moved in, I reserved two first-class plane tickets, because explaining to Aiden that flying economy was cheaper was a pointless argument I'd tried once and failed at miserably. I also scored a two-bedroom suite at the hotel we'd stayed at in the past. We'd fly in Sunday evening and leave Monday afternoon. In and out, we would sign some papers, maybe take a picture, and then head back. On the day before we were supposed to leave, I was at the grocery store when I spotted the customer in front of me wearing a wedding band, and it hit me. Was Aiden going to need a ring? Was I going to need one? He'd never said anything about engagement rings or wedding rings, and I wasn't sure if that was something we'd need to pull off the believability factor. Would they check that out at the interview? Would they care? I remembered Diana's cousin Philippa had worn a wedding ring way before things got serious between her and her husband. But I'd also met couples before who didn't bother with rings. So... I looked online to see if there was anything about whether agents checked that kind of thing or not, and I knew the proposal wasn't a good example of how immigration issues actually worked. What was I supposed to do? Chances were he wouldn't wear it. But... Get one anyway, my brain said. I could worry about one for myself when the time came, but it would be months until then. I'd learned to trust my instincts. So that evening, when he was running drills after hours by himself at the 300s training facility, I fought the nagging feeling in my belly and snagged his college national football championship ring from the drawer where he kept it. Holding onto it for dear life, I headed to a small jeweler I'd visited in the past to get my favorite pair of earrings fixed when I'd messed them up. The jeweler had a lot of rings to choose from, but not much in sizes large enough to fit Aiden's fingers. Luckily, he said he could get something resized for me in record time, and I chose a basic 14-carat white gold band. It was nothing remotely fancy, or even 18-carat, but no one likes a picky bitch, and I was paying for it out of my own pocket, so he'd better not complain. I was buying my soon-to-be fake husband a wedding ring that he may or may not wear. After all, we had to make it believable. So even if he didn't wear it, at least he'd have it, I figured. 
it only made me not want to get it more. Are you ready? Aiden called up the stairs. I was never going to be ready. Ever. I'd been up since four in the morning, waking up to find my heart pounding and a hundred million thoughts going through my head one after the other. We were leaving. We were going to Vegas to sign paperwork that would legally make me able to change my name to Graves if I wanted to. That was another thing we hadn't talked about, but I didn't see a point in bringing it up. Plenty of women didn't change their names when they got married nowadays, right? If he didn't ask me to, I sure as hell wasn't going to bring it up. That just seemed like a nightmare waiting to happen at the Social Security office. Vanessa? He hollered. We need to go. With a nervous sigh that bordered on a growl, I got off the edge of the bed, where I'd been sitting for the last 15 minutes while I waited for the nausea and the nerves to go somewhere else, and grabbed my duffel bag. We were only staying one night, but I didn't know what to pack or what to wear to do it. So I brought a casual dress I'd worn 10 times before, dressy jeans and a blouse, and two t-shirts to be on the safe side, along with one of my favorite pairs of heels. Underwear, socks, a toothbrush, travel toothpaste, a hairbrush, and deodorant rounded out my bag. I was wearing my tennis shoes on the way. For one day, it was definitely more than I really needed, but I hated not being prepared, so I'd live with what I'd packed. Packed to go get married. It was just as big a deal as I was trying not to make it out to be. Vanessa! Aiden bellowed. Not impatiently, more just so I could hear him. Come on. I'm coming. Hold your horses. I yelled back from the top of the stairs before hightailing it over to Zach's room real quick. Knocking on the door, I pressed my ear against it. Zach attack. We're leaving. The door opened a few seconds later. His dark blonde head peeked out, a big smile already plastered on his face. He had been teasing me nearly nonstop since he'd gotten home right after I moved in, apologizing for not making it home in time and not needing to hint that he'd stayed over at a woman's house. The first chance I had with him alone, I'd asked him again if he was really fine with what was going on. His response? Why wouldn't I be, darling? You're the one marrying him, not me, and I like having you around. And that was that. With them being away from the house so much, it wasn't like we'd been inconveniencing each other or anything. Give me a hug then, bride-to-be, Zack said, already holding his arms wide. Ugh, I scowled even as I leaned into his embrace. Vanessa! Your future hubby is waiting, Zack said before I reached up and pinched his lips together. We'll be back tomorrow. Vanessa! I sighed and took a step back. Wish me luck. Zack waved his hand in a dismissive gesture, an ornery smile taking over his tan face. I sure will, Mrs. Graves. He was so full of shit, but I knew if I didn't get downstairs, Aiden would probably come up here and drag me down. He hated being late. So I let Zack's comment go and ran down the stairs. At the bottom, Aiden's expression was his typical exasperated one. He was dressed in jeans and a black v-neck that stretched across the wide width of his muscular chest. His favorite hoodie dangled from his fingertips. He gave me a look as I jogged down the steps, nerves making my knees weak. Aiden didn't wait for me to make it down before he was on his way to the garage. I hauled ass through the kitchen, closed the garage door behind me, and carried my bag to his SUV. You got everything? He asked with a curt look once we were both buckled in as he turned his head to back out of the driveway. I ran my fingers over the small lump in the front pocket of my jeans and felt the flutter of nerves remind me they hadn't gone anywhere. I took in his face quickly, the stern line of his mouth, the hard jut of his chin, and the constant tension creasing his eyebrows. Reality flowed over me. I was marrying this guy. Oh, brother. 
Yep, I squeaked. The trip to the airport went well, with the sports talk show on the radio keeping us company. Luckily, they were only discussing professional baseball. Aiden parked his car in one of the covered lots. From there, we took a shuttle to the terminal. I eyed him a few times on the way over, my hands getting sweatier by the second. Just as the minibus rolled up to the drop-off, Aiden slipped his hoodie on despite the 90-something degree weather in Dallas and pulled the zipper all the way up to his throat. When the bus stopped, he was the first to get up, reaching for his backpack with one hand and my duffel in the other. If he wanted to carry my bag, I wasn't about to insist. I let him lead us toward the check-in. In no time, we had our boarding passes, and Aiden signed autographs for the four airline employees working behind the counter before the trek toward security. It was impossible not to notice the people around us stealing glances and gawking at him. It wasn't like he didn't stand out in a hoodie, even if it was only to women checking him out. While he wasn't the tallest man in the world, the sheer size of him was eye-catching. Even in a double extra-large hoodie, the size of his shoulders and the outlines of his biceps were unmistakable. Together, we walked up to the first TSA agent, who looked at both our licenses, went a bit pink-faced for a moment, and then waved us forward. Gentleman that he was, Aiden let me get in line first making sure his attention was elsewhere when we got to the part of security where our carry-on luggage was checked. I put the white gold band on one of the trays with my cell phone and snuck it back into my pocket the instant I finished passing through the detector. I want a cup of coffee, I said when Aiden caught up to me. Do you want something? He shook his head, but walked along with me to the closest Dunkin' Donuts, his frame a big, imposing shadow that I couldn't help but constantly be aware of. In all the times we'd traveled together, I didn't think we'd ever been so close to one another. Usually, I was trailing behind him, or he'd go off to sit somewhere by himself. This time, though, he wasn't standing 50 feet away, much less 10, with his headphones in, oblivious to everyone and everything around him. And that might have made me feel a little bit better, he wasn't exactly ignoring me or acting the way he usually did, a.k.a. pretending I didn't exist. I had to give him some credit for that, didn't I? Once we were in line, I glanced over to find his attention straight ahead, focused on the menu. A crease formed between his eyebrows. The customer in front of us moved aside, and I took a step forward as the employee peeked up from the cash register briefly glancing at Aiden before looking back down. How can I help you? Can I? Double-taking, the employee's gaze went up to Aiden again. His nostrils flared. I knew he was going to gasp before he did it. The employee's eyes went wide first, his mouth slammed shut second. Then he sucked in a breath. Fuck. The cashier whispered his gaze locked on the behemoth next to me. The behemoth who was, at that point, looking around and not paying any attention to the individual freaking out in front of him. So I elbowed him. Aiden's attention snapped down to me so quickly it was a little alarming. He was frowning. I tipped my head to the side discreetly in the direction of the donut shop employee. Not anywhere near being an idiot, those brown eyes went where I indicated. The employee was still gazing at him with huge eyes. Are you... You're... You're Aiden... Aiden Graves? The guy who had to be a couple years younger than me blubbered. Aiden nodded tightly. Oh, brother. Mr. Social Skills was at it again. You're, uh, <laughs> I'm... The guy was panting. I'm such a fan. Holy shit. He sucked in another breath, and I swear his face paled. You're even bigger in person. He really, really was. Aiden shrugged, carelessly, like he usually did when someone mentioned his size. 
I thought people made him uncomfortable when they brought it up, but mostly because I'd heard him tell Leslie before that it wasn't like he'd done something for it. His genes had given him his stature and the framework of his build. All he'd done was work out and eat well to develop what he'd been given. His lack of a reply wasn't arrogance. I was pretty positive he just didn't know what to say. The poor guy continued gaping at him, completely unaware I existed, much less that behind us were at least four other people wondering what the hell was taking so long for us to order. Aiden didn't help the situation either by standing there, looking back at his fan with that unreadable, borderline bored expression on his face. Could you get my girl a coffee? His girl? It took every ounce of my self-control not to look up at him with an expression that said exactly what I was thinking. What the hell did you just call me? Thankfully, I didn't physically react. When the cashier finally snapped out of his trance, he glanced at me and blinked. I smiled at him even as I pulled my phone out of my pocket, ignoring the strange feeling coursing through my spine at the fake term of endearment that had just come out of Aiden's mouth. Oh, sure, sure, my bad. W what can I get you? The guy asked, blushing. I placed my order, quickly looking down to make sure I was texting the right person, and typed out a quick message. Your girl? I sent the man next to me before handing over my card. The guy cast another glance at Aiden while he swiped it hastily, nervously. I thanked him when he gave it back, but he was back to not paying any attention to me. He was still staring at Aiden, and on closer inspection, I realized the poor guy's hands were shaking. Thanks, I mumbled one more time as I took my cup and moved aside. Aiden shifted over along with me, seeming to be in his own little world, oblivious to the text message I'd sent him, or maybe just deciding to ignore the phone I knew he usually kept on vibrate in his pocket. It was right then that I noticed the people in line behind us were all staring at him. I couldn't blame them. He didn't exactly give off a welcoming vibe, standing there with his backpack on both shoulders, his arms crossed over his chest, with my bag resting at his feet while he waited for me. Then I realized they were glancing at me, too. Measuring me. Seeing who was with the guy the employee was freaking out about. Just me. The nerves and the urge to throw up didn't go anywhere. I was nauseous the entire flight to Vegas. Aiden said maybe five words to me before he put his head against the window and fell asleep which wasn't a bad thing considering I was stuck in my own world of denial and terror. I kept telling myself everything was fine, but it didn't feel like it. If Aiden was battling any nerves or insecurity, he didn't let it show as we walked out of the airport and caught a cab to our hotel off the strip. We checked in and made our way up the elevator to the suite. He swiped the card through the door and let me in first. I had to let out a whistle as I took in the clean, contemporary furnishings. I'd forgotten how nice this hotel was, and it made me feel a little guilty. When I was a kid, we hadn't traveled much, mostly because my mom never had the money, much less the time or inclination to take us anywhere. But on the rare occasion that Diana's parents invited me to go along with them on a trip, we would stay at the really cheap motels on the side of the road that looked like something out of a horror movie, and we'd all cram into a room, or two, if her parents could swing it. And I always had a good time, even more so if the motel had a pool. Yet here I was at this five-star hotel, staying with a man who was a millionaire. I'd paid the rate for the room with his card. I was well aware of how much everything cost. I knew that no one in my family, with the exception of my little brother, would ever stay in a place like this. And it made me feel slightly uncomfortable. Guilty. A little sad. You all right? That gruff, low voice asked from behind me when I'd stopped just through the door. 
I had to clear my throat and force myself to give him a nod and a smile, which was about as insincere as you could get. Sure. Yeah, he read it on my face easily, his eyes swinging around the room in confusion. You chose the hotel. His tone was slightly accusing. You don't like it? No, I shook my head, now feeling like a dick on top of everything else. I mean, uh, of course I like it. This is the nicest place I've ever stayed. That was saying a lot, because when I traveled with Aiden, we always stayed somewhere nice. I was just thinking about how fancy it is, and how I never would have imagined when I was a kid that I could stay somewhere like this. That's all. The fact I was staying here with Aiden, to marry him, just sent that nail straight home into my heart. Younger Vanessa, pre-26-year-old Vanessa, had no idea what she had in store for her. There was a pause, and I swore we both looked over our shoulders to glance at each other. The tension between us was awkward and uncertain. The wall of Winnipeg blinked those big brown eyes. You could have invited your family, if you really wanted to. Oh, uh, no, it's all right. In hindsight, I realized I'd shot down his offer too fast. I only keep in contact with my little brother, and he's already back in school. Why was he looking at me so strange? I don't... Good grief, why was this flustering me so much? And why couldn't I just shut up? I only talk to my mom every once in a while and never my sisters, and my best friend works a lot. I wrung my hands and finished up this spiel of stupidity. I don't have anyone else. Aiden stared at me for so long, I frowned. You're acting weird. He stated so casually, I almost ignored the actual words that had come out of his mouth. Excuse me? You're being weird with me. Aiden repeated himself. That had me slamming my mouth closed and my frown growing. The man who didn't keep things to himself kept on barreling through what he apparently felt he needed to say. I told you I was sorry. Uh, look, everything is fine, I started to say before he cut me off with a shake of his head. It isn't. You don't smile anymore. You haven't called me big guy or given me hell. He stated. Wait a second. I hadn't, had I? And he'd noticed? The possibility that he'd noticed made me feel strange, almost uncomfortable. I thought I annoyed you, I mumbled, trying to figure out what was the right response and whether he was saying these things because he genuinely missed them or not. You do. And there we went. But I'm used to it now. Wait another second. You've never made me feel awkward before, but you look at me differently now, like you don't know me or you don't like me. The fact he leveled an even gaze at me, without shame, without embarrassment, without playing games, hit me right in the solar plexus. I get it if you're still pissed, if you don't think of me the way you used to, but I liked the way we were before. He went on, with his face open and completely earnest. He only slightly made me feel bad for how obvious I'd been with my frustrations with him especially since he seemed to have not just noticed, but also missed the way things had been, despite going out of his way to ignore me for so long. I know. I swallowed and bit the inside of my cheeks. I know, look, I'm just... I shrugged. We'll be back to normal in no time, I'm sure. This has all just been a lot for me to handle, and I'm trying to get used to it. It's hard for me to forgive people, sometimes. I don't know how to act around you anymore, I guess. The same way you used to. He suggested evenly, as if it was the easiest answer in the world. I swallowed, stuck between being stubborn and holding on to the fear and resentment I'd felt, and unsure of how to move forward with this version of Aiden I was trying to get to know. As if sensing I had no idea how to answer, he rolled his shoulders back and asked, other than that, you're sure you're fine? Yes. 
positive? I nodded, letting out a breath that had somehow gotten stuck deep in the pit of my belly, bloating it with insecurity and anxiety and probably a dozen other things I wasn't aware of. Yeah, I, uh, changed my address on my bank statement a couple days ago. I'll change my license as soon as I can, I explained, and suddenly felt a little awkward. Are you sure you're okay with all this? You're sure you still want to be stuck with me for the next five years? That dark, almost caramel-colored gaze landed on me, even, intense, determined. Yes. That smoke-wrapped voice replied effortlessly. We need to go pick up the paperwork for the petition right after we sign the papers. Sign the papers. We were back at it. I gulped. Yeah, okay. Something in my tone must have been apparent, because he shook off that pinning focus, leveling a frown in my direction. You're not backing out on me. It occurred to me he wasn't asking. He was telling. I was a little offended he'd even assume I would do that. I'm not backing out on you. We're here already. I wouldn't do that. I didn't think you would, but I wanted to... What? Remind me? Make sure? I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. We're doing this, I assured him. It took him a moment to nod. I know we're rushing into it, but this is the only chance we'll have. Next month is going to get busier for me. Aiden, I know. I understand. That's why I'm here, isn't it? It's fine. I have things to do too. Without thinking about it, I reached over and touched his bare forearm lightly. I'm not going to disappear on you in the middle of the night. I always go through with my promises, all right? The only place I'm going soon is to El Paso next month for a weekend, but I'll be back after a few days. I'll be around in two years, and I'll still be here three years after that. I don't take my word lightly. Something flashed across his eyes so briefly, it was there in one blink and gone the next. Feeling a little shy, I pulled my hand back and smiled up at him, feeling something loosen up inside of me. Look, I guess I haven't completely gotten over what happened, even though I know you're sorry. I know what it's like for someone to do something unforgivable, and it's unfair for me to take it out on you, okay? I'm sure I'll be back to flipping you off in no time. Don't worry. He nodded slowly, his features never loosening up enough to be considered relaxed. Everything will work itself out. I know you're sorry. I made myself shrug and let out a long exhale that made me feel like I lost a few pounds. I'm grateful for everything, but I need to go pee right now. Come get me when you're ready to leave. I smiled at him before I hightailed it to the bathroom in the bedroom on the right, needing a minute to myself. Inside, I leaned against the door and let out a choppy exhale. What was I doing? Everything would be fine, I figured as I used the bathroom and then headed into the bedroom. It was only five-ish in the afternoon, thanks to the time change, but knowing Aiden, he'd want to get... The paperwork, signed and over with as quickly as possible. So I wasn't surprised when he knocked on the open door connecting my room to the living area and raised his eyebrows when he found me sitting in the middle of the bed, trying to rein in the 80 different emotions battling their way through my nerves. I was doing this. I was really fucking doing this. I was getting married. And if that wasn't enough, apparently Aiden missed me giving him shit. Who would have thought? But most importantly, I was about to marry Aiden Graves. I wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry, or both. You want to go get this over with? He asked from his spot at the doorway. Get this over with. That decided it. It broke me. I couldn't help it. I face-planted on the bed. It was either crying or laughing, and I was going to go with the latter so I wouldn't lose it over Mr. Romance. Sure, I don't have anything else to do. 
I snorted, muffled by the comforter. I was about to go commit a felony. Little Vanessa had no idea what she would be capable of as an adult. Why are you laughing? His question reached me as I lost it even more. It took a second for me to get it together, but eventually I managed to sit up and rub my hand over the side of my face as I let out a shaky, nervous smile. He, on the other hand, was standing there looking at me like I'd lost my mind. You make it sound like we're having to go to the DPS to get your license renewed and you don't want to go. I scooted off the edge of the bed and stood up, stretching my jaw from how hard I'd cracked up. Do you know where you want to do this? He tipped that bearded chin down. There's a chapel two blocks away from here. I nodded, that familiar sense of anxiety fluttering through my chest once more. Okay. I took in the clothes he was still wearing from the flight. Let me change my shirt, at least. He wasn't dressed up. Why should I be? He cast a glance at the t-shirt I had on and backed out. I changed into the slightly dressier work blouse I'd worn in front of him plenty of times in the past and met him in the living room. He was still in his hoodie and v-neck, looking handsome and casual at the same time. Show off. That small medallion peeking at the apex of the cut of his shirt was what caught my eye the most, though. I followed after the big guy. We walked through the lobby and out into the hot Vegas sun. He'd said the chapel was only two blocks away, but they felt like the longest blocks of my life. I'd been to Vegas two other times in the past, but it had always been with him for work, so I hadn't gotten a chance to walk around and check it out. Most of my sightseeing had been done through the window of whatever car we were traveling in. During the day, it didn't look anything like it did at night. I could see Aiden just a foot or two ahead, but I was too busy looking around at the different shops and restaurants to put in much effort to keep an eye on him. Sure enough, exactly two blocks away from our hotel, he stopped in front of a little white chapel that I was pretty sure I'd seen in movies before. Are you ready? The wall of Winnipeg asked, like we were heading for battle. No, I wasn't. But as I looked at Aiden's hard face and thought about how badly he wanted to live in the U.S. without worrying about his visa, how could I have told him no? Okay, I could have, but that huge part of me that was 100% pushover understood. I knew what it was like to not want to live somewhere. Goodbye to the next five years of my life. Yes, I finally answered. We need pictures. The immigration official is going to ask for them at your interview. The corners of his mouth moved in a way that was as much of a smile as I'd ever witnessed on him and might ever see. My nerves were like live wires and my stomach hurt, but it seemed like I was doing the right thing. What? I looked it up. I want to be prepared. To not go to jail and get what had been promised to me. And wasn't that what Aiden should have realized? I was going off his word, relying on him to go through with what he'd promised me at the end of this upcoming journey. Hell, when we divorced, I could ask him for half of everything he owned. Obviously, he had to trust me enough to know I would never do something like that. Everything will be all right. He seemed to promise me after a moment, that partial smile still tipping the fullest part of his cheeks. Okay, my hands were sweaty. Let's do it. He nodded, and in we went. The two people working at the main desk had obviously done this a thousand times in the past. They didn't blink a single eyelash at us in our street clothes. They didn't gush or ask any questions that would have made me feel strange. I thought about the ring I was carrying around in my pocket, and I chickened out. I left it there promising myself I'd take it out later. We filled out the paperwork they gave us, chose a wedding package for $190 that included a ceremony in the chapel, a silk rose bouquet, a boutonniere that had Aiden eyeing it with disdain, 
a photographer, and a CD with five high-resolution pictures to document our big day. The minister was another $60. So, for $250, Aidan and I stood at the front of the aging wedding chapel with a man who might have been inebriated, and we listened to him say words that seemed to go in one ear and out the other. At least for me. Was I freaking out? A little bit. But I kept my eye on the boutonniere that Aiden had shoved into the front pocket of his jeans, and I squeezed the ribbon-wrapped stems of my bouquet with damp fingers until the words, Are you exchanging rings? came out of his mouth. Aiden shook his head, at the same time my trembling fingers pulled the white gold band out of my pocket and handed it over. I didn't want to put it on for him. It just seemed too intimate of a gesture. Those dark irises shot to mine as he tried to slide it over his knuckles. It didn't fit. Why was that so surprising? Of course he would have gotten bigger in the eight years since he'd won the national championship in college. He moved the ring over to his pinky finger, and it slid on easily. That penetrating gaze went back to mine and stayed there, heavy and insurmountable, making me feel so vulnerable that I had to look down at the bouquet that wasn't going to make it much longer under how much I was wringing my hands. I kept my expression down until the words, You may now kiss the bride, came out of the minister's mouth. When I peered up, I found Aiden's eyes on me, and I widened mine, slanting a look to the side, not knowing what the hell we were supposed to do. I'd been too busy stressing about the ceremony to worry about this part. Then I thought about the photographer and knew what needed to be done, even though I didn't want to do it. But more than that, I really didn't want to go to jail or pay out of my butt for fines. Screw it. I didn't have to make out with him even if it wouldn't have really been a hardship if I had to. I took a step forward. Aiden's gaze shifted to the side in uncertainty, something I didn't want to focus on too much right then because I had my own nerves to worry about. Then I took another step forward, put my hands on those muscle-packed upper arms, and went up to my tippy toes, still coming up short. He was frowning even as he lowered his head, our gazes locked on each other, and I pressed my mouth against his. It was nothing grand, just a peck, the center of my lips against the fullest part of his. They were softer, more pliable than I ever would have imagined. The whole contact lasted maybe two seconds before I fell back to my heels and stepped away. My chest and neck were hot. And this handsome, stern man I was signing paperwork with was frowning even more after I put three feet between us. Congratulations! The minister cheered as the other chapel employee literally threw glitter at us. I was glad I was wearing glasses when Aiden rubbed at his eyes with the back of his hand. One picture of you two together, the photographer said, already gesturing me back to Aiden's side. I swallowed and nodded. Believable. A quick shuffle later. I was at his side. When he didn't put his arm around me or do anything remotely couple-like, I slipped my arm through his, pressed my hip against him, and held on just as the flash blinded us. The photographer smiled as she took a step back and lowered her camera. Give me ten minutes, Mr. and Mrs. Graves, and I'll have the CD ready. Mr. and Mrs. Graves. Diana's favorite saying described this situation perfectly. Shit just got real. It was strange to think that by eight o'clock on a Sunday in mid-August, I was legally a married woman. After the chapel gave us our CD with our five photographs and paperwork, we headed back to the hotel in a dreamlike state. At least for me, it seemed like a dream. A weird, weird, weird dream that resembled more of an acid trip than reality. Neither one of us said much, but I was busy thinking about what we'd done, and knowing Aiden, he was thinking about his next preseason game. We headed into our respective rooms, 
only exchanging a forced smile from me and a slightly pinched mouth from him. I must have sat on the edge of the bed for at least 30 minutes, simply getting my thoughts together. The walls seemed to close in on me, and I started to feel itchy and restless. Married. I was freaking married. The woman at the chapel had called me Mrs. Graves. I married Aiden. There was no way I could have stayed in that room all night. I was too amped up to work or draw. Crawling out of my skin, I needed something else to keep my mind on. So I thought about all the things I used to imagine doing when Vegas came to mind, and there was really only one thing on the list. I wanted to see a show. After making sure I had my ID and debit card, I got up and walked into the living area of the suite to find it empty. Peeking into Aiden's room, I found him asleep on the bed, fully clothed and completely passed out. One big palm was being used as a pillow, and the other was tucked between his thighs, a super soft, barely audible whistling sound coming out of his mouth. I glanced at my watch and hesitated for a second. He probably wouldn't want to go, would he? Nah. He didn't seem like the type to get excited over acrobats and clowns in extravagant costumes, much less crowds. Grabbing the notepad on the nightstand next to the king-sized bed he was on, I jotted down a message. Aiden, going for a walk around the strip. I might try to catch a show if there are still tickets available. Be back later. I have my phone on me. V. I tippy-toed out of the room, slowly closed the hotel door behind me, and I was out of there. Las Vegas wasn't exactly the best place in the world for a single female traveler, but with all the people on the street walking around, I figured it could have been a lot worse. It was easy to blend in. I walked down the street and took my time going in and out of some of the shops. Tourists of all ages and nationalities filled the stores, and I didn't feel as lonely as I thought I would have walking around this unknown city all by myself on the same day I'd married my ex-boss. I was looking around the M&M store when my phone started vibrating in my pocket. When I pulled it out, Miranda P. flashed across the screen. Hello? Where are you? The raspy, sleepy voice asked. I named the store with a frown as some asshole shoved me from behind to get to the display in front of me. Aiden cursed, and I had to pull the phone away from my face to make sure it really was him calling and not his evil twin. Wait there. He demanded. For what? I asked, just as the line went dead. Was he coming? And had he just cussed, or was I imagining it? I wasn't sure. I browsed the store for a while and was barely walking out when I happened to glance in the direction I'd come from. Towering over everyone down the block was what had to be Aiden's big head. I couldn't see his face because his hood was up, but I knew it was him just from the way he held his shoulders. I was too far away to see his eyes, but I could tell he was looking around. It was a fact that even with his hood on, I could tell he was irritated. I stood off to the side by the doors and watched him make his way around the tourists oblivious to his presence. The second his gaze landed on me, I sensed it and waved. His mouth went a little funny in a way that I recognized all too well. What the hell was he mad about, anyway? What are you doing? He snapped the instant he was close enough to be heard. I lifted my shoulders shoving my glasses up the bridge of my nose in the process. Walking around? You could have woken me up to come with you. He practically hissed, stopping a foot away from me. First off, his attitude was getting on my nerves. Secondly, I wasn't a fan of the tone of voice he was using. Why would I wake you up? The few inches of his jaw that were visible were tight. So I could come with you? Why else? He was giving me that look. One, two, three, four, five. I narrowed my eyes. I didn't know you'd want to come. 
I figured you would rather stay in the hotel room and rest. After all, he'd been taking a nap when I looked for him. The long line of his throat rippled. I would have rather stayed in, but I also don't need you getting kidnapped and being used as a drug mule. God help me. I looked around at the thousands of people making their way up and down along the strip to make sure I wasn't imagining them. You really think someone's going to kidnap me here? Really? Aiden's nostrils flared. He stared down at me. I stared back. You're already giving me a headache, and it's been four hours. I was trying to be nice and leave you alone, not give you a headache. Come on, I huffed. I'm just walking around. I have gone places without you. A few, but not by myself. I wasn't going to admit that out loud, though, especially now when he was getting all bent out of shape for no reason. He kept glaring at me, that look that got on my nerves taking over his features inch by inch. That's stupid. You're, what, 5'7", 5'8", 140 pounds? You can't walk around Las Vegas by yourself. He stressed, his tone so tight I reeled back. I blinked in confusion and surprise. Aiden, it isn't a big deal. I'm used to doing things by myself. The lids over those big brown eyes lowered slowly, a deep breath blowing from pursed lips, as if we were the only people on the strip when that absolutely wasn't anywhere close to the truth. Maybe you're used to doing things by yourself, but don't be an idiot. He started off calmly totally in control. I didn't know where you were. There's crime here. Don't give me that face. I know there's crime everywhere. We might not be doing this for the reasons most people do, but I made a vow, Van, and I promised you we would try to be friends. Friends don't let friends wander around alone. He pinned me with a glare. You aren't the only one who takes their promises seriously. Uh, what was happening? Those dark eyes were the steadiest thing I'd ever seen, as he said, I can't do this without you. Well, shit. I wasn't sure I even knew how to talk after that. Our marriage, vomit, turl, and diarrhea, wasn't real, but he had a point. We had made vows I couldn't seem to remember because I hadn't been listening. But the point was... We had made promises to each other even before that, and I didn't ever want to be the type of person who backed out on their word. I won't go anywhere until you're a resident, big guy. I promise. His gaze swept over my face for the longest second of my life, and eventually, eventually, he cleared his throat. What is it you want to do? He grumbled suddenly as if he hadn't just said the most meaningful words I'd ever heard come out of his mouth. To give him credit, he didn't complain once after I told him the name of the production I wanted to go watch. But I was also clasping my hands together in front of my chest like I was a little kid begging for something. It's all I want to go see. And I was going to do it regardless of whether he tagged along or not. But he didn't need to know that, yet. He simply looked back up at the non-existent Nevada stars and sighed. Fine, but I need to get something to eat afterward. I might have bounced up to my toes. Really? Yes. Really, really? I swear I might have been beaming. Aiden gave me the most pained nod in the history of the world. Yes, sure, let's go buy the tickets. I'd never in my life wanted to pull a Dorothy and click my heels together, but the idea of not walking around Vegas by myself, and with this gigantor who could have passed for a bodyguard, I found myself grinning at him and clapping. Okay, let's go. For the sake of his life, I decided to ignore the grimace on his face. Off we went. The hotel was on the opposite side of the strip, but we made it with time to spare. 
snagging the two best tickets possible, which I paid for since I felt guilty he'd been paying for everything, and they were third row seats, so I figured it would be worth every penny spent dipping into my savings. As we got in line at the concession stand, I could feel myself shaking for the second time in the same day, but this time it was with excitement. Cirque du Lune had come to Dallas in the past, but I'd always talked myself out of shelling out the cash to go. Now that I wasn't paying rent and business was steady, spending the money didn't send me into heart palpitations or have me falling over with guilt over the extravagance. Plus, I was so pumped, I even signed the receipt with a smile on my face. Do you want to share a popcorn? I asked after we got into this super long line at the concession stand. So overjoyed, I didn't care that the popcorn was going to cost an arm and a leg. He started to dip his chin, just as I spotted a finger reaching up to tap his arm from behind. Aiden hesitantly turned to come face to face with a woman in her 40s and a man in the same age range. They were both smiling. Could we take a picture with you? The woman blurted out, her cheeks coloring. We're huge fans, the man added, his face more red than pink. We've been following your career since Wisconsin, the woman continued on in a rush. Aiden did that tiny little half-assed smile he conjured up for fans as he nodded. Thank you, I appreciate it. That big head turned to face me. Take the picture. The woman smiled sheepishly at me before handing over her phone. I got the camera in focus as the older couple sandwiched Aiden between them. They looked so small in comparison and was taking a step back when I caught movement in the sliver of space between Aiden and the female fan. He never put his arm around people in pictures, I'd noticed from the beginning, but always kept his hands at his sides. It was because of that that I almost missed this small hand motion, but I didn't. And when Aiden scowled almost immediately, it took everything inside of me not to burst out laughing as I took the shot. By the time I handed the phone over, we were next in line, and I left Aiden to finish listening to his handsy fans as I ordered popcorn with no butter, a medium soda, and a bottle of water. It was so nice meeting you, the woman called out as Aiden headed toward me once I was out of line. I barely managed to raise the bag of popcorn to face level when I lost it, peeking at him when I wasn't blinking away tears. The fact that Aiden's ears turned red as he watched me crack up said he knew what I was dying over. Don't say a word, he gritted. Did she grab a handful? I choked out. The look he gave me was a mix of, you're an idiot, and fuck off which only made me laugh harder. He'd gotten molested by a fan right in front of me. That split second look of surprise on his face when he got fondled would probably stay with me for the rest of my life. Shut up, Vanessa. I was dying. He usually just ignored me, but this was so much better. <laughs> Not saying anything, I wheezed from behind the bag of popcorn. Aiden narrowed his eyes waiting patiently. Are you done? He asked after a few more seconds of me cracking up. I had to wipe at the tears in my eyes with the back of my hand, shaking my head. <laughs> I, I, he gestured me toward the doors to the theater. Get inside before they close the doors. His tone was exasperated and maybe even a little embarrassed. Maybe. Why would getting his butt cheek squeezed rile him up? I had to swallow raggedly as I wiped at my face one more time, picturing that epic look of shock once more. I lost it again. Does that kind of thing happen often? No. Would you stop laughing? It was almost two in the morning by the time we made it back to the hotel. I felt happier than I had in forever. The show had been amazing, and dinner at the restaurant in the same hotel as Cirque de Lune after the show had been great. The host had recognized Aiden and gave us the best and most secluded table so Aiden could be left in peace. It had seriously been nice, even if Aiden hadn't talked much while we ate. I didn't go out often, 
but deciding to explore instead of staying in to work that night seemed like one of the best ideas I'd had in forever. So when we got inside the living area to the suite and started going in opposite directions toward our rooms, I stopped at the doorway to mine and turned to look at the man I'd signed papers with hours ago. He was visibly tired. After all, he usually went to bed by nine at the latest, and he looked beyond exhausted. Why wouldn't he, though? He'd played a preseason game 12 hours ago and only managed to nap twice since then. Damn it. This sense of unwanted affection seeped its way into the place between my breasts. Thank you so much for staying up and coming with me, I said, squeezing my hands at my sides as I smiled at him. I had a really good time. Aiden nodded. One corner of his mouth moved a millimeter, but it was a millimeter that could have moved a mountain. Me too. I was too soft to be excited by that sliver of a smile. Good night. Night. It wasn't until after I showered and had snuggled under the covers that I finally let myself sink into reality. I was a married woman. Eleven. Where are you going? With one hand on the staircase handrail, I finished thrusting my heel into my tennis shoe and glanced up at the man standing in front of me with a wary look on his lightly bearded face. I'm going for a run. Why? The big guy glanced down at the overpriced accessory on his wrist, an expensive workout watch I know he'd gotten for free because I'd been the one to open the box when he got it. It's five o'clock, he said, as if I didn't know how to read time. I did, and I'd learned how to a long, long time ago. He'd gotten home about an hour ago, while I was upstairs going over the fifth draft of a paperback cover for an author I'd decided never to work with again. The guy was driving me nuts, changing his mind from one revision to the next, and if it wasn't for my motto, never leave a client unhappy because they'll tell everyone you suck, I would have told him to shove his money down his throat and find someone else. Yeah, I was feeling on edge, and I knew I needed to get out of the house for a little while, even if it was already later than I normally would have liked to go for a run. So I'd been surprised when I first heard Aiden make his way from the kitchen into the foyer, where I was trying to finish getting ready to leave. We hadn't seen each other much since we'd gotten back from Las Vegas a little over a week ago, but things had been fine. It was kind of weird how the trip had sort of relaxed me around him, and it seemed like the sentiment was mutual. Aiden had even started knocking on my doorframe when he walked by my room when he got home. He didn't say much more than, hey, loud enough to be heard over the music I liked to play while I worked. But it was something, I thought. I'm only doing five miles, I let him know right then, grabbing my other shoe off the floor and balancing on one foot to slip it on, like I had the other one, it was a lot harder than it should have been, mainly because I was too aware he was watching me, probably expecting me to fall. It's going to get dark soon, he said, as I struggled to get my heel into my tennis shoe. Oh, damn it, I'll be fine. I started to fall over, flailing an arm out for balance, and instead, getting a big hand catching my elbow to keep me steady. I flashed him a sheepish look and let some of my weight lean on him as I finally got my heel in. Thanks. I took a step away. Anyway, it shouldn't take me more than a little over an hour. I'm still running a little slow, but I won't be gone long. Aiden blinked those great dark eyelashes at me before reaching up to scratch at his chin, those lean cheeks puffing just slightly. Resignation. That clear, clear emotion that seemed to melt its way down from his hairline and over that perpetual wrinkle between his eyebrows and the sides of his mouth had me blinking. Give me a minute. He sighed as he moved around me and jogged up the stairs, two at a time, the house shaking in response. Briefly, I feared for the life of the stairs. Then I realized what he was doing. Was he... You don't have to come with me, I shouted, 
taking a moment to absorb those perfect glutes and rock-solid calves defying gravity as they made their way up the stairs. Why would he even want to come along anyway? The memory of what he'd said in Las Vegas when I took off on my own suddenly came back to me. You aren't the only one who takes their promises seriously. I'm not asking. He yelled back just as he reached the clearing. Torn between thinking it was nice and cute that he didn't want me going out for a jog alone at dusk, I remembered how important it was for him, for big guys in his position in general, to keep their cardio to a minimum. They couldn't afford to lose weight when they needed to keep their size, especially someone with a diet like Aiden's, where he had to consume more physical food than someone who ate meat to get an appropriate amount of calories and not go hungry. It was why Aiden worked out so hard during the day and made a severe effort to rest as much as he could during his off time. Then I wondered, could he even run five miles? I took a step closer to the staircase. You really don't. I won't be gone long. I'll take my phone. There was a pause, and if I really focused, I could hear his dresser drawers slamming shut. One minute. This stubborn ass. No, Aiden, stay here. 30 seconds. The hard-headed mule replied. Why was I even waiting around arguing with him? He really should stay home. He didn't have any business putting strain on his tendon if he didn't have to. I'll be back soon. I took my glasses off and set them on the table right by the door, waiting for my eyes to adjust. I wanted to buy a strap to keep them from falling off when I ran, but I hadn't gotten around to it yet. I'd almost always been farsighted, but I swear my vision was getting worse and worse every year. It was probably time to get a new prescription. Just as I reached the door, I heard that giant 280-pound body stomping around before the stairs took another beating. I told you to wait, he grumbled on the way down. I glanced at him over my shoulder and scrunched my nose. I told you to stay. You're not supposed to be doing a whole bunch of cardio. He was apparently going to pretend I hadn't said anything. Let's go. I patted the fanny pack clipped around my waist in case he hadn't seen it. I have a flashlight and pepper spray. I'll be fine. The expression on his face wasn't an impressed one. That's nice. Let's go. Aiden, I'm being serious. Vanessa, let's go. He had busted out that damn tone of voice again, which only meant one thing. This was one of those times that it was pointless to argue with him. I realized that now. Waving me to go through the doorway first, he set the alarm to stay, since Zach was napping in his room, and followed me onto the paved stone walkway leading up to the house. Facing each other, I took a long step back with my right leg and got into runner's pose. Aiden, I'm not joking. Stay home. Why? He mirrored my stretch, making the material of his shorts squeeze those massive thighs like a second skin. I didn't even know a leg had as many perfect, delineated muscles until I'd seen Aiden in compression shorts. I had to force myself to quit fondling those big hams with my eyeballs. I didn't know what it was about muscular thighs that drove me nuts. I could live without a six-pack, but developed quads and calves were my kryptonite. Because you shouldn't be running. Before I could think twice about what was in my mouth, I said the worst thing you could possibly tell a highly competitive person. And I don't know if you can run five miles, big guy. Plus your Achilles. What had I done? The Wall of Winnipeg, the man who had dragged himself into becoming the greatest defensive player in the NFO, leveled a gaze at me that for the first time in the years we'd known each other made me uncomfortable. It was unsettling. Beyond unsettling. And I wished I had something to hide behind. You worry about running your own five miles, all right? He quipped in a quiet, rough voice. God help us. I lifted my hands up, palms toward him, and shrugged, backing away in surrender. Whatever you say. 
My middle finger twitched, but I kept it under wraps and with its brothers and sisters. We stretched in silence for the next few minutes, our quads, hamstrings, and calves getting needed attention. I did it because of my knee injury, and Aiden because his body was worth millions. Millions and millions. The fact he was breaking the strict rules he put on himself just so I wouldn't go out for a run alone definitely made an appearance in my heart and head, chipping away a little more at that aggravation I'd built up with him since I had quit. I just hoped he didn't regret it tomorrow. <sighs> I'm ready, the stubborn mule reported. I nodded and kept my eye roll to myself. The trail around here is only two miles. I've been circling it. He simply jerked his chin down and followed me toward the gated entrance. I waved at the security guard as we slipped through the side door, and soon enough, we started jogging. As big as Aiden was, it was amazing how he didn't lumber. He definitely wasn't a sprinter by any measure, but he was constant, consistent. His stride was even, his breathing good, and those long legs, which had to weigh at least 80 pounds apiece, somehow made it so he wasn't a half mile ahead or behind me. I had no idea how much distance he usually covered when he did cardio, usually on the bike or doing sprints, but I knew he kept track of that sort of thing religiously. But he kept up, mile after mile, even as his breathing got heavier and each step became more of a fight for him. And when we rounded the last corner, about a quarter of a mile away from the house, I slowed down. Neither one of us said much as we walked side by side. I had my hands on my hips as I caught my breath, and when I happened to look over, his hands were in the same position as mine. As if sensing me checking him out, Aiden raised those thick, nearly black slashes called his eyebrows. I raised my eyebrows back at him. Are you all right? I'm fine. He gave me a smug and slightly sour look. We walked for a little while in silence before he asked, when did you start running? Wiping at my brow, I made a face at myself. Right before I quit? Aiden did a double take I couldn't miss. I remembered the day I'd been outside of his house and I'd seen that woman running. I didn't have time for it before. And I hadn't exactly been motivated to, but I kept that part to myself. I want to run a marathon in a few months. I just need to get up to six miles without going into cardiac arrest afterward. We walked a little longer before he added, One of our conditioning coaches runs marathons. I'll ask him if he has any tips. You should really be following a training guide so you don't get injured. Oh. Huh. Thanks. It'll still be at least a month before I can even start at the rate I'm going. But we all have to start somewhere, I figure. He made a thoughtful noise, but didn't say anything else as we walked the rest of the way home. I could tell he was busy thinking about something from the way the creases at his eyes intensified, but he didn't voice whatever it was going through that big noggin. We made it back to the house just as the streetlights switched on. Taking positions on the lawn, we each dropped into stretches. I smiled at him, and he kind of quirked up his mouth a bit in a delayed response. Has your preseason been going okay? I asked. Yes. I switched legs and shot him a look at his evasiveness, but he was busy inspecting the ground. How about your tendon? Fine. Really? That had those brown eyes up. His peaceful, serious face turned mildly irritated. Really? Okay, smartass. I'm just making sure. I snorted shaking my head as I dropped my gaze to the ground. There was a pause before he spoke up again. I'm all right. I'm being careful. I know what'll happen if I'm not. We both knew. He could lose everything. I suddenly felt just a little bit like an asshole. I just wanted to be sure you were doing okay. That's all. Even though his face, by that point, was tipped down, I noticed the ripple in his trapezius muscles telling me what I wanted to know. He was all right, but he was stressed. 
Everything is going better than anyone expected. The trainers are happy with my progress. I'm doing everything they're telling me to. I couldn't help but smile a little at that. You know, that's one of the things I used to like the most about you. You know what you want, and you'll do whatever you have to do to get it. It's really... Attractive wasn't the right word, and it definitely wasn't the one I would choose to willingly say out loud in front of him. Admirable. Honestly, looking back on my word choice 15 seconds later, I knew that I'd meant what I said with the best intentions, but when I took in the lines bracketing the mouth I'd kissed a week ago, maybe it hadn't come out that way. You don't anymore? His question was low. Shit. No, I do. I backtracked and reached up to mess with my glasses, remembering right then that I'd taken them off and dropped my hand. I don't know why I said I used to. I still do. You inspired me to quit, you know. I figured you of all people would understand why I did it. He turned his head so slowly, it was honestly a little creepy. But the way he looked at me, I wouldn't know how to describe it. The only thing I knew for sure was it made the space between my shoulder blades tickle. His Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed, that hard mouth twitching as he nodded almost reluctantly. I understand. He cleared his throat and turned his attention back to the ground, getting to his feet and pulling his heel back toward his butt. How's your work going? Oh, Lord. This might be the longest and most personal conversation we'd ever had. It was kind of exciting. It's been steady. I've been able to take on more projects, so I can't complain. I glanced at him to see if he was listening, and he was. I actually just got invited to go to one of the biggest romance novel conventions in North America, so that's pretty exciting. I should be able to get more work if I go. I thought you do book covers. He asked. I do, but they let other people have tables as long as they pay, and if I go, I might be able to get more work out of it. Half my clients are authors, the rest is a mix of whatever anyone asks me to do. He switched legs as he asked in a genuine voice. Like what? And it was moments like these that made the distance between us in the past so apparent. Anything, really. I've had some commissions for business cards, business logos, posters, and flyers. I've made a few designs for band t-shirts, a few tattoo designs. I pointed at the shirt I was currently wearing. It was off-white, with a neon-colored sugar skull and ruby-red roses surrounding the crown of the head. The cloud collision was spelled out just below the jaw. I made this for my friend's boyfriend's band. I've also done some work for Zach and a couple of guys on your team. I didn't miss the way his head jerked up when I mentioned that. Mostly redoing their logos and doing banners for them and things like that, I told him, almost a little shyly, self-conscious about my work. Who? He asked, perplexed and more than slightly surprised. Oh, um, Richard Kane, Danny West, Cash Bayek, and that linebacker who got traded to Chicago during the offseason. I never heard anything about it. I shrugged, trying to smile to play it off like it wasn't a big deal. He made this soft little thoughtful sound of his, but didn't add anything. The silence that wrapped around us wasn't awkward at all. It just was what it was. After a few more stretches, Aiden touched me on the shoulder before disappearing into the house, apparently done. By the time I made it inside and slipped my glasses back on, I found Zach standing at the stove in the kitchen. Aiden had taken his seat at the kitchen island with a glass of water. Grabbing a glass from the cabinet, I filled it up with the same. What are you making for dinner? I asked Zach as I peeked over his shoulder. He gave what smelled like onions and garlic a stir. Spaghetti, darling. I love spaghetti. I batted my eyelashes when he glanced at me, earning me a grin. I took a seat on the stool one down from Aiden's. The tall Texan let out a soft laugh. There's more than enough. Aiden, you're on your own. I put meat in the sauce. He just lifted one of those rounded shoulders dismissively. 
I got up to get another glass of water when Zach asked from his spot still at the stove, breaking up the two pounds of ground beef he'd added to the vegetables. Vanny, were you gonna want me to help you with your draft list again this year? I groaned. I forgot. My brother just messaged me about it. I can't let him win again this year, Zach. I can't put up with his crap. He raised his hand in a dismissive gesture. I got you. Don't worry about it. Thank- What? Aiden had his glass halfway to his mouth and was frowning. You play fantasy football? He asked, referring to the online role-playing game that millions of people participated in. Participants got to build imaginary teams during a mock draft, made up of players throughout the league. I'd been wrangled into playing against my brother and some of our mutual friends about three years ago, and had joined in ever since. Back then, I had no idea what the hell a cornerback was, much less a bye week, but i would learned a lot since then. I nodded slowly at him, feeling like I'd done something wrong. The big guy's brow furrowed. Who was on your team last year? I named the players I could remember, wondering where this was going and not having a good feeling about it. What was your defensive team? There it went. I slipped my hands under the counter and averted my eyes to the man at the stove, cursing him silently. So... You see, the noise Zack tried to muffle was the most obvious snicker in the world, asshole. Was I not on your team? I gulped. So, you see- Dallas wasn't your team? He accused me, sounding, well, I didn't know if it was hurt or outraged, but it was definitely something. Uh, I slid a look at the traitor who was by that point trying to muffle his laugh. Zack helped me with it. It was the thump that said Zack's knees hit the floor. Look, it isn't that I didn't choose you specifically. I would choose you if I could, but Zack said Minnesota. Minnesota. Jesus, he'd broken the state in two. The big guy, honest to God, shook his head. His eyes went from me to Zack in, yep, that was outrage. Aiden held out his hand, wiggling those incredibly long fingers. Let me see it. See what? Your roster from last year. I sighed and pulled my phone out of the fanny pack I still had around my waist, unlocking the screen and opening the app. Handing it over, I watched his face as he looked through my roster and felt guilty as hell. I'd been planning on choosing Dallas just because Aiden was on the team, but I really had let Zack steer me elsewhere. Apparently, just because you had the best defensive end in the country on your team didn't mean everyone else held up their end of the bargain. Plus, he'd missed almost the entire season. He didn't have to take it so personally. It only took a second for him to see who I had on there, and he flicked his dark irises back up at me. Zack helped you? Yes, I muttered, feeling so... So bad. Why didn't you put Christian Delgado on your team? Just the sound of his name made my upper lip begin to snarl. But before I could say anything, Zach chipped in. I know I told you to add Christian. He had. I just hadn't because he was a scumbag. Getting up, I went back to the fridge, refilled my glass, and muttered, I didn't want to. The master of why didn't let me down. The fact was, I was a terrible liar, and I wouldn't be surprised if both Aiden and Zach realized I was making things up if I did. I don't like him, I answered bluntly, hoping but knowing that wasn't going to be a good enough answer for either one of their nosy asses. Why? I just don't. He's a slime ball. I don't like him much either, darling. Zach claimed. Keeping my gaze on my glass for longer than necessary, I gradually lifted my head and immediately noticed Aiden's dark irises on me. He was thinking, and I was pretty sure disbelieving at the same time, that intelligent face making me antsy. Did he know I was hedging around the answer? If he did, 
He let it go for the time being when he dropped his attention back to my phone. That little line between his brows left me on guard. The line deepened as he asked Zach. Why did you tell her to choose Michael's? Zach responded something that left Aiden shaking his big head. Don't listen to him. I'd help you if you asked. We were having another moment, like the one earlier when he'd asked about my work. I thought about not bringing it up, then decided against it. I did once, two years ago. I asked you a question about wide receivers, and you told me to look it up on the internet. He winced. Aiden literally winced. And I felt just the teensiest bit guilty for reminding him of something that hadn't been important enough for him to remember. In the spirit of being nice, since he'd gone for a run with me, I reached across the counter and patted his hand. Hey, we have the next five years for you to help me out. Twelve. It was amazing how easily you could settle into a major change in your life. Or maybe it just amazed me how easy it was for me to live with Aiden and Zach and keep living my life in the same way I'd been doing in that month after I quit. Really, it wasn't that life itself had changed much. I was just in a new environment, but still doing the same thing I'd done back at my apartment. A few weeks passed in the blink of an eye, and before I knew it, I'd been at my new house for a month. I'd signed paperwork two weeks ago. The season had started for the guys last week. Basically, life was going and heading in its same old trajectory. Except the house didn't completely feel like my own. It reminded me of back when I was a kid, sleeping over at Diana's, when I couldn't walk around in my underwear or go brawless because it wasn't my house. Then again, I spent the majority of my time in my room working, and no one was ever home, so I could pull off whatever outfit, or lack of an outfit and underwear, I felt like wearing, only running up the stairs like a crazy person when the garage door opened. Then there was this small issue of having to turn down the volume on my computer's speakers when one of the guys was home and I was working. I still hadn't talked myself into spending time in the living room watching television, even when the guys weren't around. Fortunately, claustrophobia hadn't gotten to me yet, considering most of my time was spent in the same place, and that was because I made sure to go to the gym a couple of times a week, to see Diana once a week or every other week, and took my time going to the grocery store. I watched Netflix on my TV when I was bored. I drew in my sketch pad when I felt like it. Sometimes I hung out with Zach, but that didn't happen often because he'd been spending a lot of time away from the house after practices and meetings, seeing his girl of the season. By the time I woke up each morning, both guys were already gone. They were basically the best roommates ever. Best of all, Aiden was the type of roommate who you didn't have to pay rent to. I'd brought it up, of course. That day that I'd moved in, I'd asked him what bills I could help him pay, and all he'd done was give me that bored face that my temper hadn't become immune to. Then I'd asked again, and he'd just ignored me. He'd said he would work on being my friend, but I couldn't expect a miracle overnight, could I? If it was strange for either one of them having me in this house, they didn't say anything about it or make me feel like an intruder, mostly because they both had enough on their plates— Zach had passingly mentioned to me how stressed he was about another quarterback the team had picked up, and Aiden lived and breathed for his sport, never allowing himself to slack off. Not that that was anything new. He nodded at me every time we happened to be in the same room together, and offered me his leftovers, if there were any, which there usually weren't, because the poor guy seemed to be surviving off smoothies, fresh fruit, sweet potatoes, canned beans, nuts, brown rice, and at least one frozen meal daily. That wasn't my business, though, was it? But every day, I would find the recycling bin filled with more cardboard containers than the day before. It made me feel bad. Guilty. It also made me wonder again why Trevor hadn't hired him someone who did all the same duties I'd been responsible for. 
I knew he'd hired Aiden someone to answer his emails because I'd logged onto his account just to see what the damage was and found that every few days there were replies, but no one ever appeared at the house. And sometimes I'd find mail from his P.O. box sitting in the kitchen after he got home. Where was his Vanessa 2.0? The problem with being friends with someone is that unless you want to be a shitty friend, or at least a fake friend because real ones shouldn't be shitty, you couldn't pretend you don't notice if something is wrong with your buddy. The biggest problem with my newfound friendship with Aiden was how complicated it was. What we'd done was technically a business transaction, but we sort of knew each other, and I knew that even if he wasn't perfect and wasn't truly my friend friend who would donate a kidney if I needed one, I still cared about him anyway. I was a sucker like that. I figured, best case scenario, he liked me enough to chip in for someone to donate whatever I needed. I mean, he'd gone running with me so that I wouldn't go by myself when it was laid out. On top of that, we lived together. We were technically married. Complicated was the best word to describe the situation. So, when I found Aiden in the breakfast nook with his leg propped on one of the other chairs and an ice pack over his foot, mere weeks after the regular NFO season had started, I couldn't pretend not to see it. Friends didn't do that. Not people who had known each other for two years. Not when I knew Aiden well enough that I was aware he treated his body like a temple. So for him to have an ice pack on his ankle? Guilt flooded my chest. The 300s had some of the best trainers and physical therapists in the country. They had all kinds of advanced technology to get their players back in shape. The staff wouldn't have let Aiden leave the facility until they'd done as much as they could for whatever was troubling him. His facial expression only confirmed something was wrong. His jaw was jutting out, and the cords lining his thick neck were more pronounced than usual. He was in pain, or at least incredibly uncomfortable. This man who I'd seen walk off the field like his ribs hadn't just been fractured two years ago, much less without crying out, owie, was in clear and visible pain. And I couldn't ignore it. Because friends didn't do that, did they? I took my time circling the kitchen island, watching him, not minding that all he'd done was lift an index finger to greet me. He was eating a sandwich and reading a book on... It had the word dumb on the front. I opened the refrigerator door to grab ingredients to make a soup and turned my attention back as discreetly as possible to watch the big man at this small table. I'm going to make some soup. Do you want some? I offered. What kind? He had the nerve to ask without looking away from his hardback. I held back my smirk. A kind you like? Okay. There was a pause. Thanks. I chopped a few vegetables while occasionally glancing up. Running through a few different scenarios in my head on how to go about approaching him to find out if he was in pain or not, I realized I was being dumb. Aiden? Hmm? What's wrong with your foot? I just blurted out. I sprained it. That was easy, effortless, no bullshit Aiden for me. Unfortunately, his comment didn't help or reassure me. I wouldn't be surprised if someone had hit him with a car and the tendon wasn't even attached to his leg anymore and he was insisting it was just a sprain. But was I going to say that? Nope. High sprain or low sprain? I asked carefully, as casually as I could. Between his injuries and Zach's, I'd become familiar with the different kinds possible. Hi. He replied just as nonchalantly. What did the trainers say? That had his jaw tightening. I'm questionable for the next game. Not probable. Questionable. Oh, brother. Questionable statuses made Aiden Graves a grumpy goose. I lowered my gaze back down to the cutting board and the celery I had on there. It might be a good idea for you to go see that acupuncturist you went to last year when your shoulder was bothering you. 
The more I listed his past injuries, the more it made me wince. Zach had told me once that every football player he knew constantly lived with pain. It was inevitable. That might be a good idea. He murmured, turning a page in his book. Do you want some Advil? I suggested, glancing up, knowing damn well he never took painkillers. Then again, he rarely ever busted out the ice pack. When he said, Two would be nice. I had to hold back my gasp. Early the next afternoon, the sound of the garage door opening and closing told me enough about what was going on. When the television came on a few minutes afterward, I stayed upstairs with my colored pencils and a tattoo commission I was working on for a client. Three or four hours later, once I finished my project, started on another one, and had showered to get ready for bed, I crept down the stairs, hearing the drone of the TV on in the background. The living room was directly to the left at the bottom of the staircase, the kitchen to the right. I peeked in and found Aiden stretched out on the couch, the foot of his injured leg propped on the armrest. He had one arm twisted behind his head as a pillow. The other one was along his side, his palm resting on his stomach. His eyes were closed. I knew he hadn't accidentally fallen asleep on the couch. I knew it with every fiber of my being. He'd done it on purpose. The worry that swam around my stomach didn't surprise me. Here was this seemingly indestructible man who I believed with every cell in my body had stayed on the couch to avoid climbing up the stairs to get to his room. Damn it. I went back up to the second floor and pulled the pristine white comforter from the top of his bed and grabbed his favorite pillow. Once back downstairs, I crept back into the living room and laid the comforter across his lower body, tucking it in so that it didn't drag on the floor. I took a step back, chewing on my lip. And that was when I saw his eyes were open and he was watching me. I smiled at him and held out the pillow. A small smile cracked across his full mouth as he took it from me and stuck it under his head. Thank you. Taking a step back, I nodded, feeling caught. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. He'd been sitting in the garage for a while. The fact that he hadn't left the house to go to practice was the next thing that sent alarm bells ringing in my head. He wasn't the suicidal type, but... Leaving my bowl in the sink, I opened the door and stuck my head out to see what was going on. Sure enough, he was in the driver's seat of his Range Rover with his head in one of his large hands, looking down. I walked over and knocked on the window. His head lifting, he frowned before rolling it down. Do you want me to drive you? I offered, thinking about the project I'd wanted to finish working on that morning and shoving it to the back of my head. Aiden's nostrils flared, but he nodded. To give him credit, he only slightly limped around the car, but it was more than enough to worry me. I'd been thinking about him since the night before when I'd found him on the couch, but I knew better than to baby him. Instead, I ran back in the house, grabbed my purse, and set the alarm before going back to the garage and getting behind the wheel. It wasn't the first time I'd driven his car, except the last time I'd been behind the wheel, it was to take it to get an oil change and a wash. Where are we going? To the acupuncturist. Did you put the address into the navigation? I asked as I backed out of the garage, extra careful, incredibly self-conscious about my driving skills. Yes. I nodded and followed the gentle female voice all the way to the acupuncturist's office, though after a while of driving, I remembered exactly where we were going. Just like every other time I'd ever taken Aiden, what seemed like all of the female employees at the homeopathic clinic seemed to find their way to the front desk while he was signing in. I took a seat and, with a smirk on my face, watched as one woman after another approached the counter, asking the big guy for an autograph or a picture. Aiden spoke with a low, calm voice, his movements measured, and his entire body tense the way it always was around people he didn't know. 
he didn't even get a chance to sit down before the door leading to the main part of the clinic opened and another employee called his name. Aiden glanced back at me and tipped his head toward the door before disappearing. The crowd of women disbanded too. I hadn't really been thinking straight before we rushed to leave, so I'd forgotten to bring something along to keep me entertained. I grabbed one of the magazines on the table and started flipping through it, trying to tell myself that Aiden was fine. An hour later, the door Aiden had gone through opened again, and his bulky frame slowly crept out, one obviously pained step at a time. A man in a short white coat behind him at the doorway shook his head. Get crutches or a cane. Aiden simply lifted a hand before approaching the window where only two employees were waiting at that point. I dropped the magazine on the table and got up. The wall of Winnipeg hunched over the counter, signing something. It's such a pleasure to see you again, the receptionist crooned just as I stopped right behind Aiden. Was she batting her eyelashes? If she was, he didn't notice. His attention was on what looked like the invoice in front of him. I'm such a huge fan of yours, she added. A fan of that ass, more than likely, I figured. She kept going. We all hope you get better soon. Yeah, she was definitely batting her eyelashes. Huh. That had Aiden responding with one of those indecipherable noises of his as he straightened and slid the paperwork over to her. Mr. Graves, I can settle your visit with your assistant if you'd like to take a seat, the receptionist said in a sugary sweet voice, her green eyes flicking to my direction briefly. Aiden settled for shrugging a shoulder as he turned his body to face me. Nothing about his expression or body language gave me a warning. She's my wife. Time stopped. What the hell did he just say? Handle it for me, would you, Muffin? Aiden asked casually, digging into his back pocket and handing over his wallet like he hadn't just said the freaking W word in front of strangers. And wait a second, did he just call me Muffin? Muffin? My mouth went dry and my face went hot, but somehow I managed to smile when the woman's curious and slightly shocked attention slid over to me, more than extremely aware of the weight of Aiden's gaze on me. His wife. I was his freaking wife, and he just said so out loud. What the fuck? There were words for everything, and I understood that a lot of times they meant nothing. In this case, I recognized that, yeah, wife didn't mean crap, but still, it was weird. It was really Really weird to acknowledge the title for a hundred different reasons. It was even weirder to hear the word out of Aiden's mouth, especially when it was me he was talking about. The muffin thing was its own beast, something I definitely wasn't prepared to deal with in that moment. Picking Aiden's wallet from his hand, I turned my hopefully not-so-shocked face to the receptionist and handed over Aiden's debit card. With a fake, strained smile that was more of a grimace, she took it from me and swiped it. After she handed a receipt over, I found Aiden waiting for me at the door and walked out alongside him. I resisted the urge to ask if he wanted to use me as a crutch for support. Once we were in the car, and before I did anything else, I turned to him in the seat, acting as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Aiden, uh... I scratched at my forehead, trying to keep my features even. First things first. Did you just call me Muffin? He looked at me. His blink was so delayed, I started thinking maybe I'd imagined it. I figured it was too soon to call you Dinner Roll. I stared at him, and as I did, my mouth might have been open at the same time. Slowly, Eventually, I nodded at him dumbly, attempting to absorb what I realized was a joke he'd just made. A joke he'd made aimed at me. You were right. It would have been too soon, 
I muttered. He made this face that irritatingly said, I told you so. Who the hell was this human being? He looked like Aiden. He smelled like Aiden. He sounded like Aiden, but he wasn't the same Aiden I knew. This was the Aiden who had sought me out in Vegas and told me to shut up when I was teasing him. Okay? I swallowed and nodded, accepting that this was what I'd wanted from him, and I'd finally gotten it. I liked this version more, even though he seemed like a completely different person. Messing with the leg of my glasses, I sniffed and floundered around for the other thing bouncing around in my head. Why did you call me your wife in there? My voice sounded all weird. That heavy-lidded, smart-ass gaze was as cool as a damn cucumber. Why wouldn't I? I thought we were going to keep this under wraps for as long as possible. And he could have at least warned me he was going to do it so I could have mentally prepared. The wall of Winnipeg didn't look remotely apologetic. You are my wife, and I don't have patience for flirts. He said in that calm, detached voice that made me want to club him. You're not my assistant. Did you want me to deny it? I just... My nostrils flared on their own. Did I want him to? I wasn't sure. But it wasn't like he'd called me his bitch or anything. It's fine that you did it. You caught me off guard. That's all. Stretching that long body out in his seat, Aiden didn't add anything else. I sat there for a moment, thinking about what he'd done, and thinking about this unconventional fake marriage we had, and this new, oddly shaped, blossoming friendship. And it was when I was thinking about those things that I remembered what Aiden had said to me in Vegas. How we'd made promises to each other, and how he was going, in his own strange way, to keep up with them. With my hands wrapped around the steering wheel, I looked at him over my shoulder and asked outright with a choppy exhale, What's it going to be? Crutches or a cane? He went with nothing. Crutches or a cane, big guy, I repeated. Aiden shifted in his seat. Give me a break. Give me a break. I had to count to five. Turning the ignition, I reminded myself that he'd called me what I was his friend, and weirdly, his wife. He knew me. He'd missed the Vanessa I'd been back when things had been okay between us. I'll find you a walker if you don't make a choice by the time I get on the freeway, I threatened, keeping my attention forward. The faster you heal, the better. Don't be a pain in the butt more than you need to be. He sighed. Mm, crutches. That was way too easy, and I wasn't dumb enough to bring it up more than necessary so that he wouldn't change his mind. I didn't say anything else as I drove to the pharmacy and parked. Aiden stayed silent, too, when I hopped out of his SUV. In no time, I found crutches and bought a new bottle of over-the-counter anti-inflammatory pills. The ride home was pretty quiet. I made sure not to watch as he slowly hobbled inside and made his way to the couch where the comforter I'd brought downstairs the night before was neatly folded, stacked under his pillow. Leaving the crutches I'd bought propped against the couch, I hesitated for a second by the stairs as I watched him settle in. I'll be upstairs, I said. He nodded stiffly, palming the remote in one of his hands, his head turned toward me. Thanks for taking me. Yeah, I shuffled my feet. What are friends for? I teased him in a small voice, unsure of how he'd react. For that, then. The man I'd seen kind of, sort of, maybe smile a couple of times had a tentative grin crack across his mouth. The expression on his face completely caught me off guard. For a man who never, ever physically reacted, even when he won a game, his smile? Heaven help me. It was beautiful. There was no other word to describe it. It was like a double rainbow. Better than a double rainbow. I felt stunned, rooted in place forever. His features didn't necessarily soften, 
but the way his entire face seemed to lighten. I touched my mouth to make sure it was closed and not wide open. I couldn't respond. I could only stand there, nodding in place, with something that was pretty close to a deranged smile making an appearance on my face. Holler if you need me. I, uh, have work to do. Yeah, I tucked my imaginary tail in and ran upstairs. Good lord. My heart pounded as I sat at the chair behind my desk, and I set my palm over it. What the hell was that? That smile was like a nuclear bomb he had within his reach. I mean, I knew Aiden was attractive, obviously. But when he smiled, there was nothing to prepare you for that weapon of mass destruction. Hello? I had eyes. Even if I had become mostly desensitized to those muscles on top of carefully sculpted muscles, I knew they were there. I knew his face was handsome, despite how unyielding it usually was. I sucked in a breath and let it out, trying to clear my head. But it wasn't as easy as it should have been. When I was looking for photographs of male models for an ebook cover, I thought about Aiden one or two times more than necessary. Good grief. He needed to keep that thing in check. 13. A couple of weeks later, after Aiden had completely recovered from his sprain, I was in my room working on a paperback cover for one of my favorite clients when I heard the garage open and close, followed by the beeping of the alarm, and finalized by the loud slap of the door being slammed shut. Lowering the volume on my computer speakers, I sat there a minute. I didn't need to look at the culprit to confirm who it was. Aiden wasn't the slamming the door shut out of anger type of person. He tended to stick to venting his grievances with words, or on the field, or gym. Or more often than not, he went into his room and stayed there doing who knows what. I'd never figured out what he did in there for hours. That was what alarmed me. It had to be Zack, and Zack was usually too laid back to react to anything like that. Unless he had a reason to be really pissed. I stayed in my room and faintly listened to the angry noises coming from the first floor. The cupboards being forcefully closed, the loud clatter of plates on the counter, and the God damn it! that was shouted twice. It all wafted up the stairs and wrapped around me in my room but I stayed where I was. If Zack was angry, he needed space to cool off. At least that was the best way to deal with my sisters when they were pissed. So I left him alone, despite wanting to know what happened. Sometime later, stumps echoed their way up the stairs and down the hall. And that was how I knew something was really wrong. Zack always told me hi. Then his bedroom door closed with a bang just down the hall from my room. For one brief second, I thought about texting Aiden to ask if he knew what was going on. But if he didn't text me back, it would just make me mad. So I waited, instead. Zach didn't come out of his room the rest of the day. I didn't hear him in his room, either. And that was when I started to worry. The following afternoon, I made my way downstairs after he still hadn't come out. I found Aiden in the kitchen, fiddling with the knobs for the stove while he held a pan in one hand. He briefly peeked at me over his shoulder before muttering a- Hello. That seemed almost natural. Hi, I greeted him back, not getting hung up on the H word as I tried to decide how to best go about asking him about my main concern. Big Texas. It must have been apparent I wanted something, because not a few seconds later, Aiden spoke up. What's wrong? I think there's something wrong with Zach. He said, Oh. So casually, I wasn't anticipating what came out of his mouth next. The team released him yesterday. He explained, like the news wasn't the most devastating thing to happen to Zach ever. Hell, it would be the worst thing just about any professional athlete on any team could ever hear. 
even I found myself sucking in a breath. Why? He'd turned to face the stove again, those mountainous shoulders and wide lateral muscles greeting me through the thick white t-shirt he had on. He's been too inconsistent. He hasn't been listening. Aiden lifted his shoulders. I told him it was going to happen. I blinked. You knew? He hasn't been taking his training seriously enough, and it's noticeable. The other QBs have been playing better. He made a humming noise as he moved toward the refrigerator. <sighs> He's pissed off, but it's his fault, and he knows it. I winced, feeling bad for Zack's situation, but understanding the point Aiden was trying to make, despite how brutal the truth was. Even I had brought up how much time he took off when he should have been working out during the off-season. Hurt for him clung to the edges of my soul, though. Just a couple months ago, he'd been the one telling me how happy he was that I would be joining the do-what-you-love team. Now? Have you talked to him? I asked. No. Of course not. When a normal person would try to commiserate with a friend after something crappy happened to them, Aiden wouldn't. I sighed and scratched at my temple. Damn it, I couldn't believe it. I wondered what Zack was going to do now, but it was still too soon to ask. Figuring he probably needed a little more time to stew on what happened, I made myself let it go. Maybe he'd gotten a little complacent, but that didn't mean he had to get his dreams ripped away from him. I wanted to talk to him, but I couldn't help but think about how terribly some people handled disappointment in their lives. I'd grown up with three of them. It wouldn't hurt to wait. Towing the floor with my sock-covered foot, I glanced at Aiden to find him spreading hummus all over two tortillas on the counter. You doing okay? Yes. He answered quickly. That's good. I stared at his broad back and bit the inside of my cheek, that same uncertainty with talking to him filling my guts. Did he want me to leave him alone? Should I try to make more of a conversation with him? How's the running going? He asked suddenly. Small talk. Heaven help us, he was trying to make small talk. Good, I'm getting faster. I puffed my cheeks up with air and gave the fridge a side look. Why? Do you want to go with me again? His snicker was soft, and it made me laugh. Rome hadn't been built in a day. No? Okay. I'm going back to my room. Let me know if you talk to Zach, though, would you? Two days passed, and I didn't see Zach once. I wasn't sure when he ate, because I never saw him, and if it wouldn't have been for his car in the driveway and the occasional flush of the toilet from the bathroom adjacent to his room, I wouldn't have known he was home. I knocked on his door once, but he didn't respond. But by the third full day of not seeing him, I figured he'd had enough time to stew in his pot of pity. Finishing the two projects I'd assigned myself for the day, I headed across the hall to his bedroom and gave the door two raps. Nothing. So I knocked again, a little harder. Still nothing. Zack attack? And nothing. I know you're in there. Open up. I pressed my ear to the door and listened. Zack, come on. Open the door or I'll pick the lock. No response. I know how. Don't tempt me. I waited a beat, and then kept going. I used to break into my boyfriend's locker in high school. Not necessarily my most mature moment, but it had come in handy a couple of times. He wasn't biting. Zach, buddy, come on. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want, but let's go get some Mexican food. The mattress creaked loudly enough for me to hear, and I smiled. If you're a nice boy, I'll take you to do some two-step at that honky-tonk place you like. What do you think? I tried to bribe him. He definitely made some stirring noises. It took what felt like a couple minutes before he finally spoke up like I had hoped he would. He'd never say no to going to a country western club, which I guess worked out in his favor, because if he had the kind of status that Aiden had, 
he wouldn't be able to do that sort of thing without getting hounded, and now wasn't the time for that. In that kind of club, he wouldn't stand out. Then finally, he answered. You'll drive? I'll drive. Give me an hour to get ready. I couldn't help but snort. It doesn't even take me that long to put on my makeup. There was a pause, and what sounded like his bed springs squeaking confirmed he really was moving around. I gotta straighten my hair too, sugar. Give me a break. I smiled at the door. That's my girl. I hate to be the one to say this to you, but you need to go on a diet. Zack managed to take a step forward before he swayed so much most of his weight ended up on me. Again. He was no Aiden, but he definitely wasn't anywhere near underweight, either. Good grief. I started panting as we took another two steps closer to the house, seriously reconsidering the big guy's suggestion that I start doing some weight training. I'd been walking, jogging, and running nearly five days a week for the last two months so I could begin training for a marathon, but that didn't prepare me for carting around Big Texas. I was planning on starting to do some cross-training soon, but hadn't gotten around to it yet. To make matters worse, like an idiot, I'd parked on the street like I usually did, but the difference was that I didn't usually have a 200-pound drunk man hanging off my arm for dear life. Instead of drinking away his sorrows with margaritas like I'd originally suggested, Zack had gone straight for the Coronas. Many, many Coronas. So many I'd lost count, even though my wallet hadn't. But I wasn't going to say anything, because the moment he'd arrived at the doorway to my room, dressed, I saw devastation in the flesh. Zack, who was normally a vision of health vitality and friendliness, looked like shit. I didn't comment, and I had to settle for smiling in his direction and giving him a slap on the butt as we headed down the stairs and toward my car for our evening. Sure enough, he hadn't wanted to talk about getting let go from the team, and instead he'd slapped on a somewhat bright smile after a few minutes and made every effort to have fun. Up until he'd gotten wasted. Hey, hold on to the wall a second so I can get the door unlocked, I ordered, poking him in the side at the same time. I tried to angle him so he could grab hold. Sure, Vanny. Zack muttered, smiling at me dreamily, lips pressed tight, his eyes closed. I snickered, made sure he had one hand firmly planted on the wall, and then slipped under his arm. It didn't take me long to unlock the door and turn off the alarm. With Zack's arm over my shoulder again, I shuffled him three feet inside before he started tilting sideways, one clumsy foot in front of the other until he crashed into the side table next to the couch. The lamp on top teetered as Zack tried to right himself, but it lost the battle with gravity and clattered to the floor, the shade flying off, the bulb cracking into a thousand pieces. Damn it. I sighed. One, two, Three. All right, you're done for the night, buddy. Grabbing Zack's arm, I led him onto the couch like he was a little kid. Opening them just as his butt hit the cushion, his eyes were glassy, wide, and so completely guileless, I couldn't even be irritated with him longer than a second. Sit here. He did. Let me go get you some water, but don't move, okay? He forced himself to blink up at me totally dazed, and I was pretty sure he couldn't see me, even though he was obviously trying. He smacked his lips. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am? It took everything inside of me not to crack up. <laughs> I'll be right back, I croaked, pinching my nose and taking a couple steps back to avoid the broken pieces of light bulb before heading toward the kitchen. I flicked on the lights, filled up a plastic cup with water, because I wasn't about to trust him with glass, and grabbed the broom and dustpan from the pantry closet. Zack sat on the couch where I'd left him, his boots kicked off in the middle of the room, and his butt scooted up to the edge. His eyes were closed. But it was the big smile on his face that killed me. 
This surge of affection filled my heart as I squatted down to poke him in the shoulder. The second he lazily cracked those blue eyes open, I held the cup of water toward him. Drink up, buddy. He took the cup without argument, and I went over to the mess on the floor. I swept up what I could, poured the shards in a small cardboard box I'd found in the recycling bin, and tossed it all into the trash. Taking the vacuum from the pantry, I pulled it after me and into the living room, where I moved the suction all over the floor just to be on the safe side. I'd barely unplugged the vacuum and turned around to put everything back when I sucked in a breath and let out the girliest, most pathetic squeak in the universe. It wasn't ah or eep. It just sounded, well, I'm not sure what it sounded like, but I would never take credit for it. Aiden stood there, not even two feet away, literally cloaked in the darkness of the hallway like a damn serial killer. You scared the hell out of me. My heart, I was going to have a heart attack. I had to slap my hand over my chest, like that would help it stay in place. Oh my god. What are you doing? His voice was raspy and low. Hand still over my chest, I panted. Somebody broke a light bulb. I gestured toward the drunk Texan on the couch, oblivious to everything and everyone around him at that point. I eyed Aiden, his sleepy face, the wrinkled white t-shirt he had on, the thin lounge pants I know he'd thrown on to come down the stairs, because in the two years I'd been responsible for doing his laundry, I'd only washed them a handful of times, and I immediately felt guilty. The big guy usually went to bed at the earliest possible time he could to ensure he got a minimum of eight hours of sleep. And here I'd been vacuuming, waking him up. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to wake you, I whispered, even though I was sure I could have walked around the living room banging pots and pans and Zach wouldn't have woken up. He shrugged one of those big shoulders, his eyes going from me to his now ex-teammate. I didn't need to look at Zach to know he was more than likely passed out on the couch by that point, especially not when Aiden's stray gaze stayed on the spot behind me. How much did he have to drink? He asked, yawning. A pang of guilt hit my belly. Too much? As if to explain, I added, I just wanted to get him out of his room for a little while. I thought it would be good for him. Maybe too good for him, but it was too late to take the evening back by the time I figured getting shit-faced wasn't the best thing for him to do. To be fair, it had been a lot of fun. A loud, rough snore ripped through the air, and the sharp, sudden rumble of Zach's snoring had me glancing over my shoulder. I need to go grab something. I'm sorry if I woke you. Before he could say anything else, or not say anything else, I hauled ass upstairs and into Zach's room, internally cringing at the mess he'd made since he began locking himself in. And the smell. It was bad. Real bad. Grabbing the corner of the wrinkled comforter on the bed and his pillow, I ran down the stairs and found Aiden standing next to the couch, talking to Zach in a low voice, and... Was he patting the armrest? Here. I handed over the pillow. Aiden took it, his attention still on Zach, and set it alongside the armrest I'm pretty sure he'd been petting a second ago. Lie down. He ordered the drunk one in a quiet, no-nonsense voice that obviously left no room for argument to even someone who was mostly out of it. Sure enough, Zach lay down without opening his eyes. His arms crossed over his chest, one shoulder cocooned into the couch cushions. I tossed the comforter over his long body and smiled at Aiden, who was still standing over the couch, looking extremely, ridiculously serious at what was essentially us tucking a grown man in. Zack made some funny kind of puttering sound that made his lips flutter, and I snorted. He looks like a little kid, doesn't he? I whispered. He acts like a little kid. Aiden grunted shaking his head in total disapproval. What is he going to do now? I found myself blurting the question out. The big guy hummed. 
What he should do is quit acting like the world has ended and get back to training so another team will pick him up later on in the season. He stated. What he's going to do, I don't know. If he waits too long, it'll hurt his chances of getting another opportunity in the future. Every day we get older and our bodies can't. Aiden tipped his chin to the side and cast me a long look. I'll talk to him tomorrow. That's a good idea. I think he'll listen to you. He'd probably listen to you more. That had me frowning at him at the same time I shoved my glasses farther up my nose. You think? His attention didn't stray from the couch as he answered, I know. I didn't necessarily believe that was true, but okay. I'll try, I guess. The worst he'll do is not listen to me, and it wouldn't be the first time it's happened. That had his head turning. Are you talking about me? I pressed my lips together. I wasn't talking about you, but... But... I kept my gaze on the wall away from Aiden. You haven't listened to me before, if you want to get technical. Aiden didn't respond. A lot of times, I added in a mutter. Nothing. Okay. I tipped my head toward the kitchen. I was going to make a sandwich before I went to bed. Do you want one? What kind? He asked, like I'd offer him a turkey club. 14. So, how's it going? Living in sin? I gave an awkward laugh, shaking the walk in my hand at the same time. Uncomfortable laughs were what you got when you felt guilty. I still hadn't told Diana that Aiden and I had gone to Las Vegas. It was a damn miracle. She usually knew I started my period ten minutes after I did. We liked to celebrate another month of not being pregnant. I could only think about two other things I'd ever lied to her about. Apparently, I liked to live life on the edge because I knew I was in for a reckoning the likes of which I'd never seen when she found out the truth. Because at this point, I was in too deep, and there was no way in hell I was going to admit what I'd done. The biggest problem with lying to your closest friend was finding the right line to straddle. Enough truth to be believable, but not enough of a lie so they could notice you were full of shit which was exactly what I needed to find, so I went with diverting her attention by going for middle ground. It's going fine. Fine? That's it? Yeah, fine. What the hell else could I say? While things between Aiden and me were better than they ever were, nothing amazing had happened. He lived his life, and I lived mine. He was a busy guy. I'd always known that, and nothing had changed. The most exciting thing I've found out was that Aiden gets his groceries delivered once a week and that he hired some lady who lives in Washington to answer his emails. Crazy stuff, huh? She hummed, paused, and then asked, Why does it feel like you're lying to me? She could already tell. What the hell? And why was I surprised? Because you're crazy, I offered, making a face into the phone in panic. Doubtful. It's more like a fact, but anyway, there's nothing to tell you. We don't see each other that much. The most he does is wave at me. Sometimes he talked to me, but we didn't have to be technical, did we? B-O-R-I-N-G. I groaned. S-O-R-R-Y. Really? You don't have anything juicy to tell me? Nope. I'd already worked for him for two years. If there was something bad to tell her, I couldn't have told her anyway. I'd signed a non-disclosure agreement. The disgruntled sound out of her mouth made me grin. Fine. Are you going to El Paso this weekend after all? She asked, already moving on, knowing if I hadn't already told her something, I probably wouldn't. Yes, I confirmed, with only the smallest bit of anxiety going through my stomach. I was going to El Paso for my mom's birthday. Did I know I was more than likely going to regret taking the trip hours after I got there? Yes, nine times out of ten, that had been the case. 
But it was her 50th birthday, and her husband was planning a party for her. She'd love to see me there, he'd said to me. Lay on the guilt trip, why didn't he? I talked to her once a month. I figured that wasn't too shabby to begin with, considering everything. From the way he'd made me feel, one call every four weeks wasn't good enough. At least enough for me to feel obligated to go, even though my gut said it was a stupid idea. Where are you staying? At a hotel, I responded. I could stay with my mom if I wanted to, but I didn't. The last time I'd stayed with her had ended terribly. There were also my two oldest sisters, but I'd rather camp out under a bridge than do that. Finally, there were my foster parents, who I was planning on dropping by and visiting while I was in town, but I didn't want to impose on them. Is Oscar going? She asked about my little brother. No, he already started school. Are you going by yourself? <laughs> of course I'm going by myself, I answered before thinking about just what I was saying. Wasn't the 300s bye week coming up? That was the week they got off a season to let the players rest. Should I go by myself? Would it be a good idea to take Aiden around my mom? My sisters? That idea had me cringing. But I could have him around to break the news. Now that idea seemed like the only one that could have convinced me. There was no chance of my family members telling Diana or her family, so I wasn't worried about it getting around that way. Actually, maybe I won't. The nosy broad took a swift intake of breath. Really? I might ask Aiden, so keep your mouth shut. I will. She was such a damn liar. I didn't believe her at all. I didn't believe she hadn't at least told her brother that I was living with Aiden. The opening and closing of the garage door let me know someone was home. I'll tell everyone about your porn bookmarks if you don't. I threatened her with a snicker. I'm never going to live that down, am I? You never forgot accidentally coming across your friend's predominantly man-on-man -man porn bookmark folder, no matter how hard you try. No. Like you've never seen gay porn, she sniped bitterly. You think Susie might be at your mom's? And just like that, my nice fine day was kicked in the shin. I bit the inside of my cheek and reached up to push my glasses farther up my nose. I don't know. I talked to my mom a few days ago, but she didn't mention anything. Not that my mom would. If I did see Susie, chances were high it wasn't going to end well. It never had. Even people I didn't know who knew about our situation were well aware that was a fact. We were like two magnets constantly repelling each other. Damn it. I knew Diana was just trying to be helpful, but simply thinking about Susie made my head start hurting. I don't think you should go by yourself or with Aiden, for the record. That wasn't surprising. I just wish she wouldn't have brought up Susie. I know. But you're still going? I'd already given my word I would. How could I take it back? Yes. She didn't approve, and it was evident over the phone. I want to finish eating so I can get back to work. I'll text you later. Give the demons a hug from me next time you see them. And tell Drigo I haven't forgotten he still has the DVDs I let him borrow a month ago, I said to her, rubbing at one of my throbbing temples. I will. I'm babysitting them tomorrow. I'll let you know when I'm off next week so I can do your hair again, okay? We hung up just as the door that connected the garage to the kitchen opened, and Aiden came in, his duffel in hand. Hi, I said, turning off the stove. Hi, Vanessa. Aiden dropped his bag on the floor by the door and then made his way toward where I was standing, his nostrils flaring at the smell of lentils, chopped vegetables, and sun-dried tomatoes mixing together. Smells good. I gave him a side look only letting what seemed to be an extra-large shirt on his double-extra-large frame distract me for a second. There's enough for both of us if you have a normal human-sized meal instead of a Hulk-sized one. He sniffed, 
and I think it was more at my comment than to actually smell the food again. Thank you, he said, making his way toward the sink to wash his hands. He seemed to hesitate at the island for a minute before taking two plates down from the cupboard and setting them on the counter by the side of my hip. When the timer for the noodles went off, I drained them, splitting up half the pot on two plates and leaving the other half in the pot. I scooped up the stir-fry and placed it on top of the noodles as Aiden put two red apples side by side in the spot he usually ate at. We sat down to eat, each of us just sitting there, not on our phones or computer or anything, just sitting there. Has Zach come down? He suddenly asked. Once, he came out of his room around noon, but that's it. It had been almost a week since he'd been let go from the team, and apart from the day we'd gone out, he hadn't left his room more than he needed to, which was solely for meals. He didn't want to talk to anyone or do anything, and I wasn't sure what to do, if I should even do something. Aiden made a hmm noise. I don't know what to say to him, or if I should do something, I admitted. I wasn't good at consoling people. I really wasn't. Some people knew what to say in all types of situations, knew what words were needed, and they used them perfectly. Me? I usually just settled for an, I'm sorry. I wasn't good with words, even though I did want to do something for Zach. I just didn't know what. The big guy raised his shoulder. Give him some time. He suggested. Mr. Congeniality right here was trying to give me advice on what I should do? Did that mean I should do the opposite? Yeah, I guess I will, I said, before my conversation with Diana came back to me. Um, I'm going to El Paso for a few days this weekend. Remember I told you? I stabbed at a few pieces of pasta scattered around the plate. It's my mom's birthday. He shifted in his stool the side of his knee touching mine. Okay. There was no reason for me to feel awkward. None. If he said he'd go, great. If he didn't want to go, it wasn't a big deal. I was thinking, maybe you could come with me. I haven't told her we got married, and I would rather tell her in person than let her find out some other way. I fidgeted in my seat and slanted him a look out of the corner of my eye. Aiden simply forked some food into his mouth, chewing slowly. I scratched at my ear. If you want. Then I added, it's just for the weekend. Dumb, 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 dumb. Why had I even bothered saying anything? Aiden scratched at his jaw with the end of the fork in his hand. He twisted his lower body in his seat, his knee hitting the side of my leg again before he said, I'd need to be back Sunday night. I almost had to do a double take. Really? He shrugged down at his food, super casual, or at least as casual as someone his size could be. Honestly, I was surprised he could fit that butt onto one stool. I was even more surprised the stool's legs hadn't given out yet under his weight. Yeah. Was his reply. Oh, okay. I was planning on leaving Friday, it's an eight-hour drive. That had his face swinging to me, his expression going from blank to disturbed in a second flat. You want to drive there? I nodded. He stared at me for a second longer before reaching into his pocket, pulling out his black leather wallet, and then holding his silver credit card out in my direction. Buy two tickets and rent a car. I don't do long road trips. Did I know he didn't like riding in a car for longer than absolutely necessary? Yes, but I wanted to cross my eyes anyway. If I didn't have to do an eight-hour road trip, I wasn't going to, especially not if I wasn't paying for it. He couldn't be considered my sugar daddy if we were legally married, right? Shoving the thought aside, I hesitantly took the card from him. Are you sure? He didn't hold back his eye roll. Get an afternoon flight. They usually let us out around three. He eyeballed me from the side. Don't rent one of those tiny economy cars either, just to save money. 
Yeah, his bossiness was bringing back not the best of memories. I nodded anyway and held his card between my fingers. Is this supposed to be a test? I asked hesitantly. Back to being busy eating, it took him a second to answer before he turned to me with a furrow between those thick eyebrows. What are you talking about? Is this a test? I wiggled his credit card. To see if I'll spend your money or offer to pay for my own ticket. That full bottom lip of his dropped just a little, his eyelids hanging low. Then he shook his head slowly. So slowly, I knew he was exasperated. Or he thought I was a complete idiot. One or the other. Maybe both. Don't be dumb. I wouldn't offer to pay for the tickets if I didn't want to. You know me better than that. He had me there. I shrugged. Okay. All right. Sheesh. I just wanted to be sure, because if you want to pay for them, I'm not going to tell you no. Just buy the tickets and rent the car. He got up with his plate in hand and walked around to the sink before adding, Where are we staying? I was planning on staying at a hotel. Good. What are you going to tell your family? I scratched the back of my neck before picking up my food. Just my mom. I don't... My sisters don't need to know. Either way, no one's finding out the truth. They don't know I'm living with you. I figured... Shit. What? Was I expecting my mom to not remember who I worked for? Of course she remembered. Now, ten years ago, she didn't remember half the time that she'd given birth to me, and I relied on her. That was an easier truth to consider than the idea that she loved drinking more than she loved her kids. I needed to stop. I needed to stop five seconds ago. Everything in my life had worked out for the better. I had no reason to complain. My life was better than fine. Way better. With that reminder, I cleared my throat and pasted a playful tone to my words. If she asks, I'll just tell her I quit and you came after me. You realized how madly in love with me you were. Honest to God, he snorted. I put my hand on top of the table and extended my middle finger at him even though I smiled. And you can't live without me, so we eloped. I figured I should stick with at least a partial truth so it doesn't get too complicated. You got a problem with that? Aiden shook his head, the corners of his mouth pulled tight in a smirk that eased my soul a little more. Everything in my life had worked out. No. Jackass. I couldn't help but snicker. You'll take one for the team, then? So that can be the story we tell everyone who finds out? What team? He asked. You and me. Team Graves Mazur. We signed a contract together. Sort of. I smiled. That bearded chin dipped to his neck, and I could see his mouth twitching. All right, I'll take one for the team. It was five minutes before we were supposed to be leaving for the airport, and Aiden wasn't home yet. He hadn't answered the three times I'd called, and there was no way for him to know about the ten other times I'd picked up the phone but talked myself out of dialing. Where the hell was he? I'd been ready all morning. I'd even made him lunch so he could eat it on the way to the airport since I'd known he'd be hungry after watching game footage for a few hours before the players were dismissed for the week. But he wasn't home. He wasn't home. And we needed to leave. I was pacing. My bag was already by the front door, and if I didn't leave in five minutes, I would more than likely not make the flight. The abrupt ringing of my phone from its spot in my back pocket immediately snapped me out of my freakout. Sure enough, Miranda P. appeared on the screen, and a bad premonition pinched my gut. Hello? Vanessa? There was a noise in the background that sounded like someone laughing. I'm not going to make it. Disappointment, like I hadn't known in forever. If I let myself think about it, I would realize the last time had been back when he'd let Trevor talk about me, squeezed the base of my skull. I wanted to ask him why. 
I wanted to ask him why he'd waited so long to call, or why he hadn't at least texted me if he'd known he wasn't going to make it. But I couldn't make myself do it. Chest tight, head suddenly hurting, I asked, Are you okay? Even as anger fisted my fingers. Yes. Was his curt, distracted response. Okay? I swallowed hard and clenched my eyes closed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, that didn't help as much as it should have. I'm leaving the house then. I'll be back on Sunday. Leslie is coming into town. That's fine. Swam along my tongue, but I bit it back. It wasn't fine. I was pissed off at him for wasting my time and making plans for him to go along with me. I was mad at myself for expecting, for getting a little, tiny bit excited about him coming with me. I'd never taken anyone with me to El Paso before. That only made me angrier. I understand. I need to get my stuff in the car. I'll see you in a few days. He might have said bye, but he might have not. I didn't know because I hung up on his ass. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. What the hell had I been thinking? I knew the only person I should blame was myself. Why had I even bothered inviting him? I should have kept my mouth shut and not said anything. I'd made him food and wasted hours of my life stressing about having to explain to him my family situation. God, I was so, so stupid. What had made me think he would actually cut into his bye week to go somewhere with me when the last two bye weeks he'd stayed at home to train? I was an idiot. I ran up the stairs to my bedroom and yanked my checkbook out of my desk drawer. I wrote out a check for the cost of my plane ticket and the entire amount for the SUV rental I'd booked with him in mind. My soul wept a little. It was ten jobs worth of money. But I signed the damn check and eyed the Hello Kitty image printed on the background with a little grumble of my own. In less than a minute, I was down in the kitchen, slapping the stupid check on the counter and flipping it off while imagining it was Aiden's face before walking away. I threw my bag into the back seat of my Explorer a little more forcefully than I needed to and took off, hoping to catch my flight. I thought you were bringing a friend, my mom noted almost immediately after ushering me through the door. I blew out a breath and rolled my shoulders, pasting a tight smile on my face. I took in the tall, slim, and nearly blonde woman who I used to think was so beautiful when I was a little kid, and in her few and far between moments of being wonderful. Especially then. I'd loved the hell out of her before I knew better, and that thought made my heart ache for kid Vanessa, who hadn't known any better for a while. It was easy to forget someone so perfect looking had once been a functioning alcoholic. Then again, that's why she'd gone so long without anyone noticing she had a problem. Luckily, she was fine now, which was why I'd come so far for her birthday. On the flight over, I'd mentally prepared myself for this situation and what was the best way to handle it. We already had one idiot in the family, thanks to Susie. We didn't need another one. So I was going to play dumb and downplay it. He had something come up at the last minute. I explained vaguely, looking around the house I'd only been in a handful of times before. It was nice, really nice. Her husband of the last five years was a divorce attorney she'd met at AA. He seemed like a nice enough guy, and my little brother had spoken very highly of him. That's too bad, my mom said. I could sense her looking me over. You don't want to bring your bag inside? I made sure to meet her eyes before I answered. I didn't want to feel ashamed for not wanting to stay with her, and I wouldn't let myself be. If she really put her mind to it, she'd remember how shitty things went when I stayed with her. I checked into my hotel already. The truth was, I'd checked into my hotel the day before. Afterward, I'd gone to see my foster parents and had dinner there. I talked to my foster dad pretty often, 
in my case, once every few weeks was often, and told them I'd married Aiden. My foster dad had looked at me from across the table where I'd eaten dinner seven days a week for four years of my life, and asked in a serious voice, you couldn't have married someone who plays for Houston? I'd forgotten how much he hated the 300s. This morning, I'd had breakfast with my foster mom. But I didn't tell my mom about any of those things. Anytime I brought up my foster parents, this glazed look came over her eyes that I wasn't fond of. Oh, it was the sharp inhale before her smile that told me she understood enough. In that case, I'm glad you're here early. I smiled back at her, a small one, a half-assed one. Do you need help with anything for the party? We almost have everything together already. She trailed off, her features turning unnecessarily bright. Forced. This sudden feeling of dread put me on alert. Who helped? She named her husband. Slipping her arm over my shoulder, she pulled me into her side, kissing my forehead. I fought that tiny urge to pull away from her, and I knew. I fucking knew what she was going to say. And Susie and Ricky. My entire body went rigid. I swear even my knee started aching in recognition. My heart went double time. Vanessa? My mom said my name like it was made of eggshells. They've been staying with us. I didn't want to tell you because I was worried you wouldn't come. I wouldn't have. She had that right. She's your sister, Mom said, giving me a shake that wasn't distracting me from the fact I was going to have to count to a thousand so I wouldn't lose it. She's your sister, she repeated. Susie was a lot of things, and a fucking bitch was at the top of the list. Anxiety and a not insignificant amount of anger flooded my veins. How could she do this? Vanessa, please. Why would she try to ambush me like this? First it was Aiden, now it was my own mom ambushing me with Susie and her asshole. Be nice. For me, she insisted. I was going to end up at the liquor store before the day was over. I could already feel it. The urge to be mean gripped my tongue. I wanted to ask her about the hundreds of times she hadn't done something for me. I really did. On my best days, I was convinced I'd forgiven her for the days at a time she never came home. For making me resort to having to steal money from her purse to buy groceries because she'd forgotten, again, how there wasn't anything to eat at home for leaving me alone and forcing me to deal with three angry, mean older sisters who couldn't have cared any less about my little brother and me. But I couldn't get myself to go there. Regardless of how many years she'd been sober, I knew now that my mom hung by a thread. She had a problem, and she was dealing with it, even if it was twenty years too late to take back her mistakes. All I could do was grunt. I couldn't promise her anything. I really couldn't. No matter how badly I wanted to tell her, this could be the first time since we were kids that Susie and I wouldn't end up wanting to kill each other within minutes of being face to face. Good grief, that was sad. It seemed like we hadn't ever gotten along. And by that, I meant my slightly older sister, only by a year and a half, had singled me out and hated my guts for as long as I could remember. I'd taken a lot of shit from her for those first few years. She'd bullied the hell out of me. It had started off with her pinching me whenever our mom wasn't around, which was always, then progressed to name-calling, evolved to stealing the few things I had, and then ended with physical confrontations. She'd been an asshole forever. Then one day, when I was probably 14, I decided I was done taking her shit. Unfortunately, she kicked my ass, and I'd ended up in the emergency room with a broken arm after she'd pushed me down the stairs. It was that broken arm that had led Child Protective Services to our house, because our mom hadn't shown up to the hospital after she'd had people try to contact her. 
The five of us got split up after that night, and it was only at one other point, four years later, that I lived with my mom or sisters again. That hadn't ended well at all. It was a painful, miserable history I'd given up on a long time ago. I had accepted that there was something wrong with all of my sisters, but mainly Susie. As I got older, I realized that chances were high my mom had drank while she'd been pregnant with them. They were all small, unlike my little brother and me, and had learning and behavioral problems. While I accepted now that they couldn't help most of the things that were wrong with them, it didn't help ease my resentment much. For the sake of my relationship with my mom, we avoided bringing Susie up, and she only briefly mentioned my other two sisters once a year. Until shit like this. I seriously couldn't believe Susie and Ricky were staying there and that no one had warned me. Diana was going to lose it when I told her. Vanessa, please. I'm so happy you're here. I've missed you. You never come visit enough. My mom laid the guilt trip road down for me thick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There was nothing in this world I couldn't do, I reminded myself. Everything in my life had worked out. I had more than I'd ever imagined. The past didn't matter anymore. With a deep breath, I forced out an, okay, gritting my teeth the entire time. Yes, she asked, beaming with hope. I nodded, urging my muscles to stop locking up. I knew what I was going to say was an asshole comment. I realized I was being immature, but I really couldn't find it in my soul to care. Yeah, I'll play nice as long as she does. The sigh she let out. Yeah, she knew. She knew Susie didn't know how to be nice. 15. I can't believe it. Believe it, I snarled as I tried to shake off my anger for about the millionth time in the last day. Diana scoffed as she moved around me, a stained plastic bowl in one hand, a brush in the other. Her brown eyes temporarily shifted from the section of my head she'd already put color on to meet my gaze before she blew a raspberry. You know I don't want to talk about your family, but when I think they can't get any shittier, they do. Liar. She didn't mind going over the finer defects of four-sixths of my family. How many times had we sat in her room and acted out the hundreds of things we'd do and say to my sisters in retaliation for whatever they'd put me through? A hundred? Not that we'd ever gone through with any of it. They were older than us, and you didn't mess with crazy. The worst part was after Ricky grabbed my arm, no one said anything. They all wanted to act like nothing had happened. Jesus, V, my best friend muttered. I told you not to go. She had, and I'd been stubborn and didn't listen. I know. Her hand touched my shoulder. I'm sorry. Not as sorry as I was. I made it three hours at my mom's before everything went to hell. Three hours before I stormed out of her house, pissed out of my mind. I was honestly surprised that I had managed to spend the night at my hotel before heading to the airport first thing in the morning to catch a flight back to Dallas on standby. The anger hadn't abated as much as I'd hoped on a good night's sleep, and the flight back hadn't helped much either. As soon as I landed, I'd texted one of the only people in the world who was loyal to me, and then headed over to Diana's so I could tell her everything and get it off my chest. Did it help? Not much, but it was something. So I told her everything that had happened as she dyed my hair some surprise color I told her she could choose. It was one of the benefits of being your own boss. Wait, so you didn't tell me what happened with Aiden, she finally noted. Good grief. There I went getting pissed off all over again. 
At least that was one issue I'd managed to set aside for a while since the day before. But all of a sudden, it was another fresh wound to add to my already existing one. He called and canceled on me at the last minute. She winced, her, ooh, just barely audible. Yeah, I mumbled as her boob passed about an inch from my face. His old coach was coming into town or something, and he was busy watching game film or something with the team when he called, but it doesn't matter. It was a stupid idea to invite him anyway. I'm sure he had a good reason to cancel, Di tried to assure me. There was only one reason, and it was the most important one to him. I didn't need the details to know what the exact wording would be. Yeah, I'm sure he did. I let out a shaky breath. I'm just in a shitty mood. Sorry. No, I can't believe it, this smartass gasped. I reached forward and tried to pinch her through the apron she'd put on, but she danced out of the way with a big grin on her face. Leave me alone. She stuck her tongue out. Put your potato head down for a second, would you? I mocked her as I did what she asked. Diana took a step toward me, her belly inches away. She must have reached forward because her shirt went up an inch, exposing a sliver of skin. I frowned. Reaching from under the hem of the cape she'd put on me, I pulled her shirt up even higher, exposing a row of small bruises shaped like a smaller version of the ones on my forearm. What are you doing? She took a step away. I looked up at her, at her face, her neck, her arms, and saw nothing that shouldn't have been there. What? Her tone was a lot less harsh the second time. But I knew, I knew from the way she rubbed her pant leg that something was going on. That was her nervous tick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I had to count to ten again before I could manage to not lose it. What happened? I asked her as coolly and calmly as possible, even though I was already on my way to becoming even angrier than I'd been when I first showed up. Diana tried to brush it off a little too quickly. Nothing. Why? She had the nerve to look down and pull up her shirt in the same way I had. She even frowned as she touched the bruises I'd bet my firstborn she knew damn well about. Where did those come from? She didn't look up as she answered. I remember hitting my hip. You hit your hip? She was lying. She was damn well lying out of her ass. On the counter. On the counter? I asked slowly. This felt like a terrible dream. My best friend, my best friend of my entire life, lied again. Yeah, she insisted. Die. I wasn't going to lose it. I wasn't going to lose it in front of her. Let me finish putting this on your hair. She cut me off. Diana, tip your head down one more time, Vinny. Die. I grabbed the hand she had extended toward me. Her brown eyes shot to mine, her expression startled. Did Jeremy do that? No. A knot formed in my throat, growing bigger and bigger by the second. Diana Fernanda Casillas. Yeah, I went with her whole name. My hand shook. Did Jeremy do that? This fucking liar supreme met my gaze evenly, and if it weren't for her palm hitting her pant leg again, I would have believed she was telling me the truth, that this person I loved, who I would do anything for, and who I felt would do anything for me, wouldn't lie to me. I wasn't even about to focus on the fact that I'd kept things to myself in the past, that I hadn't told her I'd married Aiden, that she didn't know about my student debts, None of that figured into my thoughts in that instant. No, Van, he loves me. I hit my hip. That knot in my throat swelled, and I could feel my eyes well up as her gaze met mine unflinchingly. That was the problem. Diana was just like me. Once she was in too deep, she wasn't about to dig herself out of the hole she was in. 
she wasn't about to back down and tell me the truth. I'm fine, Van, I swear. She swore. The tingling in my nose got worse. Die, I kind of croaked out. The smile that took over her mouth hurt me. <laughs> I hit my hip, stupid, I promise. I didn't think Diana would ever know how badly she was hurting me. I'd like to think the lies I'd told her had been to protect her, so she wouldn't worry about me being in disastrous debt. And I hadn't told her Aiden and I eloped because she had a big mouth and she'd tell everyone. I knew she'd grudgingly understand that after she was done being mad for not being the first person I told. She didn't know how to keep a secret. We all knew it. But this... I didn't have it in me to keep my mouth shut, even though I knew there was no way in hell she was going to backtrack and admit the truth. Tightening my hold on her, I tried to ignore the severe beating of my heart and made sure her eyes met mine. Die. She was lying. She was being a massive liar as she said, it's just a bruise, Van. But it wasn't. It wasn't. It was the conservative sedan parked in the driveway when I got home that told me we had a visitor. Leslie. Oh, Leslie. The one person in the world who I actually liked, but every once in a while, specifically this weekend and every June 15th, made me just a teensy bit jealous. Leslie was the only person in the world who I could honestly say Aiden cared about, and I guess I was just a greedy, selfish asshole. I couldn't even get a happy birthday on my special day, while Aiden didn't just remember Leslie's birthday, but he cared enough to get me to send him a present. Was I seriously complaining about Aiden caring about someone who wasn't me? I was in a bad mood, a worse mood than I'd been in when I'd first gotten back to Dallas five hours ago. Hell, I'd been in a bad mood since I left for El Paso. All I wanted to do was get home, stew in my anger, and maybe watch a movie to get my mind off all the things that were bothering me. My mom, Susie, her husband, Ricky, Diana, her boyfriend, and Aiden. I wanted to be alone. Parking on the street, I grabbed my suitcase from the back seat, ignoring the pain radiating from my wrist and trudged up the driveway, then the path. I counted to ten over and over again as I unlocked the door and slipped inside as quietly as possible. Vanessa? I was halfway up the stairs, with my suitcase gripped in hand, when Aiden's voice reached me from the foot of them. Slowly lowering my bag to the step I was on, I ground down on my molars and glanced over my shoulder at the man who had stood me up, standing there in between the living room and the foyer in his sweatpants and a tank so loose I could see the ripped sides of some of the sexiest muscles in the universe. Did I love sexy lateral muscles? Of course. I had ovaries. But I also had a brain, a heart, and some pride, and huge brawny arms on someone who left me hanging weren't going to make me forget a single thing. Things might have gone worse if he'd been there. I tried to remind myself as I tugged at the sleeve of the hoodie I'd put on before leaving Diana's, drawing it farther down my arm. But the other half of my brain wanted to believe that maybe the weekend would have gone differently if Aiden had been there. Then again, maybe I just wanted to blame someone other than myself for not listening to my instincts when they told me to do something, and then I did otherwise. Yes, I asked, sensing my cheeks go tight. The big guy was examining me. Something about the way he was pursing his lips said he was hesitating. Leslie's here. The words were barely out of his mouth when a white head of hair peeked out from the living room. Nearly as tall as Aiden, and way more fit than any man who should have been considered elderly could be, Leslie Prescott flashed those perfect white veneers at me. Hello, Vanessa. A sharp pain thudded right between my eyebrows unexpectedly. I set my suitcase down in place and smiled at the man I'd met in the past. 
We'd spent months together in Colorado on two separate occasions, and he'd visited Aiden the rest of the times. I liked him. I really did like him, but I was in a shitty mood, and it wasn't fair to take it out on him. Hi, Leslie, I pretty much muttered as I jogged down the steps and held out my hand. He shook it, flashing me an open, easy smile. Congratulations, he said, shaking my hand. I heard the big news. Leslie's other hand came forth to clasp mine between both of his, his smile growing bigger by the second. If he thought it was strange that I didn't give Aiden a hug or a kiss when I got home, it wasn't evident on his features. I'm a bit hurt I wasn't invited, but I understand. Oh, thanks. I gave him a tired smile, pointedly ignoring the big body standing in my peripheral vision, watching on. I couldn't be happier for you two. I was disappointed you were out of town this weekend, but I'm sure we'll have more time to see each other in the future. I forced myself to keep the smile on my face. Aiden and I had nearly five years left together. I was positive I'd see Leslie again at some point. I'm sure we will. Leslie beamed. We finished watching some footage, so I'll get out of your hair to give you both some alone time tonight, eh? The tender, amused look that came over Aiden's face more than slightly irritated me. Eh? Hey. I... Then the fact that his Canadian had snuck up on him, when it only came up in the times he was really comfortable, made my little girl immaturity that much worse. I'll leave you two to it. I have some work I need to catch up on. I focused on Leslie as I talked. The older man nodded. Sure, sure, I understand. If you'll excuse me, I need to make a pit stop before I go. He smiled again easing the tension in me just slightly. He hadn't done anything wrong, and I was being an asshole. You'll be by tomorrow? Hey, my flight leaves the day after. I have to get back home. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Drive safe. Leslie agreed, and then made his way toward the half-bath around the corner. That was my cue to get the heck out of there. Grabbing my bag with my good hand, I managed to make it halfway up the staircase before I heard, You all right? I didn't bother stopping. I kept going up. I'm fine. Vanessa. His voice was low, careful. Look at me. 180% ready to be in my room, I stopped and turned around, raising my eyebrows at the figure standing at the bottom of the staircase with one palm on the handrail. He had that dark gaze narrowed on me. When you say you're fine, I know you're not. Hmm, was the only thing I could manage to get out without saying something really bitchy. I tried to tell myself it wasn't a big deal. He hadn't gone with me. I'd told myself that at least a dozen times over the weekend. I also told myself I understood that he'd stayed to see someone he cared about. But it didn't help, and it didn't work. My damn pride couldn't handle being stood up and let down by not just him, but by everyone this weekend. That's what I thought. Aiden stated as he tipped his chin up at me almost defiantly. I squeezed my fingers around the handrail, envisioning it was his neck I was wringing. Yeah, I guess so, I admitted with a sniff. I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to bed. I barely managed to turn around when Aiden's raspy, low voice spoke up. I don't care if you don't want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. He said in that authoritative, demanding voice that scratched at my nerves. It wasn't a loud voice by any measure, but it didn't need to be. Rolling my eyes, I shook my head as he continued his bullshit explanation. Leslie called, said he was in San Antonio, and asked if he could drop by for a few days. Coach wanted to go through some more footage before I left, and I lost track of time. And he kept going. I figured you of all people would understand. I don't get what the big deal is. For one moment, I thought about picking up my suitcase and throwing it at him. Immature, sure. Unnecessary, yes. 
but it would have made me feel better. Instead, I counted to seven, and while looking at the stairs, I said to him, I do understand. Aiden, I get it. Your job is the most important thing in your life, and I'm fully aware of how much Leslie means to you. I know that, and I've always known that. Yet you're still mad. There wasn't a point in even lying, was there? Setting my luggage on the stair ahead of me, I turned back around to face that dark head of hair and tanned face I'd seen more of when I worked for him than I did now that I lived with him. I'm not mad, Aiden, I'm just... Look, I'm in a terrible mood. Maybe now isn't the time to talk, all right? No. His back straightened, and he took his hand off the handrail. I stayed to watch footage with the staff and see less. He stated, a furrow between his eyebrows. I understand why you stayed. I'm not telling you I don't. I'm frustrated over this entire fucking useless weekend, and I don't want to take it out on you. That was a lie. I sort of did. Can we please stop talking about this? I knew what his reply was going to be before it came out of his mouth. Nope. He didn't fail me. I didn't do anything for you to be mad over. Heaven help me. Heaven fucking help me. My fingers went up to press over the top of my eyebrows, as if that would keep my headache at bay. I hissed, Aiden, just let it go. The man never let anything go. Why would this moment be any different? No, I want to talk about it. I didn't go with you to your mom's house. I'll go next time. The problem with some people was that they didn't understand the principle of things. The other thing with people was that some guys didn't understand when to let shit go, so they kept pushing and pushing and pushing until you just said, fuck it. That was exactly what Aiden did to me then. The pain in my head got even worse. I invited you so you could meet my mom and my foster parents. And stupid me, I got disappointed when you bailed on me at the last freaking moment. In hindsight, that sounded a lot more melodramatic than it needed to. The fact that my mom had knowingly lied to me had been bad enough. Susie going into psycho mode had definitely made things worse. Diana's lies only magnified every ruthless, hurt emotion in me, but I didn't tell him any of that. Every piece of anger in me had been sprouted from the seeds Aiden's absence had left. I had to. He stated in that cool, crisp tone that said he definitely didn't understand why I was so upset about it. Sighing, I pulled my hand away from my face and shook it off. Forget it, Aiden. I don't understand why you're so pissed off. He snapped. Because I thought we were getting to be friends and you couldn't even bother to remember to tell me until the last minute you weren't going with me. Do you have any idea how unimportant that makes me feel? I snapped back. Some strange emotion flickered in his dark eyes, the long length of his face loosening for a second before the normal, bland expression took over his face. I stayed for a good reason. I get it. I know your priorities. I know where we stand. I know what this is and what it isn't. I'll try to adjust my expectations from now on. I cut him off, completely over this stupid conversation. Aiden's dark pink mouth had been open, but at my comment, he slammed it closed. His forehead creased, and that pouty mouth that belonged on a woman with some kind of cosmetic enhancement went tight at the corners. He blinked those long brown eyelashes as his forehead scrunched. He was at a loss for words. Words that could have gone along the lines of, we are friends, or I'm sorry. Instead, I got nothing. No excuse, no promise, nada. So frustrated, so freaking frustrated, I held back the eye roll tempting me by the second and plastered a tight, completely fake smile on my face. I'm really tired, and my arm hurt. Good night. Two steps up the staircase later, I heard, It isn't that big of a deal. Why? Why me? Why couldn't he just drop this before I decided to slit his throat in his sleep? 
Forget I even said anything. I tossed over my shoulder for his sake and mine. God, I was being bitchy, but I couldn't find it in me to care too much. Aiden snickered loudly. I don't understand why you think it's such a big deal. I'm not asking you to pay me back for the airline ticket or the rental car. I'm sure I can meet your family another day. It isn't like we don't have time. We've got five years, Vanessa. I don't want to spend them with you being pissed at me the entire time. You knew what you were getting yourself into. Trust me, I haven't forgotten for a second how long we're in this for. I pulled my suitcase up another step, angrily. When I didn't say anything else, he took it upon himself to continue. What the hell is your problem? I turned completely around to face him, my hands going instinctively to my hips. I already told you what my problem is. I'm in a shit mood, and you left me hanging, and that bothers me way more than it should. I know that. But I know I should have known better. He scoffed. He scoffed so hard his nostrils flared and he shook his head his eyes going everywhere except at me. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I felt my blood rush away from my face, but I'd be damned if I walked back up to my room now. Sometimes facial features said so much more than words could, and I hoped the smart-ass smile I was giving him said exactly what I wanted it to say. Fuck you. A sharp noise that could have been mistaken for a bitter laugh exploded out of Aiden's mouth. (sighs) I'm not paying off your loans and buying you a house to have to put up with this van. If I wanted someone to nag at me, I would have gotten a real wife. Oh, hell no. Every drop of blood in my upper body went south. Ugly, hurtful words pinched my throat and I couldn't talk. I couldn't think. I couldn't even breathe. I didn't have to take this shit. Standing there on the step, I nodded, my hands shaking. You know what? You're right. You're completely right. I'm sorry I opened my fucking mouth. I'm sorry I gave a shit and started looking forward to you coming along with me. And I was sorry I was blaming him for starting off a chain of events that spiraled downhill. I really was being a wee bit of an asshole, but I couldn't muster up enough fucks to give in that moment to let the situation go. Clenching my hands together, I jogged up the steps with my suitcase in my bad hand and slammed the door shut behind me once I was in the room. I wasn't sure how long I stood there, staring around me at what suddenly felt like a five-year prison sentence. If we weren't already married, I'd pack my stuff up and leave but I'd signed the papers and made a promise to him. Five years. I won't go anywhere until you're a resident. I promise. That was the difference between Aiden and me, though. I actually kept my word. Dropping my bag on the floor, I scrubbed at my cheeks with my hands, trying to calm down. My eyes felt oddly dry. This hole the size of Crater Lake took residence where the important parts of my soul used to be. I wasn't going to cry. I wasn't going to fucking cry. I bent down to unzip my suitcase and took all the clothing out to wash later when the wall of asswipe wasn't hanging around. That knot in my throat I'd gotten back at Diana's seemed to swell back to its original size. I wasn't going to cry. I wasn't going to cry even if the urge to was more overwhelming than it had ever been. I was in the middle of sliding my suitcase beneath the bed a little more forcefully than was necessary when a knock rapped at my door. Two taps, too low to be Aiden. Controlling the anger and the not tears creeping around in my eyeballs, I called out, Yes? Van? It was Zach. Yes? Can I come in? Taking off my glasses, I rubbed at my eyebrow bone for a moment with the meaty part of my palm and let out a shuddering breath. Of course, come in. Sure enough, Zack opened the door and slid inside my room, a funny, wary smile on his face as he closed it behind him. Hi, darling. He said in an almost delicate voice, I gave him an equally wary smile, trying
trying to suppress my aggravation with the guy downstairs, with my family back in El Paso, and with the idiot known as my best friend in Fort Worth. I played with the sleeve of my hoodie again to make sure it was down to my wrist. Hey. I like your hair. Thanks. I probably would have liked the teal color a lot more than I did in any other circumstance, but I was so pissed and disheartened, I couldn't find it in me to care. My hair was now like something straight out of Candyland. You all right? He asked, moving to take a seat on the edge of my bed, just a couple feet away from where I was kneeling. Reluctantly, I kicked my luggage the rest of the way under the bed frame and got to my feet. Yeah. You sure? Shit. You heard all that, huh? I heard. He confirmed, with a blink of those wonderful blue eyes. Of course he had. I'd been pretty much yelling toward the end. He gets on my nerves so easily sometimes, I don't understand. I took a seat right next to him with a sigh. I know. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. I know. Then he gets mad when someone is disappointed in him. I grumbled at the floor. I know. Zack agreed again. I didn't beg him to go with me. I just mentioned it. I would have been fine if he'd said he was too busy. I know. Why is he such a pain in the ass? In my peripheral vision, Zack held out his hands. The world will never know, darling. I snorted and shifted my gaze over to him, finally. No, probably not. I nudged his elbow. You wouldn't have backed out on me, would you? No way. He nudged me back with his thigh, drawing my attention down to the reindeer print pajamas he had on. Bad trip home? I hadn't told him much about my family situation in the time we'd known each other. Besides a few casual mentions of how I wasn't close to my mom, how much of a pain in the ass my sisters were, and possibly bringing up my foster parents in passing once or twice, I'd never gone into too much detail with Zach. But he knew enough. Drawing my gaze up, it settled on the stubble he'd let himself grow out over the course of some time. He usually shaved that baby face every day. Light blue circles were nestled under his eyes, and his cheeks looked hollower than they had two weeks ago, making me feel like a self-centered asshole. Some people had real things to worry about, and here I was losing it over people who didn't care about me. Yes, that was an understatement. I shook my head, bottling up the argument with Susie and her husband for the time being. It sucked. A lot. Zack fed me a pity smile that I ate up. Why do you think I haven't gone back home? Ah, hell. I hear ya. Tilting my head to look at him, I took him in. I've been worried about you, you know. He made a dismissive noise in his throat. Eh, I'll be fine. How many times had I said those exact same words to myself when it felt like the world was falling apart on me? Reaching over, I put my hand on his thigh. Of course you're going to be, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to worry or wonder what you're going to do. That sandy head dropped back, and his sigh seemed to fill my room. I don't fucking know, Vanny. He admitted to me in a tired voice. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Maybe I couldn't fix the situations with Aiden, my sister, and Diana, but I could try to help Zach as much as possible now that he finally wanted to talk about it. Do you still want to play? He chuffed. Of course. That was easy enough. Then you know what you're going to do. You're going to start training again, and you're going to get your agent to find you another team to join. Maybe not this season, but at least next. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Don't give yourself another option, I told him. What about that? Zach's sock-covered toes tapped against the floor, and the sound of his steady puffing told me he was there. His hand came to rest over mine, and I elongated my fingers upward to link through his. Maybe things won't work out, but maybe they will. 
You'll never know unless you try. And if you don't try, you'll probably end up an old geezer wondering what would have happened if you hadn't given up. I warned him before letting go of his hand and reaching around to give him a one-armed hug. That had him snickering. You're okay on money? I wasn't rich by some standards, but I had my savings still, and I was proud of how much I'd set aside all on my own. I'm okay, he assured me. I figured he was. He wasn't extravagant. If you decide to stay, I'll even let you run this marathon in February with me if you're a good boy, I added, pulling him into my side for another side hug. His back stiffened. You're going to run a marathon? Why do you think I've been running? Because you're bored? I'd done more research on the training process that was suggested for people running their first marathon, and I couldn't see anyone doing it because they were bored. No, I just want to do it. I haven't had time to train for one before, and I like the idea of it being a challenge. Plus, I wanted to prove something to myself. Do something for my poor knee. I wanted to remind it that it could do whatever it wanted to. That it wasn't anyone's bitch. I wanted to know that nothing was impossible, and to give my sister a big fuck you for what she had done to me. I leaned into his side and let out a shaky breath, suddenly feeling overwhelmed over the entire weekend. Are you in or what? The long Texan let out a deep sigh. What? You're going to be a loser and back out? His face angled slightly toward me, the corner of his mouth hooking up. What do I get out of it? The same thing I do. Personal satisfaction that you did something you couldn't do before. The smile that came across Zach's face wiped out any lingering resentment I had right then over Aiden's behavior, at least. Those blue eyes twinkled, and he radiated something awesome. You are just a ray of sunshine, aren't you, darling? Do something you couldn't do before. Well, fuck it. Count me into this trial of terror. Yeah, I might have squealed, surprised he'd actually taken up my offer. Really? Yes, really. Just like that, his smile drooped a little. How many miles is a marathon again? I winced, not wanting to kill our agreement before it even got started. You don't want to know, Zach. Sliding my arm off, I gave the middle of his back a solid pat. You don't want to know. Fuck me, huh? Basically. He grinned, and I grinned right back at him. Are you going to be okay? I nodded. I'm always going to be okay. An hour or two later, I was lying in bed with one of my favorite movies on, the volume on ultra low. I had the captions on. When three soft knocks tapped on my door. Three. It was Aiden. After a moment, three more low, low knocks hit the door. I kept my mouth shut and went right on watching Independence Day. He could take his real wife and shove her up his ass. 16. You're up early, I noted dryly as Zach dragged his feet behind him into the kitchen. The big Texan raised two sleepy eyebrows in my direction. If I didn't know any better, the expression on his face would lead me to think he was drunk, but he was just really tired. Mm hmm Okay. Someone wasn't in the mood to talk, and that was fine by me. It wasn't like I'd woken up in a fantastic state of mind. It didn't help that the first thing I did after I was awake was call Diana's brother so I could tell him about what I'd seen the day before, only for him to let me know that one of his sons had already told him about the bruises a couple days ago. I tried talking to her, but she said she hit her hip. He'd explained. So she was keeping her story straight. I still didn't believe it. I don't believe her. Her brother had made a hesitant sound that left a bad taste in my mouth. I don't know, Van. I don't like that douche as much as you don't, but I don't think Dee would lie about it. 
that was the problem with growing up in a family that was usually honest and open with each other. You didn't know the length someone would go to hide something shameful. And I knew right then that unless Diana blatantly told her brother that Jeremy was getting physical, or unless she ended up with a black eye, he wouldn't assume the worst. The conversation had been pointless, only adding to the aggravation simmering under my veins for days. I was perfectly fine admitting to myself that when I hadn't been tossing and turning last night, I'd been wide awake, thinking about all the things I shouldn't. All the things I knew better than to let bother me, but it was impossible to ignore them when they'd all hit me so hard. One after another, nip, nip, nipping away at my resolve. Aiden, my mom, Susie, Diana, my technically husband, my mom, my sister, though I still wanted DNA reports to confirm that connection, my best friend of my entire life. Was there anyone in this world I could trust, I could rely on? Only myself, it felt like sometimes. You would figure I'd know better by now. The sound of weights clinking together in the gym down the hall had me scowling. Someone had already been busy working out by the time I'd come down the stairs. While most athletes took their bye week off to vacation or spend time with their families, the big guy didn't. Hadn't. I should have known better. By the time I was done talking myself into pushing thoughts of them away, Zach had nuked some oatmeal in the microwave and dumped a cup full of toppings on it, taking a seat opposite mine at the breakfast nook. A part of a puzzle Aiden was working on decorated the middle of the table. Zach and I happened to glance at each other at the same time, and we smiled at one another. His, a tired one, and mine, an aggravated, but I'm trying not to be, one. My tablet sat next to my bowl of cereal. I had been absently flipping through page after page of a website that sold t-shirt designs from freelance artists. I'd sold some of my work on there in the past, and I was looking to see if any designs gave me ideas to work on today, unless I got an unexpected last-minute request. The doorbell ringing once, not long enough to be annoying, but not too short to be ignored, had me getting to my feet. I got it. The face on the other side of the peephole had me smiling, a little. Leslie didn't deserve my bitch face when I only saw him a couple times a year. Good morning, I greeted as I opened the door. Wonderful morning to you, Vanessa. Leslie smiled back. After you. A gentleman. That had me genuinely smiling as I stepped back and let him in, watching as he closed the door. How are you? My chest gave a dull throb in response. I'm okay, I answered about as honestly as I could. And you? The expression on his face caught me off guard completely. It was like he was surprised I told him the truth. Or maybe he wasn't at all surprised I wasn't fine and was just acknowledging that I'd been honest with him. I'm alive. I can't ask for more. That had me sniffing in near indignation. I could be mopey every once in a while if I wanted. That sounded pathetic even in my own head. Letting out a slow, controlled breath, I nodded at the older man. Good point. I gestured with my head toward the gym. Aiden's working out. Would you like something to drink? Do you have any coffee? I was the only coffee drinker in the house. I'll make some right now. With his hands behind his back, he dipped his chin in thanks. I appreciate it. I'm going to check up on Aiden. Leslie peeked into the kitchen and raised his hand, giving Zach a no-tooth smile. Morning, Zach. I headed into the kitchen as Leslie went to the gym and scooped out the pre-ground coffee beans into the coffee maker, hitting the button to start the brew. By the time I made it back to my seat, Zach was scraping the sides of his bowl, looking way more awake than he had half an hour ago. You feeling better? He asked. Not really. Was I that obvious? I lifted a shoulder. What are you doing today? Gonna work out. 
I held out my fist for him to bump, and he only slightly shook his head as his fist connected with mine. You want to go for a run today? To give him credit, he tried to control his facial features so that they didn't resemble a grimace. Sure. Don't sound so excited, I laughed. Zach grinned immediately. I'm fooling you, Vanny. What time do you want to go? Is four okay? He nodded. I'll be back by then. I held up my hand again, and he fist bumped it. I'm gonna get dressed so I can get out of here. Zach said, already pushing his chair back. We agreed to see each other later, and after rinsing off his plate and sticking it in the dishwasher, he disappeared up the stairs. With the intention of finishing looking through the rest of the current posts on the website I still had up on my tablet, I made it through one more page before Leslie appeared. Ah, thank you for making this, he said once he was at the coffee maker, pulling out a cup from the correct cabinet without needing direction. Oh, you're welcome. I put my tablet to sleep, figuring I didn't have much time before Aiden appeared. I wasn't in the mood to deal with his crap right then. Just thinking his name had my blood boiling. A real wife. Fucking asshole. I'm sorry for dropping by so early. Leslie chimed in from his spot at the counter, pouring coffee. That had me snapping out of cursing Aiden in my head. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Uh, it isn't okay. I felt terrible after Aiden told me you were going home. Home. What a word to use for El Paso. I didn't mean to take up your time alone. I remember what it was like to be a newlywed. The man who had put into motion Aiden's future said, Newlyweds. I wanted to puke. It really is okay. I know how much you mean to him. Or at least I had a good idea of how much the older man meant to him. Aiden had two friends he kept in touch with semi-regularly. He saw them in person maybe once a year. Other than them, there was only Leslie. Leslie, who had been his coach in high school. Leslie, who Aiden had said repeatedly had groomed him and pushed him to succeed. In the 12 years since he'd graduated high school, they still saw each other often enough. Leslie continued to train Aiden in Colorado when the season was over. Then there were the other times that the former coach came by to visit. If that wasn't its own form of love and respect, at least in Aiden's case, I had no idea what was. My comment, though, had him chuckling. Only because he knows how much he means to me. As bitter as I felt, I couldn't help but soften a little as Leslie walked around the island with his cup in hand. His eyes strayed to the table, a smile coming over his face. He's still doing those. He gestured toward the puzzle. All the time, especially when he's stressed. Leslie's smile grew even wider, turning wistful. He used to do them with his grandparents. I can't remember there ever not being a puzzle at their home. He snickered softly. You know, uh, after his grandmother died, he, he didn't speak to me for almost a year. Uh, what? His grandmother? I can't tell you how many times I tried calling him, left him voicemails. I even went to several of his games at Wisconsin to see him, but he went out of his way to avoid me. It damn near broke my heart. He took the seat that Zack had just left. His white eyebrows rose as he looked at me from over the top of his cup. That's between you and me, eh? He's still sensitive about that time period. Aiden? Sensitive? When his grandfather died, he was devastated. But when Constance, his grandmother, passed away... I've never seen anyone so distraught. He loved that woman like you couldn't imagine. He doted on her. She told me he called her every day after he went away to school. He continued on like this wasn't the greatest secret I'd ever heard. There was no way I could pull off being casual about what he was saying. 
Plus, I had a feeling that the second he really looked at my facial expressions, he'd know damn well I had no clue about anything relating to his grandmother and grandfather. And because I was tired of being lied to so much over the course of the last few days, I went with being honest with this man who had never been anything but kind to me. I didn't... He's never even mentioned his grandparents to me before. He doesn't like to talk about things, I admitted, messing with the leg of my glasses. Leslie set his cup on the table and gave me a little shake of his head. That shouldn't surprise me. Of course it shouldn't. Between us. He tipped his forehead forward. He's the most remarkable man I've ever met, Vanessa. I've told him that before a hundred times, but he doesn't listen. He doesn't believe, and I'm not sure he cares. When I first met him, I couldn't get a single sentence out of him. One sentence. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I nodded, because yes, yes, I could imagine that. If I would have asked him to try out for the football team on any other day than the one I did, he never would have agreed. His grandfather was alive back then, you know, Aiden was already living with them. He had gotten in trouble with the lacrosse coach again the day before for fighting with his teammates, and his grandfather had told him something, he's never told me what, that got him to agree to try out. It took me four months to get him to really talk to me, and I was persistent. Even then, the only reason why he did was because his grandfather had a heart attack and... I had this feeling he needed someone to talk to. Leslie let out a sigh at whatever memory was bouncing around in his head. <sighs> you can't live your life bottling everything up. You need people, even if it's only one or two, to believe in you. And as smart as that boy is, he doesn't understand that. At some point, I'd planted my elbows on the table and set my chin in my hands, caught up in every detail he was telling me. Did you know his grandparents well? His grandfather was my best friend. I've known Aiden since he was in diapers. Leslie's mouth twitched. He was the fattest baby I have ever seen. <laughs> I remember looking at his eyes and knowing he was sharp. Always so serious, so quiet. But who could blame him, his parents? I had about a million more questions I wanted to ask, but didn't know how to. He's a good man, Vanessa. A great one. He'll open up to you in time. I'm sure of it. Leslie added. He used to say he would never marry. But I knew all it was going to take was him finding the right girl to convince him otherwise. Even mountains change over time. And that had me feeling like a schmuck. Like a giant, fake schmuck. It messed with my head. I wasn't his real wife. He didn't love me. This was all a charade. The knot from the night before swelled in my throat again, leaving me unable to speak for a moment while I tried to collect my thoughts. I know he's a good man. I finally managed to get out with a tremulous smile that felt way too transparent. And hopefully we have a long time ahead of us, I added even more weakly. The way Leslie's features lit up made my stomach roll. I was a fluke, a con woman, Imaginary. I was what I made myself to be. Is he almost done? I forced myself to ask as I snuck my hands under the table and clenched them. Almost. He should be... Oh, here he is. Were you eavesdropping on us? Leslie joked. I pushed my chair back, trying to school my emotions, my face, and my body all to behave and get through these next couple of minutes until I could disappear to my room. Before I could even make it to the island, the big guy was in the kitchen, heading to the sink. No. Those brown and caramel irises were on me. Rinsing off my bowl, 
I set it in the sink as I faintly listened to Leslie and Aiden discuss his workout. I ignored the way his shirt clung to his sweaty chest, ignored the way he kept glancing at me. Regardless of what Leslie had said, I wasn't in the mood to deal with him, even if he'd loved the hell out of his grandparents. Somehow, I managed to paste something similar to a grin on my face as I walked right by Aiden, purposely letting my shoulder brush his arm, because I was positive Leslie was watching. I have a lot of work to do. I'll be upstairs if you need me, I said more to the older man than to the one I was married to. Only Leslie responded, which was fine. It was totally fine, I assured myself as I climbed the stairs. Aiden could be pissed at me all he wanted. I was mad at him. I had just gotten to the top when my phone started ringing. Closing the door behind me, because anyone who would be calling me right then was not going to be on my list of people I'd want to talk to, I picked up my cell from where I'd left it on the nightstand. Mom flashed across the smooth screen. To give myself credit, I didn't flip the phone off, curse, or even think about not taking the call. I was going to take the damn call because I wasn't petty. Because I had nothing to feel bad about. I just didn't want to talk to her. Now or anytime soon. That was all. Hello? Hi, baby. Okay, that had me rolling my eyes. Hi. I've been so worried about you, she started off. Was that why she'd waited almost two days to call? Because she was so worried? Damn it, I was being a bitch. I'm fine, I let her know in a dull tone. You didn't have to leave like that. There was only so much a person could handle, and I was at my tipping point. I'd been at my tipping point, and it was all my fault. If I hadn't ignored my instincts and gone to El Paso, this could have been prevented. I'd been the idiot. Then I'd given everyone else the ability to piss me off. You, I love you both. I know you do. Once upon a time, when I was a lot younger and a lot more immature, it had killed me that she loved us equally. I wasn't a borderline psychopath like Susie. I hadn't been able to understand how she didn't take my side each time there was an issue. But now that I was older, I realized there was no way I could ever ask that of her. It was just one of those things. On a bitchy day, I thought broken things couldn't help but love other broken things. I might not be flawless, and I might have hairline fractures all over the place, but I'd sworn to myself a long, long time ago that I wouldn't be like either of them. It was a terrible, shitty thought. Mostly because I held my mom and Susie as the prime examples of who and what I didn't want to ever be. But there was only so much I could take. I'm not asking you to not have a relationship with her, but I don't want one with her. Nothing is ever going to change between us. I might get along okay with Erica and Rose sometimes, but that's it. Vanessa, mom, did you hear what she said? She said she wished she'd hit me harder with her car. She tried to spit on me. Then Ricky grabbed my arm. I have bruises. My knee still hurts every single day from what she did. Damn it, my voice cracked at the same time my heart seemed to do the same. Why couldn't she understand? Why? I'm not trying to argue with you. But there's no way I could have stayed after that. You could have walked away, said the woman who had walked away a hundred times in the past. This was the person who couldn't deal with her problems if there wasn't some sort of bottle around. Damn it. I was so angry with her in that moment, I couldn't find a single word that wouldn't be brutal, that wouldn't hurt her feelings. She said some things that I didn't listen to because I was too focused on myself. I shoved my sleeves up my forearms in frustration. Squeezing my free fists closed, I didn't even bother trying to count to ten. 
I wanted to break something, but I wouldn't. I fucking wouldn't. I was better than this. You know what? You're right. I really have to go. I have a lot of work to catch up on. I'll call you later. And that was the thing with my mom. She didn't know how to fight. Maybe it was a trait I'd picked up from my dad, whoever the guy was. Okay, I love you. I learned what love was from my little brother, from Diana and her family, and even from my foster parents. It wasn't this distorted, terrible thing that did what was best for itself. It was sentient, it cared, and it did what was best for the greater good. I wasn't going to bother analyzing what my mom viewed as love again. I'd done it enough in the past. In this case, it was just a word I was going to use on someone who needed to hear it. Uh Uh-huh, love you too. I didn't realize I was crying until the tears hit my chin and plummeted to my shirt. Fire burned my nose. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen-year-old Vanessa all came back to me with the same feeling that had been so strong in those years. Hurt. The Vanessa who was fifteen and older had felt a different emotion for so long. Anger. Anger at my mom's selfishness. Anger at her for not being able to clean her act up until years after we'd been taken away from her. Anger for being let down for so long, time and time again. I had needed her a hundred times, and 99 of those times she hadn't been around. Or if she had been, she'd been too drunk to be of any use to me. Diana's mom had been more of a mother figure to me than she had been. My foster mother had been more maternal than the woman who had given birth to me. I had practically raised Oscar and myself. But if it weren't for everything I'd been through, I wouldn't be where I was. I wouldn't be the person I was. I'd become me not because of my mom and sisters, but in spite of them. And most days, I really liked myself. I could be proud of me. That had to be worth something. I'd barely managed to wipe off my teary face and set down my phone when a familiar bang, bang, bang called a knock rattled my door. If I was capable of snarling, I'm sure the facial expression I made would have been called exactly that. Yes, I called out in a sarcastic tone, resisting the urge to throw myself back onto my bed like a little kid. Not that I'd ever done that even back then. Considering yes wasn't exactly an invitation to come in, I was only slightly surprised when the door opened and the man I didn't exactly want to see in the near future popped his head inside. Yes, I repeated, biting the inside of my cheek to keep from calling him something mean. I was sure my emotions were written all over my face. My eyes had to have some trace of the tears that had just been in them, but I wasn't going to hide it. Aiden opened the door completely and slipped inside, his eyes sweeping across the room briefly before landing back on me, sitting on the edge of my bed. His eyebrows scrunched together as he witnessed what I wasn't trying to hide. His mouth depressed into a frown. One of his hands went up to reach behind his head, and I tried to ignore the bunched biceps that seemed to triple in size at the action. His Adam's apple bobbed as his gaze swept over my face once more. We need to talk. Once upon a time, all I'd wanted was for him to talk to me. Now, that wasn't the case. You should really be spending time with Leslie while he's here. Those big biceps flexed. He agreed I should come up here and talk to you. I narrowed my eyes, ignoring the tightness in them. You told him we got into a fight? No. He could tell something was off without me saying anything. Those massive hands dropped to his sides. I wanted to talk to you last night. But I'd ignored his knock. I made a vague noise. What was the point in lying when I'm pretty sure he was well aware of the fact I'd been awake then? Aiden fisted his hands for a moment before bringing them back to cross his arms over his chest. I'm 
sorry for what I said yesterday. I wasn't remotely impressed by his directness, and I was sure my face said that. In true Aiden fashion, he didn't let my expression deter him from what he'd come to say. I don't like things hanging over my head, and if you and I are going to have a problem, we're going to talk about it. I meant what I told you in your apartment. I do like you as much as I like anyone. I wouldn't have come to you for all of this if I didn't. You always treated me as more than just the person who paid your check, and I see that now. I've seen it for a while, Van. I'm not very good at this crap. Did he look uncomfortable, or was I imagining it? I wondered. I'm selfish and self-centered. I know that. You know that. I bail on people all the time. He had a point there. He did. I'd witnessed it firsthand. I get it. You're not that kind of person. You don't go back on your word. I... I didn't think you'd care if I didn't go. He said carefully. I opened my mouth to tell him that no one liked being bailed on, but he trudged on before I could. But I understand, Van. Just because people don't complain to my face when I do it doesn't mean it doesn't piss them off, all right? I didn't mean to be an asshole downstairs. I only wanted to make sure you made it back fine and you weren't going to kill me in my sleep for flaking out on you. Then I got mad. I had thought about killing him, but it surprised me just a little bit that he assumed I would think that. Before I could linger on that thought too long, Aiden leveled that dark gaze on me. If you had done that to me... He looked a little uncomfortable at whatever he was thinking and let out a shaky exhale. I wouldn't have handled it as well as you did. That was a freaking fact. I wasn't nagging, I stated, then thought about it, and in my head amended the statement to add mostly to it. He tilted his head to the side like he wanted to argue otherwise. You were nagging, but you had a right to. I have a lot going on right now. My first thought was, the end has come. He's opening up to me. My second thought was, it's so obvious he's stressed as hell. I hadn't caught on to his body language or the tightness he carried both in his shoulders and his voice as he spoke. But now, up close, it was obvious. He'd been through a lot in just the first month of the regular season. He'd already sprained his ankle. Zach had gotten kicked off the team. On top of that, he was worried about his visa and his future with not just the 300s, but in the NFO, period. His injury would be a factor in his career for the rest of his life. Any time he made a mistake, people would wonder if he hadn't come back as strongly as he'd been before, even if it had nothing to do with his Achilles tendon. The guy looked ready to snap, and it was barely the end of September. I wanted to ask him if he'd heard anything back from the immigration lawyer, or if our marriage license had shown up, or if Trevor had quit being a pain in the ass and started to look for another team or a better deal or whatever it was that he wanted out of the next stage of his career. But I didn't. Today would be a bad day for me to ask and for him not to answer. I was too raw and tired and disillusioned. And it was in that moment, with that thought, the slightest bit of remorse flickered through my brain because I realized that maybe I had been itching for a fight. Maybe. And maybe this really had been the worst time for him to give him so much shit when he already had so much on his shoulders. Plus... I wasn't in the best state of mind either. But apologizing wasn't my forte, and doing so wasn't easy. But a good person recognized when they were wrong and accepted their faults. I'm sorry for exploding on you. I was angry that you didn't go, but I know why you bailed. I just don't like it when people say they'll do something and then don't. But I've been like that for a long time. It has nothing to do with you. I took those words straight from the bank of Aiden. On top of that, 
There was everything else that had built up over the course of the weekend that wasn't his fault. Not that I would bring it up. His response was a nod of acceptance, of acknowledgement that we'd both handled the situation badly. So, I'm sorry too. I know how important your career is to you. With a sigh, I held out my hand to him. Friends? Aiden glanced from my outstretched palm to my face before taking my hand in his. Friends. It was mid-shake that he looked down at his giant hand swallowing mine, and the most disgusted expression came over that perfectly stoic face. What the hell happened to your wrist? Yeah, I didn't even bother trying to pull my sleeve down and play stupid. Like an idiot, I'd forgotten that I'd tucked them up. I slipped out of his hold and let the familiar flow of anger creep down the back of my neck once more at the memory of my sister's idiot husband. Specifically, him grabbing my arm and yanking me away after I'd yelled at Susie because she'd practically said she wished she'd have killed me. I'd told her she was out of her goddamn mind. But I hadn't asked her for the millionth time why she hated me so much. What could I have possibly done before I was even four years old to make me her arch nemesis? I was mad at myself for not preventing the entire situation, mostly. Then again, her husband had dropped his grip of steel the minute I'd charged my leg upward to try and knee him in the balls, ramming him straight in the inner thigh instead. It's nothing. Those dark brown eyes blazed up to meet mine, and I swore on my life the fury in those irises was enough for me to stop breathing. Vanessa. Aiden growled, literally growled, as he softly tugged the sleeve farther up my forearm to display the five-inch bruise just above my wrist. I watched as he gazed at the stupid, stupid discoloration. I got into an argument with my sister. Was there a point in not telling him who it was with? I only had to glance at the hard-drawn line of his mouth to know he wasn't going to let this go. Her husband was there, and he got a little handsy, so I tried to knee him in the balls. His nostrils flared, and a muscle in his cheek visibly twitched. Your sister's husband? Yes. His cheek spasmed again. Why? It was stupid. It doesn't matter. Was that a grumble caught in his throat? Of course it matters. His voice was deceptively soft. Why did he do it? I knew that look on his face. It was his stubborn one. The one that said it was pointless to argue with him. Well, I wasn't crazy about spreading Susie's business around, much less share how rocky my relationship with my third oldest sister was. Susie and I could be on Jerry Springer. She made her choices years ago, and it was no one else's fault but her own, what she had gotten out of them. We'd grown up under the same circumstances, neither one of us having something the other didn't. I couldn't feel any pity for her. Rubbing my hands over my pant leg, I blew out a breath. She didn't like the way I was looking at her, and we got into a fight, I explained, leaving out a couple of details and colorful words, even though it wasn't much of an explanation. Her husband overheard us arguing, her calling me a bitch and me telling her she was an immature twat, and he grabbed me. You snobby bitch. What gives you the right to think you're better than me? She'd had the freaking nerve to yell in my face. I'd responded in the only way all that pent-up anger in me was capable of. Because I'm not a fucking asshole who loves to hurt everything in her life. That's why I think I'm better than you. Aiden's calloused fingertips suddenly brushed lightly over the bruising lifting my wrist into the cradle of those hands that were an instrumental part of his multi-million dollar body. The tick in his cheek had gotten worse as I tipped my head farther back to look at that hard line his jaw made when he was gritting his teeth. His breath rattled out, and the thumb and index finger of one of his hands circled the middle of my forearm as he said, Did he apologize? No. I made myself clear my throat. 
uncomfortable, uncomfortable, uncomfortable. I saw him gulp, the air filled with an unfamiliar tension. His swallow sounded loud in my ears. Did he hit you? And just like that, I realized. I remembered why he might be so upset over the situation. I flashed back to that memory I'd shoved to the back of my brain because I'd been worried about getting fired. How the hell could I have forgotten about it? Almost immediately after I first began working for the man known as the Wall of Winnipeg, I'd gotten dragged to Montreal for a charity event that he'd donated to. Afterward, Leslie, who had since moved from Winnipeg, invited me along to his house with Aiden for dinner with his family. Aiden had seemed distracted that day, but I thought maybe I'd been imagining it. I hadn't known him well then, hadn't learned the little nuances in his features or in his tone that gave away an idea of how he was feeling or what he was thinking. We'd been having dinner with Leslie, his wife, two of his sons, and one of his grandkids, who happened to be the cutest little boy. The four-year-old boy had been climbing from lap to lap throughout our visit, and at some point, to my shock, ended up on the big guy's lap. The boy had reached up and started touching Aiden's face, tenderly and casually. His hand strayed to that heavy, thick scar that stretched along his hairline. The boy asked him, What happened? In that blunt, cute way little kids were capable of. The only reason I heard his answer was because I'd been sitting next to him. Otherwise, I was sure I would have missed the whispered, casual reply. I made my dad very mad. The silence after his answer had been stifling, suffocating, and irrepressible all in one. The little boy had blinked at him like he couldn't comprehend the answer he'd been given. Why would he? It was obvious how much he was loved. Aiden's eyes slid over to my direction, and I knew he realized I'd overheard him because I couldn't look away fast enough and play dumb. Aiden didn't say a word after that. He didn't remind me of the non-disclosure agreement that I'd been forced to sign my first day on the job, or threaten my life or future if I told anyone. So I sure as hell didn't bring it up, either. Ever. Blinking away the memory and the sympathy that filled my chest, because Aiden was so touchy over an incident like this, I dropped my eyes to his beard. I didn't want him to see me, because I was sure he would know I was thinking about something he wouldn't want me to. No, he didn't hit me. He's still alive. I cracked a little smile. He didn't return it. Did you tell anyone? I sighed and tried to pull my arm back. He didn't let go. I didn't need to. Everyone heard. And they did nothing? Was his cheek twitching? I shrugged my shoulder. 